Hello, welcome. Today we are going to be looking at longitudes and latitudes. And this is a topic under mensuration in mathematics. Now, when you have an object and you want to know the distance from one point of the object to the other, or you want to know the area of the object, or you want to know the volume that the object occupies, you study this under mensuration. So let's say you have an object, say a rectangle, and you want to know the distance between point A and point B. Or you want to know the area occupied by this object. You want to know the total area occupied by this object. Or if this object is a solid object, if it is a solid object and you want to know the volume of this object, you can study either the area of this object, the volume, or the perimeter. You can do all these studies under mensuration. But now, when you're looking at the earth surface, you're not talking about any other object. You're not talking about a square. You're not talking about a rectangle. You're not talking about a cone. Now you're considering the earth surface. This is the shape of the earth. It's a sphere. The earth is a spherical. Uh, the shape is spherical. So when you're talking about calculations on the earth surface, noting, uh, noting the distances between points on the earth surface, you use longitude and latitude i hope you get the relationship and that is why studying longitude and latitude is also classified under mensuration in most mathematics textbook you see it under mensuration too because it is also studying about points on the earth noting the distance and understanding how to do calculations on the surface of the earth and that is what we're going to be doing in this course mensuration for longitudes and latitudes now looking at the shape of the earth the earth is a spherical object it is very important that we identify some important uh, points on the earth so now when you look at the earth that very cycle at the middle of the earth, the horizontal cycle is known as the equator, whereas the vertical cycle is known as the Greenwich Meridian. So these very two points are very, very important and they are known as great circles because if you cut the earth through this very cycle, you're going to find two equal parts. So any point, any um, circle around the earth surface, any circle around the earth surface, through which when you cut the earth, you can get two equal parts. We call them the great circle. We call them the what? Great circle. And the two major important great circles are the equator and the Greenwich Meridian. And they are going to be used as reference points in the calculations that we're going to be doing under longitudes and latitudes. So very importantly, take note of these two points, the equator, which is the circle through the middle, the horizontal circle through the middle of the earth surface, and also the Greenwich Meridian, which is the circle through the middle of the earth surface also, but this time around, uh, vertical circle. So take note of these two, the equator and the Greenwich Meridian. Though these are not the only two great circles, most of the, or all the meridians, apart from the Greenwich Meridian, most all of them are all great circles. So, what is the objective of this very course that we're going to be doing? 
what and what are we expected to know after this course longitude and latitude under menstruation two number one after this course you should be able to distinguish between a great circle and a small circle which is what i've just explained a great circle is that circle that when you cut through you have equal halves of the sphere of the earth like when you cut the earth through this equator you're going to have two equal parts or when you cut it through the greenwich meridian there are plenty other great circles as longitudes but the greenwich meridian and the equator are the two major great circles now number two you're going to be able to identify the longitudes and the latitudes now what are the longitudes and latitudes now the longitudes are those circles if you want to run circles if you want to run circles across the earth's surface you can run as many as you want you can have this you can have this so all these circles that are vertical all the vertical circles like this they are all called longitudes they are called longitudes whereas this other circle that you have like the equator and any other circle you have like this cutting the earth into two places they are known as latitudes so the horizontal circles are the latitudes whereas the vertical circles are the longitudes so take note and like I said, the most important latitude is the equator, whereas the most important longitude is the Greenwich Meridian. So that's why we noted it here. The most important longitude is Greenwich Meridian. The most important latitude is the equator. So take note of this. You see, I just outlined the objectives and already we are solving them. So at least we get them to where we start doing calculations, which we do in the next class. Now let's look at the third objective. Determine and sketch the position of a point. Now, if you have a point on the earth's surface, if uh, people that if you want to calculate distances on the earth's surface, like distance from one point on earth to the other, distance from Nigeria to Canada, knowledge of longitude and latitude can actually help you. So let's say you pick a point here, and this point is in Nigeria, maybe in Abuja or anywhere. You can, if you locate this point, you can find the longitude and you can also find the latitude of this point. So when you give us the longitude and latitude, you are giving us the position of this point. So anybody that you tell that this is the position of this very point, he can easily locate it. Now we should also be able to calculate the distance between two points on a great circle and I told us that great circles are those circles that if you cut the earth through them you get a perfect equal sides so let's say you cut the earth through this circle you are going to have equal sides once you cut the earth through the equator you get two equal parts because the equator is a great circle. If you also cut the earth through the Greenwich Meridian, you also get two equal parts. You cut the earth through this. So now, if you want to calculate the distance between two points on a great circle, this is a great circle, the equator. So let's say you want to calculate the distance between points B and point A so you should be able to find a way of calculating this distance between point B and point A point A and point B so it's part of the things we are going to be learning under longitudes and latitude we should also be able to calculate the distance between two points on the parallel of a latitude so if you also have another latitude here which is a small circle because it's not dividing the earth into two equal parts. You can also calculate the distance between C and D. So we can always do this calculation. 
Now we can also calculate the speed of a point on the S surface due to rotation. So if you want to calculate the speed of a point on the Earth's surface due to rotation, we should also be able to do this calculation under longitude and latitude. So that, that, uh, those are the objectives of this very lecture. You should be able to distinguish between gray circles and small circles. And this objective will be able to solve them up to this point. So in subsequent classes, we'll be doing the remaining calculations. So let me go through them again. Number one, distinguish between gray circles and small circles. And I say that a gray circle is any circle through which when you cut the edge, you can have a quarter. Let's say you cut the edge through the equator, you'll be having something like this. You go through the equator, you have two equal parts. But let's say you come to this other latitude and you cut the earth through here. What are you going to be having? You'll be having something like this. So you can see that this one is bigger. Whereas this is smaller. So when you cut the, the edge through this very latitude, you are not going to have two equal parts. So this very circle or this very latitude is known as a small circle. Because you cannot get two equal parts of the edge when you cut through them. But the one that through which when you cut, you can get two equal parts like the equator is a gray circle. So that's why gray circles, the latitude that is a gray circle is the equator. Whereas most of the longitudes are gray circles. Because if you cut the edge through this point, you're going to get two equal halves. So the Greenwich Meridian is a gray circle. If you also cut the edge through this other point, you also get two equal parts. If you cut through this point, two equal parts through this point, to equal parts. So you have plenty gray circles as the meridians. Note another word for the longitudes are meridians. So you have plenty of gray circles as longitudes. But the latitude, the gray circle there is the equator because it is through the equator that you can have two equal parts. So whenever you hear the word meridian, you're also talking about longitudes. Now, identify the longitudes and the latitudes. I told us that the vertical circles across the Earth's surface are known as the longitudes, whereas the horizontal ones are the latitudes. And the most important horizontal or the most important latitude is the equator because it is a reference point for measuring other distances. Whereas the most important longitude is the Greenwich Meridian because it is also the reference point for measuring other points and meridians on the Earth's surface. So that is where we're going to be stopping. And I believe that you've known what gray circles and small circles are. And you can as well tell me what longitudes and latitudes are. So in subsequent classes, we'll be able to determine and sketch a point on the Earth's surface calculate the distances between two points or uh, please if you like this video hit the subscribe button by this side of the screen if you have any questions and concerns drop them in the comment section below uh, if you want to contact us you can always use the uh, reference points reference points on the description section of this video thank you and god bless you Hello, welcome. Today we're going to be calculating distances along great circles. 
This is the first calculation part in the longitude and latitude uh, lesson that we started. So let's look at this problem and see the way we can solve it. So if you have a problem like this in Jam or Waeg, the positions of Accra in Ghana and Lagos in Nigeria to the nearest degree are 0 degree north, that is the latitude, and 9 degree east and 0 degree north and 32 degree east that is the latitude and the longitude respectively calculate their distance apart along the equator very very important whenever you are calculating for uh, distances along gray circle it has to be either along the equator or along the meridians so note latitude 0 degree north is the equator so whenever you get latitude 0 is always the equator and that is what was given here, equator, and is also given here. So whenever you are told to calculate distance between two points on the Earth's surface, you check the one that is consistent. You see that the latitudes are the same. That means that this is done, at, the two points are on the same latitude. You can see the two points, L and K, the distance between here and here. That is what you are told to calculate. Two of them are on the same latitude which is zero degrees north but their longitudes if you take a circle here take another one here you see that their longitudes are different so you're told to calculate this now if you're given this this uh, problem don't go confusing yourself just check the ones that are different you see the longitude here is different from the one here so you just consider these two things if it is east east add up the two longitudes but if this one is east and this one is west no if it is east east subtract or if it is west west subtract but if this one is east and this one is f is uh, west add them up so in this case you have the latitude for this one east this one is so simply subtract because they are the same thing you understand so we have 32 minus 9 23 so anything you get just do that thing all over 360 times 2 pi r the answer is the distance between the two now had it been we have 32 39 west this one is west and this one is east you have to add the two of them so anything you get from adding the two of them put that thing all over 360 times 2 pi r it becomes the answer so you see that this is very simple you don't need to suffer yourself much just look at the positions of the two places that you are given, Accra and Lagos. The one that is constant is the gray circle that you are calculating across. Then you check the one that is different. If the position, if it is east-east, subtract. If it is west-west, subtract. But if you have east-west, add. If you have west-east, also add. And this is for across the equator. Let's say you have another calculation and you have points. You have points A and point B. And you are told to calculate the distance between these two points. How do you do it? So if you have here 30 north and here 45 south. How do you do it? The same thing you do here, but it, since you have north and south, they are not the same, so you have to do what add. So you have to have 30 plus 45. Anything you get all over 360 times 2 pi r. The same thing. So just check whether you are calculating across the equator or across the meridians. It's just the same simple answer. Anything you get, the difference in the angles, the difference in the angles all over 360 times 2 pi r very simple and note that your r is always 6400 that is the radius of the earth 6400 kilometers that is your big r pi is always 22 over 7 so that is how you go about the calculation anything you get as the difference in uh, angle all over 360 times 2 pi r that is the formula for calculating the distance along gray circles 
whether it is across the equator or across whether it is along the equator or along the meridians whether it is along the equator or along the meridian so whenever you're giving a question like this, just look at the positions if this is the same east east subtract if it is west west subtract if it is east and west add if it is west and east add the same thing if you're considering this. Had it been you come here, you came here and you saw on uh, 9 here and also 9 here. Now you now have here 31 and here you have 12. What are you supposed to do? You're supposed to forget about this because this is the same as this. They are constant. That means you're calculating along the meridian. So this is what you're considering. And two of them are not not. So what do you do? You subtract. It will be 31 minus 12 all over 360 times 2 pi r. But had it been you have 12 south, like you have here, 12 south and 31 north, you have 31 plus 12 all over 360 times 2 pi r. So that is how you go about solving for distances along gray circles. So once you see your question, Look at it very well, analyze it before you solve that. Now, why did we have to subtract in order to get 23? Now, if you look at this question now, this is the initial diagram that is given. Now, it is being calculated along the equator. So, this equator is a circle on its own, and that is the circle that I brought out here. Now, from the middle, you have point K, from the middle, point K, from the middle, point L, from the middle, point L, from the middle, point G, from the middle, point G. So, this circle is actually the circle of the equator, actually. So, I brought it out to be clear. Now, you're given that the first one, G, K, is 32, which is this one. Oh, I've already cleaned this up. I had zero here. And zero here. So just note I had 32 and 9. So from here to here is 32 degrees. Whereas from here to here is just 9. So what will be this remaining place? You see that it's going to be 32 minus 9. And that's why we have 32 minus 9 here to have 23. So the 23 all over 360 times 2 pi r solving down gives me this uh a kilometer. So this is the distance. If I approximate to two significant figures, I get this. So very, very important. What you are going to go home with in today's lecture is that once you are given a problem on distances along gray circle, just get to know the difference in the angle. Check the angle where you have the difference. If they are the same uh, direction, you subtract. If they are different directions, you add. So any difference in the angle all over 360 times 2 pi r gives you where r, r here is equal to 6400. So that is how we go about this. Please, if you like this video, hit the subscribe button by the side of the screen. If you have any questions and concerns, drop them in the comment section. If you want to contact us, check out the description part of this video. Thank you. God bless you. Hello, welcome. Today we're going to be looking at distances along the parallels of latitude, under longitudes and latitude. Now, how do we solve problems relating to distances along the parallels of latitude? Now, let's take an example so that we can study this. Now, find the distance measured along the parallel of latitude between two points whose latitudes are both 56 degrees north with longitudes 23 degree east and 17, 17 degree west respectively. Now I told us that whenever we have problems of calculating distances in longitudes and latitude, now given that the both points, this uh, point and this point, have the same 
latitude. Now we check the longitudes. We check whether the position or the direction are the same. If the directions are the same, like this is west, this is east. So they are not the same. That means you have to add. But if it is west, west, you have to multi uh, subtract. If it is east, east, you have to subtract. But because this is east and this is west, you have to do what? Add. And that's why we added the two angles to get this. Now, when we are calculating along gray circles, that is along the equator and the meridians, we said that once you get the difference in the angles, whether you are doing addition for the one that has different directions or you are doing a subtraction for the ones that have the same direction. Now, since you are having the one with different directions, you have to add. So once you get that difference in angle, whether you get it, uh, get it by addition or subtraction, just do what the angle is all over 360 times 2 pi r for gray circles. But if you're talking about latitude, parallel of latitudes, instead of having 2 pi r, where r is the big r of sister, um, uh, sister and 400, you're going to be having this small r. And this small r is the same thing as saying 2 pi the big r cos the angle of the latitude. So that is the major thing that you need to understand about this calculation. It's still the same thing. Get the difference in angle all over 360 times 2 pi r. But instead of having the big r as in the calculation for uh, great circles, you are now having small r. And the value of this small r is simply 2 pi the big r cos the angle of the latitude. So once you fix that, you're going to get this. So that is the main point and that is the main thing that you're going to be looking at for because in the exam condition, you may not have time to be making all these diagrams. These diagrams actually makes this solution very simple. But if you have, if you're in the exam condition, you might not be trying to explain all this. This is what you go through. Check out the angles, provided they are having constant latitude. Check out the long, longitudes. If they are having the same direction, if it is east, east, or west, west, subtract. But if it is east and west, or west and east, add them up. Then the angle that you get all over 360 times 2 pi r, if it is for gray circle. But if it is for parallel of latitude, 2 pi small r, where the small r is equal to uh, big r cos 56, cos the angle of the latitude. And that's how you go about it. But if you want to look at this critically, this is where it is represented. These are the two points. We have this point and we have this other point. This is the R. So if you consider this angle, CAO, CAO, you're going to find out that this small R is equal to this big R cos 56, which is this angle. And that is how we come about this. Now, CAB, CAB is simply the addition of these two angles, giving you 40. So that ACC CB will be equal to 40, which is total of this, all over 360 times 2 pi R. That is the formula for an ARC. But this small r is actually equal to R cos 56. So you in place of small r, you put r cos 56 to the same formula of the arc so that you can solve that. You know that 2 pi r is the same thing as saying 2 times 22 over 7 times 6,400 6, to give us this 40,000. So when you multiply out, you'll be able to get this as your answer. And that is how you go about solving this. So very simply, uh, the calculation for parallels of latitude and gray circles, they are very similar. Only that for gray circle, it is, you're using this R in this formula. You're using the big R. But for latitudes, you're using small R. But noting that this small R is equal to big R cos the angle of the latitude. 
so that is where we're gonna be stopping today please if you like this video hit the subscribe button by this side of the screen if you have any questions and concerns drop it on the comment section if you want to contact us check the description part of this video thank you and god bless you Hello, welcome. Today we're going to be looking at calculus. Calculus is a very important mathematics that you have to learn if you are to be writing mathematics in JAM when you're in uh, 100 level in the university. You're also supposed to do some things in calculus. Whenever you hear the word calculus, you think about differentiation and integration. What kind of mathematics do we need calculus to solve? Whenever you have expressions or mathematical situations where you have changes, like you have changing velocity, changing acceleration, changing size, or container then you use what we call calculus and in using calculus you use the tools in calculus the limits differentiation and integration so in this our course in calculus we are going to be covering limits differentiation and integration these three aspects that we are covering under calculus they are linked together, they are related. From limits, we get to differentiation. And we all know that integration is the opposite of differentiation. So in our time in this course, we'll be looking at these three limits, differentiation, and integration. So whenever you hear about calculus, we are talking about changes and how to take care of changes mathematically. And this calculus involves limits, differentiation, and integration. So as a matter of getting down the notes, uh, we're going to be looking at calculus. And under calculus, we're going to be looking at limits. We're going to be looking at differentiation, and we're going to be looking at integration. Now, mathematically, integration is the opposite. Of differentiation when you integrate you get back to where you were before before the differentiation was made to an expression so we look at this expression given this very expression if you differentiate this expression you have this now if you integrate this very expression you have this, which is actually where you're coming from. So when you differentiate an expression, you have a different expression. But when you integrate, you get back to where you started from. Using, uh, you can differentiate using this formula. So in subsequent classes, we are going to be learning how we arrive at getting from here to here, differentiating, and also getting from here to here, integrating. So you're going to be given a simple expression like this in JAMP or, or in your further mathematics and work and you're going to ask what is the derivative of this. So when you ask that question, what is the derivative of this expression? It simply means differentiate this and when you differentiate this, you get this. And this is the simple exp uh, explanation of this. Anything that you have up here, take it back here. So that you now have x a n then anything that is up here reduce it by one so that is what was done here when you take this over to this side it becomes three times two which is six then anything here reduce it by one you have three minus one which is two so that's how you come about this so with this expression or with this formula you can always differentiate so we differentiated this to get this then when you integrate this derivative you get back this expression. So if you integrate this, you get back this. 
So in subsequent classes, I'm going to be showing us how to integrate, how to differentiate, and the derivatives of some very, very important uh, expressions like cos theta or cos x. How do we differentiate cos x? Cos x equal to sine x as the derivative. Then how do we differentiate sine x? Sine x equal to minus cos x. So all these major derivatives, x and all of them, all these major derivatives, we're going to be looking at them. We're going to be getting their derivatives and uh, their integrals as well. So if you are told to find, when you work on this, you get this as the integral. So we have derivative, we have integral. So differentiate to get the derivative, then integrate to get the integral. So that's what we're going to be looking at. Uh, and I told us before, calculus has to do with whenever we have changes. Very, very important. It's the kind of mathematics that helps you to solve problems that involves changes. Let's say you have a car. And this car is moving at uh, 30 km per hour. You understand? So, what uh, distance will it cover in 3 hours? So, you're going to have the distance covered will be 30 times 3. So, if this car is actually moving on a freeway. But let's take, for instance, this car is actually moving... But some other things are blocking it. You have other bigger cars or smaller cars that are in front. So this car cannot actually move at a constant speed of 30 km per hour. So provided that it cannot move at this constant speed, sometimes it could move at 20 km per hour. Sometimes it could move at uh, maybe 10 km per hour. It's changing. The speed is changing. So how do you now calculate the distance when it has changing speed? Will the distance still be speed times time? So how do you take care of this change? Because the speed is no longer constant. So you can use derivatives, you can use integrals. So you can actually use calculus to solve this problem. So any mathematical problem that involves changes, you can use calculus to solve. So, when we go deeper into how to use these techniques to solve, then you understand how to apply them in problems like this. So, we're going to be looking at limits, we're going to be looking at differentiation, we're going to be looking at integration, all in calculus. So, one thing to take out of this today's course is that whenever you have mathematical problems that involve changes like acceleration, changing acceleration, changing velocity, even in physics and in engineering you're going to be coming across calculus you're going to be coming across ordinary differential equations and the rest of them so we're going to be looking at these in details uh, please hit the subscribe button so that anytime we release our videos you'll be the first to get them thank you god bless you Hello, welcome. Today we're going to be looking at arithmetic progression. We're going to be looking at what? Arithmetic progression. We call it AP. We call it what? AP. We said that a sequence is a succession of terms. You understand? In which the difference between either of the term, uh, the first and the second, or the successive terms, is governed by a rule, isn't it? So a special type of this sequence is known as arithmetic what? progression. We have the difference, we call it common difference. Call it what? Common difference. And the first time is represented with the letter what? A. The difference between successive terms is known as the word common what? Difference. Represented with the letter what? D. Is that clear? And you can find the nth term by saying Tn equal to what? A, which is the first term, plus bracket N minus 1 Close bracket D, common difference. Is that good? So we say arithmetic progression, AP also, can also be called what? Linear sequence. It's a sequence in which the increase or decrease between any two consecutive terms is the same throughout. 
the difference between this and this is the same as the difference between this and this, and this, the same as the difference between this and this. And that difference is known as what? Common difference, and it's 6. Can you see that? 5 plus 6, 11. 11 plus 6, 17. 17 plus 6, 23. 23 plus 6, 29. Common difference. You are going to see that this differs from what we have when we'll be learning GP. Is that clear? What's the common difference for this sequence? 24 minus 9, 15. 15 minus 9, 6. 6 minus 9, minus 3. Minus 3 minus 9, minus 4. Is that clear? Now, the increase or decrease is called the common difference. And it can be positive or what? Negative. The first term of an AP, A, is represented with the alphabet word A. Can you see that? The first term of this arithmetic progression is what? 5. The first term of this one is what? 24. The common difference, which is the difference between consecutive terms, is known as common difference. Is that clear? Represented with what? D. What's the common difference for this sequence? 6. What is that for this? Minus 9. Now, it will be important to calculate the nth term of an AP. And the formula is what? Tn, which is the nth term, is equal to the first term, A, plus the term you are looking for, N, minus 1, all multiplied by what? Common difference. Is that clear? And also, very important, another very important formula is the sum of the terms of AP, gotten by Sn, equal to N over 2, or in block bracket, 2A plus, in bracket, N minus 1, multiplied by T. And if you know the last term, you use the formula Sn, equal to N over 2, bracket, A plus L, close bracket, where L is the word last term. Is that clear? And with that, you can solve this problem. The 16th term of an AP is 93. Given that each common difference is 6, find the first and 28 terms. Can we solve this? Plus, can we solve this? So I'm going to just take this out. So that we'll solve this. So that we'll do what? Now, having taken this out, what are the given? You can tell me the given. We are, we are given the 16th term, is it not? Yeah. So we say T what? 16. And it can be represented by using this formula. A plus what? N minus 1 D. And this 16th term is equal to what? 93. Can we see this? This is given, isn't it? So if we impute our, our, our values, we have A is what? What's the first term? Not given. So you write A the way it is. Plus N. What is N? 16 minus 1. What is D? Common difference is 6. It's also given, isn't it? Equal to 93. Is that clear? So since there is equal to here, we can remove this because 16 term is already equal to 93. Is that? So we have now A plus what? 16 minus 1, 15 times what? 6 equal to what? 93. You can give me, give me 15 minus times 6. 90. So we have what? A plus 90 equal to what? 93. So that A is equal to 93 minus 93, which is equal to what? So that is the first time. And that's what we are asked to find. First time is that. But we also found asked to find 28 times. So T what? 28 is equal to A. What is A now? 5 plus N is what? 28 minus 1 times common difference 6. Hmm? A is 3. Thank you. Because that's what we found here, isn't it? So we now have 3 plus 28 minus 1. 27 times what? 6. So who can tell me what is 27 times 6? 162 plus what? 3. Which will give us 165. And that is what? T28. Is that clear? That is how to solve it. In subsequent classes, we'll be looking at GP and other things. Thank you, God bless you. Like our videos, like, subscribe to our channel. Hello, welcome. Uh, we are looking at geometry, and we say that geometry is that aspect of mathematics that deals with what? Shapes. Shapes. That deals with what? Shapes. Shapes. Is that clear? And the difference between these shapes is due to the angles that the lines are making with each other. Is that clear? Yes. So today we are going to be looking at angles. We are going to be looking at what? Angles. What is an angle? 
An angle is that change in direction, is that clear? Or distance between two lines, you understand? Or that is subtend when two lines are diverging from one another, is that clear? Let's say this one of my hand is an angle, can you see this? Let's say this is a line surface, a line. Hmm? This is another line. And they are meeting at a point. This distance from here to this other part is known as the what? Angle. Is that clear? So let's say this is a line. Are you seeing this line? Are you seeing another line? Both of them are meeting at a what? Point. They are meeting at a what? Point. point. So let's say they are together. Now they are diverging. Is that clear? This distance here is known as what? Angle. It's known as angle and it's measured in what degrees. Degree. Let's say that it is uh, 33 or 46. It's measured in what degrees. That's why we say that an angle or angles are the distance. Distance between this line and this line. Distance or change in direction between two line surfaces. Can you see the two line surfaces? Diverging from the same point. They are diverging from the same what? Point. point. Measured in what? Degrees. Is that clear? That is what an angle is. And we have different kinds of angle, different types. We have what we call right angle, right angle. We have straight angle. We have obtuse angle. We have reflex. Reflex angle. Depending on the size of the angle. Is that clear? So these angle types are actually dependent on the word size. Depending on the word size. Now, the right angle is the angle that has the size of what? 90 degrees. Or you can call it the quarter of a what? Revolution. Why do you call it the quarter of a revolution? Because if you have a cycle like this, and divide this cycle into what? Four. One of them is always making an angle of what? 90 degrees. So that is this angle. Can you see that? It's always 90 degrees. Straight angle is the angle that has the size of what? One inch. Can you see that? This is straight. 90 plus what? 90. Making it what? 180. And that is this. You have acute angle is what? Any angle that is less than a what? Right, right angle. angle. Can you see that this is less than that right angle? It's less than 90. Obtuse angle is any angle that is greater than what? 90, but actually less than what? 180. It's greater than a right angle, but it's less than a what? Straight angle. Reflex angle is the angle that is greater than 180, but less than what? 360. Can you see that? Can you see this angle? It's bigger than 180, isn't it? But yes. it's less than 360, which is a full revolution. Now we'll talk about complementary angle. Complementary angle, two angles are said to be complementary if the sum of those two angles is what? 90. 90. Can you see these two angles? This is 90 degrees, right angle, isn't it? Yes. Then you have an angle here, A, plus another angle here, B. When you add these two, what will you get? 90. So we'll call these two angles, say that both of them are what? Complementary. Both of them are what? Complementary. Two angles are said to be complementary if the sum or the addition of both of the angles gives what? 180. Is that clear? Now, supplementary angle. Two angles are said to be supplementary if their sum is equal to what? 180. Can you see that? This is 180. Is it not? Straight angle. Now, you have angle C plus angle D. Giving you 180. So angle C and D are said to be what? 180. They are said to be what? 180. No, no. They are said to be what? Supplementary. Angle A and what? Angle C, C and, angle and D are what? Supplementary. Supplementary. Why? Because the addition of both of them gives you what? 180. 180. Is that clear? So these are the these are the kinds or types of angles that we have in geometry. Is that clear? Subsequent classes, we are going to be looking at other things in geometry. Please, if you like this our video, click on the subscribe button. Share this our video so that other people can see. It. Thank you so much for your support. Hello, welcome. Today we are going to be looking at plane mensuration. Today we are going to be looking at what? Plane mensuration. Plane mensuration is simply that aspect of mathematics that deals with finding a way of determining the perimeter 
and the area of plane shapes. Is that clear? In plane mensuration, we try to determine the what perimeter and what area of plane shapes. Or you can say determining the circumference of a circle. Is that clear? Perimeter or area of plane shapes. And we know what plane shapes are, isn't it? The shapes that don't have depth. Example is what? Triangle, trapezium, parallelogram, square, square, rectangle, isn't it? So today we're going to be starting with that of a triangle. I will say that perimeter is the distance round a plane shape. Is that clear? Are you seeing this plane shape? What is the distance round it? This side plus this side plus this side. Is that not? That is the distance. So if you are told to calculate the perimeter of this triangle, it's simply A plus B plus what? C. And you see perimeter equal to A plus B plus C. And we are giving the values of A, B to C as 8, 10, and 15. So we have 8 plus 15 plus 10, giving us 33. Is that clear? Now let's look at the area of a triangle. Area is the space. This physical space. Is that clear? Let me indicate. This is the perimeter, this side this and this. Whereas area is the space that is this triangle is actually occupying. Is that clear? So how do we calculate it? We use, if we are given these three sides, like A, B and C, you use what we call Hero's formula. You use what we call what? Hero's formula. And it says that area is simply the root of X bracket X minus A bracket X minus B bracket X minus C. We have A, B, C are the sides, is that clear? Mm -hmm. And this S can be gotten by saying half of the summation of the sides, is that clear? That is when A, B and C, the sides are given. That's the formula you use in evaluating the area. But now, when you are given one side, say A, you are given only A, and you are also given this, a perpendicular height on that A, what formula are you going to use? You are going to use that area is equal to half the side given A times the height of the perpendicular line that gets to the A. Is that clear? So we say half of the product of the side and the perpendicular height to it. But then, when you are given two sides, let's say you are given A and, A and C, or C and B, or A and B, what formula are you going to use? You are going to use this formula that says area is equal to half A, B, sine C. You understand? So if you are giving A and C, you say half A, C, sine what? B. Sine what? A and C. A, C, sine B. The angle that is in between them. Is that clear? If you are giving A and B, you say half A, B, sine what? C. The angle between A and C. Is that clear? Or the angle facing the opposite side that you are not giving. That's the formula. So you either any one that you're giving, just know that you're saying half the product of the two sides given times the angle that is fixed, that is in between them, or the angle of the side that is not given. That is that the angle opposite the side that is not given. Is that clear? So you check that. So you can either use any of these formulas, three formulas of area, depending on what you are giving. If you are given the three sides, you use area is equal to root of x bracket x minus a bracket x minus b bracket x minus c. Here s is equal to half of the summation of the sides. If you are given a side and a perpendicular height to it, use area equal to half that side and times the perpendicular height to it. If you are given two sides with angle in between them, you use half the product of the two sides times the angle, sine times sine of the angle in between them. Is that clear? Yes. So those are the formulas you can use in solving for the areas of plane shape circle. Yes, if you like this video, click on the subscribe button. Share our videos so that people can see them. Thanks for your support. God bless you. Yes, welcome. Today we're going to be continuing in our lectures on plane measuration. On what? Plane measuration. We'll say that plane measuration is what we'll try to determine the perimeters and areas of plane shapes. Is that clear? Mm -hmm. And in the previous classes, we looked at uh, triangles, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Today we're going to be looking at other shapes like the parallelogram, the 
the trapezium, the kite, and the what? Cycle. Is that clear? Yeah. Parallelogram is a shape with equal opposite sides. Is that clear? Mm -hmm. If this is A, also know that this is also A. The opposite is A. If this is B, also know that the opposite is what? B. And the perimeter is simply, you know what a perimeter is? The length round the shape, isn't it? So it's going to be A plus B plus another A plus another B, isn't it? So we have A plus A plus B plus B. So if it's like lamps, it will be what? 2A plus 2B. Now what is the area? The area is simply the base times the what? Perpendicular height. What is the base here? The base. You understand? The base times the what? Perpendicular height. That is what the area is. Then you can also find it by saying the two sides. A, B, sine. The what? A, B sine the included yeah. angle theta. So we have A, B times what? Sine of the included yeah. angle theta. Is that clear? Yeah. So that's the, another way of solving it. So base times perpendicular distance. If the base is A, use A. If the base is B, use what? B here. Yeah. Is that clear? Yeah. Yeah. Then trapezium, the two opposite sides are not equal in the trapezium. Is that clear? Yeah. But the perimeter, like you all already know, is the summation of the sides, which is what? B plus B plus C plus A. Is that clear? Yeah. Whereas the area is what? Half yeah. sum of the what? Parallels. Yeah. Which ones are parallel? A and what? Yeah. B. So sum of the half of the parallel times what? Height. So the height that is subtended, can you see the height here? Yeah. So that is what gives you the area. Or you can say, have some of the parallel lines, C, which is the opposite, times the what? Angle that the C subtends with the base. Is that clear? Yeah. Then a kite is a shape that has these two sides equal and this other side equal. So that the perimeter will simply be this plus this plus this plus this. Plus this. Which will give us what 2a plus 2b is that clear? Yes, sir. If you factor 2 out, we have 2 in brackets a plus b. And the area is simply area of the triangle yes. ABC. Is that clear? Yes, sir. Plus area of triangle what? Where yes. is triangle ABC? This is the smaller ABC, part. C, the smaller part, isn't it? Then plus area of the bigger part, isn't it? Yes, sir. B, C, D. So when you add it together, you get the total area. Now we we'll look at a circle. Circle, the perimeter is also called the what? Circumference. Is that clear? Yes. And it's simply what? 2 pi r. And we know that 2 r is the center as d. Yes. This is r, is it not? Yes. This is the radius. What is d? Diameter. Diameter. Or d. d. You understand? So d is equal to what? 2, two r. r. So if you remove 2 r and place with d, you have just pi d, is it not? Yes. That is the parameter or circumference of a cycle. I will also have that the area of a cycle is what? Pi r squared. Is that clear? Yes. And these are the various plane shapes and their formulas of their areas and what? Parameters. Is that clear? Very, very important. You need to take note of these formulas because in your jump and wire, you'll be using them much, much, much. In subsequent classes, we are going to be taking examples on all these. Is that clear? If you like this video, please click on the subscribe button. Thanks for your support. Thank you very much. Hello, welcome. Today we're going to be looking at series. Series is uh, very similar to the sequence that we looked at. You understand? In the sequence we looked at, we separated the numbers with commas. We separated the numbers with what? Commas. And now we're going to be separating the numbers that are in the series with addition sign. Is that clear? Yes, sir. So it's just very similar. Here we have a series is the addition of the terms of the what? The sequence. Given the sequence 3 over 2, 3 and 6, these are the sequence we generated in the last class. Is it not? Yes, sir. If you want to represent them in form of series, you simply say 3 over 2 plus 3 plus 6. Is that clear? Yes, sir. This is another series. 3 plus 5 plus 7 plus 9 plus 11. Who can tell me how these numbers are coming? 3 plus 2 is what? 5. 5 plus 2? 7. 7 plus 2? 9. 9 plus 2? 11. So that's a series, is it? 
Yes. Whenever you have plus sign. Okay. Now we have find the series of the first six terms of two to the power n plus four n. This is the rule, isn't it? Yes. So we simply say that the n is equal to what? two to the power n plus four n squared. That. Yes. So to find the first term, you replace everywhere you see n, you replace it with what? One, one because you're finding the first term. Yes. To find the second term, anywhere you see n, you replace it with what? Two. Yes. So to find the first term, you simply say two to the power one, which is two, plus four. One to the power two is one. One times four, four. Four plus two, six. Is that clear? Yes. Time two, two to the power three, two, four. Four, four times four, 16. 16. 16 plus four, 20. Time three, three to the power two, nine, nine. nine times four, Press your calculator, 9 times 4 is what? 36. 36. Plus 2 to the power 3 is 8. 36 plus 8 is 44. Is that clear? Yes. So that's how you got all the terms. Up to what? 6 terms. Up to what? 6 terms. Can you see? 6. Yes. So to find the series, simply add up the terms. 6 terms. The first term is 6. The second term is what? 20. 20. The third term is what? 44. The fourth term? 18. The fifth term? The system. So whenever you have them in, it doesn't necessarily mean that you should add them and find the addition. Find okay. Just in this arrangement, you call it series. Is that clear? Okay. So you're going to do that for the rest of the one that we've done okay. and the one in your assignment. Okay. Stop pressing your phone. Okay. Hmm? Finish the assignment before you start pressing your phone. Is that clear? Yes. Please, if you like this, uh, click on the subscribe button, like and share our videos. Thank you. Hello, welcome. Today we are going to be looking at sequence and series. Today we are going to be looking at what? Sequence and series. Sequence and series. Sequence and series. We'll be also be looking at APs and GPs. We'll be looking at what? APs and GPs. Arithmetic progression and what? Geometric progression. What do we understand by the term sequence? Sequence, sequence of numbers. You can tell me what is sequence. Can you tell me what? The one, the one showing the rule of the number of the series. A sequence is a succession of numbers. A what? Succession of numbers. Or you can call it succession of terms that obey a well-defined rule. That obey what? A well-defined well rule. Example is when we have something like this. If we have one. 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. This is a sequence, is that clear? Yeah. Of integers. And the rule is simply the addition of 1. The rule is what? Addition of 1. To successive numbers, is that clear? Yes. 1 plus 1 is what? 2. 2 plus 1? 3. 3 plus 1? 4. 4 plus 1? 5. 5 plus 1? 6. Is that clear? Yes, sir. The rule is what? Addition of what? One. one. You understand? Yes, this is sequence of numbers. Obeying the simple rule of adding what? One. one. Is that clear? Yes, sir. So you can say that a sequence is a succession of terms such that the terms are related to one another according to a well-defined what? Rule. Well-defined what? Rule. Rule. You understand? So the rule is actually what will help you to predict the next number. Is that clear? Yes, so if we have six here, can you predict the next number? Seven. What is it? Seven. 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 Because you are just adding what? One. one. Now let's take examples. If we have five, eleven, seventeen, twenty-three, what will be the next number? To get the next number, you need to know the rule that the, the, the sequence is obeying. Is that clear? Yes. And the rule is what? Multiply set of positive integers by what? Six. 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 And subtract by one. So let's see how one five was gotten. Sets of integers, we start with one, isn't it? Yes. Multiply it by what? Six. six. And subtract what? One. one. One times six. Six. Six minus one. Five. Can you see? That's how this five was gotten. Yes. Now, 11, how did we get it? The next number is what? Two, two times, times six. what? Six, six minus, minus one. one. Two times six. Twelve. Minus one. Eleven. Can you see that? Yes. Then the next number will be what? 3 times 6. 3 times 6 minus, minus one. 1. 
3 times 6 is what? Minus 1. See, that's how we are creating this sequence. By obeying this rule. By obeying this word. And the rule simply says multiply set of positive integers by what? And supply by 6. So those positive integers are 1, 2, 3 down. You understand? So whenever you multiply them by 6 and subtract 1 from it, you get this sequence. Is that clear? Now we have another sequence. This sequence, the name is, the sequence is what? 1, 3, 9, 27, 81. And the rule is 3 to the power n minus 1. Is that clear? Yes. So how did we get 1? By simply saying 3 to the power 1, one minus, minus 1. one. 3 to the power 1 minus 1 is the same as 3 to the power 0, which is what? One. 1. That's how we got this one. How did we get this? The second one, 3 to the power 2 minus 1. 3 to the power 2 minus 1 is the same thing as 3 to the power 1, one which is what? 3. 3. How did we get this one? We also say 3 to the power what? 3 minus, minus 1. 3 to the power 3 to the three power 2 equal to what? 9. nine. That's how we got 9. Exactly. Yeah. How did we get 27? 3 to the power 4 minus yeah. 1, which is what? 3 to the power 3, which is what? 27. Exactly. Yes, sir. So once we obey this rule by incrementing this thing from 1 up, we'll be getting all this series sequence. Is that clear? Yes, sir. So that is what we call sequence. Any subsection of numbers or terms that obey a defined word rule. Is that clear? So all this is based on rules. The nth term of a sequence is represented by Tn. It's represented by what? Tn. Tn. And that represents also the rule. Whereas the other first, second, and third terms are represented by what? T1, T2, T3. So example, we have this example. The nth term of a sequence is given by 3 times 2 to the power n minus 2. Write down the first 3 terms of the sequence. Is that clear? Mm -hmm. So this is Tn as was given 3 times 2 to the power n minus 2. So what would be T1, which is the first term? It will now be 3 times 2 to the power in place of n, you put what? Wow. And you solve down to get it. T2, in place of n, you put what? T3, in place of n, you put what? 3. So here, when we have 1 minus 2 is what? Minus, minus one. 1. And for if this is anyone that has negative exponent, you bring it down, put the other one up. Okay. That's 3 over 2. Here, you have 2 minus 2 is what? 0. zero. Anything to the power 0 is 1. one. 3 times 1. 3. 3 minus 2. 1. one. 2 to the power 1, 2. 2 times 3, 6. Mm -hmm. And so on. You understand? Yes, so if right. somebody tells you to find the T10, the 10th the tenth term, it will be equal to what? 3, three times, times 2 to the power 10 minus 2, two mm -hmm. which will give us 3 times three 2 to the power 8. eight. Which is the what did he give you? 768. Seven, seven, okay. So that is how you do. Sequence, is that clear? Yes, so sequence always obey a given word. Rule. You understand? Succession of numbers that are generated by obeying a given rule. Is that clear? Yes, sir. So in subsequent classes, we'll be looking at APs, GPs, and other forms of sequence. Is that clear? Yes, sir. If you like this video, please click on the subscribe channel, like, and share the video for your friends to see. Thank you. Hello, welcome. Today we are going to be looking at set theory. We are going to be looking at set theory. What is a set? A set is a well-defined collection of objects or things. A collection of objects or things. You can talk about a set like you say a set of whole numbers from 2 to 10. That means 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. So the elements of the set of a whole number from 2 to 10 are 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, to separate them with commas. So a set is a defined collection of things or numbers. A set of a whole numbers from 2 to 10, this is how you express a set. So A here is a set, this A is a set, and it's, it's more, the, the collection must be contained in a coily bracket. These are the elements of this set A. So the elements of set A are 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, separated with commas. So this is an example of set representation. 
can also represent a set in this form, P. The set is always represented in a capital letter. P is equal to set of, whenever you see curly brackets, it means set, set of prime numbers from 1 to 20. So in that case, you can still represent this set showing the prime numbers itself or in a statement form like this. Just the same way you can put this one and represent this as set of what whole numbers from 2 to 10. So it can be in statement form or it can be in the real form like this. So this is how you represent a set. You write a capital letter representing the name of the set. Then you put the elements, the collection of objects inside the coily bracket separated by commas. That's why we say that a set is a defined collection. You see, it's not one thing, but collection of objects or things. It can be numbers, it can be alphabets, it can be anything. Now, the elements of a set are the items contained in a set. You can see the items that are contained in this set. These are the elements of set A. And it can be represented with this type of E, while a non-element is represented with this. So consider these two sets, sets R and set Q. The elements of set R are 1, 2, 3, 4 to 8, whereas the elements of Q are 9, 11, 12, 13, 14. You can write that 2 is an element of R. You can see the way we represented the two elements of R, because 2 can be found in R. And you can say that 4 is not an element of Q, because if you check through this collection, you cannot see 4. Cardinal number of a set is the number of elements in a set. So if you come, say this set B, having this collection 2, 4, 6, 8, you can say that the cardinal of this set B is 4 because the number of elements are 4, 1, 2, 3, 4. So cardinal of B is equal to 4. C, you can also get the cardinal of C by counting the number of elements. If you count, you are going to have 8, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. It's actually 9. But then F is repeated twice. So any one that is repeated, you don't count, you count it as 1. So you only have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. So the cardinal of C, the cardinal of set C is 8. A subset is a set within another set. A subset is a set within another set. So consider these two sets. This is set G con containing 3, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. And another set H containing 5, 7, and 8. You can see that this 5, 7, 8 is also here, 5, 7, 8. So you can say that this H is a subset of G. H is a subset of G. And you can represent it using this. H is a subset of G. The bigger side is representing the superset, whereas the smaller side is representing the subset. Now, every set is a subset of itself. Every set is a subset of itself. Let's explain this. Every set is a subset of itself. So, let's talk about this set. With that, it brings us to another point known as power of a set. Every set is a subset of itself. Say set B to be this, 1 and 3. What are the subsets of this? Subset is any set that is contained in a set. So we can say that the subsets of B are itself. This is a subset of B. Also, subset 1 is also a subset of this because it is contained here. Also, 3 is also a subset. And finally, empty set is also a subset. So whenever you are drawing, whenever you want to get the subset of a of a given set, this set, these are the subsets. You have one three, which is because we say that every set is a subset of itself. Then we have only one, we have only three, then we have empty set. So B is actually having how many subsets? having four. So given any set, the number of subsets is known as the power of the set. It's known as the what? Power of the set. 
So how do you know the number of subsets for this? You simply count the number of elements that it has. Just do 2 to power. 2 to power the number of elements. So this is going to have 4 subsets. So let's say that you are given 1, 3, 4. And you are told to find the subset. Without writing them one by one. Just say 2 to power 3. Because you have how many elements? 1, 2, 3. So it's going to have how many subsets? 6. So how do we identify the subset? Once you already know that the subset will always be 6. It's easier for you to write. So you can always know that every element is a subset of itself. So you have to write this first. Then you have to write only 1. Then you have to write only 3. Then you have to write only 4. That's how many? 1, 2, 3, 4. Then you have to write only uh, 1 and 3. Then you have to write only 1 and 4. Then you have to write empty set. So making it 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Hmm? Am I making a mistake? Where is the mistake from? 2 to power 3 yes, is what? Be it's not 6. Yes. That's where the mistake is. Eight. 2 to power 3 is 8. You understand? Yes. So this has to have up to 8 subsets. So we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. So it's remaining 1. So we need to also have the subset of what? 3 and what? 4. So these are the subsets. You understand? We must have 8 because we have 1, 2, 3. It's going to be 2 to power n, which is 2 to power 3. So let's say now that we have 4 and 5, and we are told to find the power of this set. It's going to be 1, 2, 3, 4. So it's going to be 2 to power 4, which is what? 32, huh? So if you build the subsets of this, you're going to get up to 32. 2 to power 4 is 2 times 2 times 2 16. times 2. 2 times 2, 4, 4 times 2, 8. 16. 8 times 2, 16. Sorry. So this should be 16. So if you build the subsets of this, you're going to get up to 16 subsets. So very important, take note. So that is how you get the power of the set. Power of the set is simply telling us the number of subsets that a set has. So all these are subsets of this because all these are contained inside B. 1, 2, 3 is already there. Okay, this is the one I was using. 1, 3, 4 is already there. 1 alone is already here, 3 alone is already here, 4 alone is already here, 1, 3 is already here, 1, 4 is already here. Empty set is the subset of every set, 3, 4 is already here. Every set is a subset of itself. So that is set theory. Make sure you understand, every set is represented with a capital letter, and it was, the contents or the collection must be enclosed in a curly bracket, and the elements must be separated with commas. These are the elements. And subset of an element is, an, is another, subset of a set is another set that contains the same element or that contains elements that are inside the main set. So this is the superset and this is the, these are the subset. Power of a set is simply gotten by saying 2 to power the number of elements of the set. And the power of the set is also telling us the number of subsets that a set will have. The power of a set is telling us the number of subsets that a set will have. If you like this our video, please click on the subscribe button. Like and share it. Thank you. Hello, welcome. Today we are going to be looking at algebraic notation of sets. And we'll also be looking at the different types of sets where we have empty sets. Empty sets is any set that does not have any element. Empty set. Finite set. Finite set is any set that the elements can be counted. Infinite set is any element that is set, uh, element, any set that the elements cannot be counted. Now we also have the joint sets. Sets with elements that are not the same. 
Then we also have a core sets. Sets that have elements that are the same. So we'll be looking at all these today. Number one is our algebraic set notation. If you look at these two sets, Q is a set of X so that X is prime numbers less than 25. And Q is a set of 2, 3, 5, 7, 11, 13, 17, 19, 23. These two sets are the same. This set Q and this other set Q, both of them are the same. Only that the first one is written in algebraic set notation, whereas the second one is written explicitly. Is that clear? I mean, is that clear? David, is that clear? What is the difference between these two sets? Good. This one is written in set notation, whereas this one is written explicitly. So we say this is when elements of the set are not explicitly written. So whenever you don't write them explicitly, you write them in what you call a very word set notation. Is that clear? And look at the way it is read. Q is set of X, so that X is a prime is prime number less than 25. And you can see that all the prime numbers that are less than 25 are 2, 3, 5, 7, 11, 13, 17, 19, 23. So in subsequent classes, I'll be giving you assignments. I'll write in a bright set notation. I will, I will require you to write it in the explicit form. You understand? Now, check out this second one. F is a set of X, so that X is a member of integer. And this is, integer ranges from 5 to 14, with 5 and 14 inclusive. Is that clear? You see, the representation is all the integers from 5 to what, 14. And you know integers are whole numbers, isn't it? So we have 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. Why is it that 5 and 14 are included? Because we have less than, uh, we have equal to sign. If there was no this equal to, if it's just less than less than, we would have had from 6 to 13. Is that clear? But whenever you have equal to, it means that the extremes are included. You understand? Between 5 to what? 14. Is that clear? So this is what we call algebraic set notation. And this is the explicit form of writing the set. You understand? So these two sets are equal. These two sets are the same thing. Only that one is written in a break set notation and the other one is written explicitly. Is that clear? Now we look at the types of sets. An empty set is a set without any element. An empty set is a what? Any set that does not have any element. This is, a, this is how you say this is an empty set. Is that clear? What's the difference between this set and this set? This other set, this is not an empty set because it has element what? Zero. This is what we call empty set. Set without anything. Another word for empty set is null set. Another word for empty set is what? Null set. Final set. Final set is any set that has elements that can be counted. Is that clear? Final set. Any set that has elements that can be counted. Like Set of local governments in Nigeria. How many local governments do we have in Nigeria? 774, is it not? So it can be counted. So it's a finite set. Give me another finite set. Number of people in this class, you can count yourself, isn't it? But if I say set of odd numbers, is it finite? There are plenty of odd numbers you cannot count. So any set, any ele elements of set, any set that has elements that cannot be counted is known as a finite set. Like set of odd numbers, set of multiples of nine. This joint set, when you have two sets and they have no elements in common, we call them this joint set. Is that clear? Example, set R has element A, L, M, and set Q has element R, K, D. Is there any set in common? Is there any element in common between these two? So this is these are this joint set. Equal sets are sets that contain the same members or elements even if they are not written in the same order. Can you see set C? What are the elements of set C? 1, 3, 4, 7. What are the elements of set B? 3, 7, 1, 4. They, why are they equal? They are equal because they contain the same elements. Can you see? There's 3 here, there's 3 here, there's 1 here, there's 1 here, there's 4 here, there's 4 here, there's 7 here, there's 7 here. But they are not arranged similarly, you understand? But they are still equal. So you can write that C is equal to B. That way. So I'm going to be giving out this exercise in set notation to see how we how we are able to understand set notation, set algebraic notation. Is that clear? 
So we're going to be doing some examples. Now I'm going to require you to list the elements of the following set. Prime numbers less than 30. List me the elements of this set. Prime numbers less than 30. That's assignment number one. Number two, factors of 24 greater than 3. List me factors of 24 greater than 3. So list it explicitly. And finally, R is element of S so that S R is element of S so that X is a member of N is a member of N and is between and 20 so what question are you supposed to ask me about N you are supposed to know what N stands for who can tell me what N stands for All right, let me just say Z the one I have told you already so that later I will tell you what N is. So, to present it, such as X, please put S here. So, give me this set uh, explicitly. In subsequent classes, we'll look at them. Please, if you like this our video, click on the subscribe button, like and share it. Thank you, God bless you. Hello, welcome. Today we are going to be looking at the different relationships between sets. Different relationship between mostly two sets or any number of sets. Number one, we are going to be looking at intersection of sets. When you have set A containing elements like 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and you have set B containing elements like 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, the intersection of set A and set B is simply the elements that are common to both A and B, which is 3, 4, 5. Intersection of sets is represented as A, this is set A, intersecting set B, is a set that contains all elements common to sets A and B. Example, when you have set A containing 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and you have set B containing 9, 6, 4, 8, 10, 12, then Set of A intersection set B will be 4 and 6 because 4 is in A and 4 is in B. 6 is in A and 6 is in B. That's why the intersection is only these two elements that they have in common. Number two, we look at union of sets represented as A, U, B. Set A, union of set B is simply the set that contains all elements set A and B without repeating. So if you have set A as A, B, C, D, E, e and you have set B as e, A, E, I, O, U, then set A union B simply, you write out all the sets. A, B, C, D, E, you continue here. A, but you already written A, so you leave it, don't repeat it. E, you already written E, E here, don't repeat it. I, you write I. O, you write O. U, you write U. So it's simply the collection of both sets here and here. But don't repeat without what? Repeating. That is A union B. Now, universal set. Universal set is represented with U or E, capital letter U or E. And it's actually the background set. You understand? 
that contains all the sets that you're considering at the moment. Like say you're considering this set M that contains 1, 3, 5, 7, 8. And you're also considering set N that contains 1, 2, 4, 6, 8. What is the universal set? Universal set is simply like a union set of these two. So you have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Combination of all the possible sets. When you combine them, you form this. So that you can now talk about complement of sets, which is complement of sets is actually the elements that are not in the sets that you're considering, but are actually in the universal set. So let's say complement is written, you represent it by prime or small c at the top. So complement of set M, this is set M, 1, 3, 5, 7, 8. What are the complements? Complements of set M are those elements that are in the universal set, but they are not here. Like here you have 1, but you don't have 2. Because you don't have 2 in M, you put it here. You don't have 4 in M, you put it here. You don't have 6 in M, you put it here. So those sets that you don't have in M, but you have them in the universal set, they are the complements of M. The same thing, what are the complements of N? Those sets that are not in those sets that are not in N, but they are in universal sets. Like here, one is here, so you don't one is not. There is three here, but there is no three here, so you write. There is five here, but there is no five here, you write. There is seven here, but there is no seven here, you write. So complements of N are those sets that are in the universal set U but are not in N. Now we look at difference of a set represented as A minus B. Difference between set A and set B represented as A minus B. Simply the set of elements that are in A but are not in B. So if you look at these are the sets of elements in A. A, B, C, D, E, F. And these are the elements in B. B, D, E, G, H. What are the elements that are here but are not here? You see that they are A. A is here, but it's not here. C, C is here, but it's not here. F, F is here, but it's not here. So A minus B is this. But B minus A are the elements that are in B that are not in A. So if you look at A, B, what are the elements here that are not here? You talk about G. There is G here, but there is no G here. You talk about H. There is H here, but there is no H here. But then you can see that A minus B is not the same thing as B minus A. Can you see that? They are not the same. So you have to do it carefully. Please, if you like this, our video, click on the subscribe button, like and share it. Uh, thanks for your uh, subscription and everything. So we meet again. Thank you. Hello, welcome. Today we are going to be looking at Venn diagrams. We are going to be looking at what? Venn diagrams. Venn diagrams are shapes that we can use in explaining the relationship between sets. They are what? Shapes that we can use in representing the relationship between what? Sets. Is it? In our previous classes, we looked at a set and we say that every set is represented with a capital letter, is it not? Then on the other side, it is represented with elements that are enclosed inside a coily bracket. Is it? Now we are going to be representing every set with a cycle, with a what? Yeah. Or a sphere. And we are going to be representing the universal set with a what? Yeah. With a what? Yeah. Rectangle. With a what? Yeah. Rectangle. So anytime you are representing sets with, with cycles or spheres, and you are representing the universal set with a rectangle. We we'll call it. We we'll call that such representation what? Venn diagram. We we'll call it what? Venn diagram. Venn diagram. So Venn diagram is a geometric interpretation of sets using diagrams which shows different relationships between them. Is that clear? So this is a what? What is this? Rectangle. And what does it represent? Universal, Universal set E. Is that clear? And this circle inside it is a what? It's a set. It's a what? Set of what? P. It's a set of what? P. And we say that anything that is in P, anything that is in the universal set, but is not in P, is known as the complement of P. Is that clear? So all these other ones, apart from the P, is the complement. Is that clear? 
And we can also say that P is a subset of the word universal set. Because P, this circle, is contained inside a block known as the universal set. Exactly. And in previous class, we said that we represent sub subset like this. P is a word subset of what universal set. Then we look at this. The dotted portion is the complement of set word P. Can you see the dotted portion? This one. Why is it the complement of P? Because it contains the elements in the universal set but that are not in what P. That's why it's its complement. Now this in this relationship, what is it called? It is called the intersection. Exactly. P intersection word Q. Why? Because it's telling us that when P and Q are together, this is the only portion where they share together, is it not? That's the intersection. Then this one is showing us the things that are in P that are not in Q. And that is the difference, is it not? That's what we learned before. Difference. P minus Q. Or you can also call it P intersection Q prime. Now this relationship that everything inside is shaded is showing us the union of P and Q. Is that clear? So that's P union Q, written as P union Q. This relationship where the two sets are separate, what is it called? This joint set. Because they don't have anything in common. Unlike this one that has something in common. This one, they are separate. Their elements are separated. What of this relationship whereby a set Q? Hello, welcome. Today we're going to be looking at the relationship between three sets. Between how many sets? Three sets. Three sets. And we say that every set using the main diagram representation is normally represented using a what? And the universal set is presented using a what? Rectangle. So this is three sets. Can you see the set once? The first set is known as set what? And the second set is set what? And the third set is set what? Can you see where the three of them? Did the three of them join here? Yeah. Did the three of them join here? No. Here is only which ones are joining. A and what? B. Here, which ones are joining? A and what? B. Here, which ones are joining? A and K. But this side here, how many are joining? Three of them. So this point where all of them are joining that is shaded is known as what? R intersection K intersection what? B. Can you look at this set? Which of the sets are joining in the shaded portion here? K and B. K and P, is it not? So the shaded portion is where uh, K and P ha has the same element. And it is represented as K intersection what P. Can you see K and P, they are intersecting. Now intersection of what? Non R. Non R, is that clear? Because everything here is not inside R. Can you see that? Because this is R. Everything here is not inside R. So that's why we are using R prime. Is that clear? Now what are we having here? We are having things that are only in P, but are not in Q and Things that are only in R, but are not in K and P, is that clear? So we call it R intersection, not, not K. You understand? K prime simply means not K. So if it is not K, it has to be around R, is it not? Intersection, not P, or P prime, which is here only, is that clear? Now, if you have all the three, all the three of them shaded, we have R, we have K, and we have uh, P. Oh, shaded, we call it what? What do we call this? R what? Union what? K union what? P. Is that clear? What if we have all of them separated? We have what to call what? This joint. We have what to call what? This joint. Is that clear? So this is how you represent sets very importantly. Now, before we move on to the example, we are going to represent two sets using the two sets and the three sets. And you're going to tell me where and how to level each. Are we looking? Yeah. Anu, yeah. are you looking? Yeah. This is the first one. Is that clear? Yeah. And this is the what? Second one. Here we have sets and we have this. We have P and Q. And here we have three sets. And we have uh, R, O, M. Is that clear? 
Now tell me where I can represent P union Q. Oh, okay, let's start with intersection. Where is P intersection Q? Where do you join? Where? Where is it? Inside here, is it not? Okay. So inside here we can represent what? P intersection what? Is that? Yeah. Where can we represent only K? K. Only K will be here, right? Yes. Is that? Is that? Yes. Where will we represent only P? Only here, right? Yeah. Very, very important. Where do we represent the uh, M intersection? This should be capital letter, right? Yeah. M intersection, R intersection, O. Where should that be here? Yeah. Middle, isn't it? Where can we have M intersection, O intersection, R prime? Down Where? Yes. Is it here? Yes. Thank you. That is here. Is that clear? Yes. Where can we have R intersection M intersection O prime? The top. The yeah, yes. Yes. Is that clear? Yes. So very importantly, you need to know where to find each one. You understand? Because we are going to be using this to solve uh, real problems in Venn diagram. Exactly. Because if you like this our video, click on the subscribe button, like and share this our video. Thanks for your subscriptions and support. Hello, welcome. Uh, we said that when we want to represent a given set into diagram, that the universal set is normally represented using a what? And the individual sets are represented using the word circle. Is that clear? So this assignment is telling us to represent this in Venn diagram. Is that clear? So first of all, what do we draw first? Rectangle. Rectangle representing the word universal sets. You. Is that clear? So what the next thing we do? We draw the different sets. Circle, circle, circle. Is that clear? The first one is what? P. The other one is what? Q. And the other one is what? R. Is that clear? First thing is that you draw the word universal set U. Represent it. First circle P. Second circle Q. And third circle what? R. Whenever you want to pick this and put here, the first thing you do is that you put where all of them are. The element that all of them have the same. So which element is that? There's two here, there's two here, there's two here. So you put it where? Here. The middle. Is that clear? Then you take two sets, P and Q. What do they have in common? This is P and this is Q. Huh? They have five in common. They also have two in common. But you've already represented two, so you write your five. Now ask yourself, P and R, what do they have in common? P and R, what do they have in common? They have four in common. They also have what? Two in common. But you've represented two, so you write what? Four. You ask yourself, Q and R, Q and R, what do they have in common? One and six and two. One, six and two. But well, you represented two, so you just write what? One and what? Six. Is that clear? So the next thing you do now, you ask yourself, what is it that only P has that other people don't have? Seven. Yes. What is it that only Q has that others don't have? Eight. What is it that R has that Nine. others don't have? Nine. Is that clear? Now you ask yourself, what is it that in the Universal said that it's in neither of these. Three and ten. Three, there's no three in all these. And what? Ten. ten. Is that clear? Yes. And you solve the assignment. Is that clear? Yes. So whenever you want to represent a given set in the Venn diagram, first of all, the universal set is represented with a what? Rectangle. Mm -hmm. The individual sets are represented with Six. circles. Is that clear? Yes. Now if you want to pick out the element, the first element that you need to pick out is the what? The intersection between the three sets. You understand? So you check these three sets and see what is common. That is two, but you put it in the middle. Now you pick two sets. Two, two sets. Check what is common between P and Q. What is common? Five. Apart from the two that you've already picked, you put. Is that clear? Between Q and R, what is common? 
1 and what? 6. Between P and R, what is common? P and R, 4. Is that? Then, what is in P that is neither in any of these other three? 7. What is in Q that is neither in any other three? 8. What is in R that is neither in any of the three? Now, what is in the universal set that is not in any of these three? 3 and 10. Exactly. So that's how you present it. Very important. If you like this our video, please click on the subscribe button. Thanks for your support. Are we through on this? Did we understand this very well? So we'll do the last assignment for this. Hmm. Hello, welcome. Today we are going to be looking at Calculus. Today we are going to be looking at calculus. Calculus is a, it's a type of mathematics that involves uh, differentiation and integration. A general word for differentiation and integration. So we're going to be looking at differentiation and integration. We're going to be starting with differentiation. Given y as a function of x, we presented in this way ax to power n. Given y as a function of x represented as ax to the power n. What is the differentiation of y? What is the y dx? So whenever you are given this expression, I are told to find the dy dx of this expression. Take the exponent to the back of the coefficient. The coefficient is a, the exponent is n. So take this exponent to the back of the coefficient so that we have it n a. Then reduce the exponent by 1 so that you have n minus 1. Very, very important. Study it. You have y and you have x here. And you are told to differentiate y with respect to s. What will you get? n a x n to the power minus 1. Very, very important. So that is how you differentiate. So now, if you are given y equal to... If you are given y equal to 2 x3. You see, this is the same as this. We are a is equal to 2, x is equal to x, n is equal to 3. So how do you find the differential? How do you find the dy dx of this expression? It's going to be, you take this to this place, just like the way you did this one. Okay, Let me put it here. So how do you find the dy dx for this expression? You take this here, so that you have 3 times 2, just the way you took the n, the exponent, and back to the back of the coefficient. So you now have x, then you reduce the exponent by 1, so you have 3 minus 1. So this is going to give you 3 times 2, which is what? 6. x to the power 3 minus 1, which is what? 2. So this is the differentiation of this expression. This now. So this is the express this is the differentiation of this expression. Very, very simple. Take this up over. So you have three times two, which is six. reduce this by one, three minus one. So if you are given four x to the power five, what will be the differential? Take this to so here, it will be five times four, which is what? Twenty x. Reduce this by one, five minus one, which is four. So this is the differential. So very, very important. That is how you differentiate. That is how you differentiate. So I'm going to clean up this. I just use this to explain that the differential, differentiation of y, which is the y dx, if the expression is given as x n to the power n, it's going to be n a x to the power n minus 1. So given this, this, find the dy dx or differentiate, it's going to be this is y equal to x squared. So the dy dx is going to be this coming over, making it 2x, reducing this by 1, 2 minus 1, to give us 2x. The same as this, this coming over will give you 2 times 2, which is 4. Reduce this by 1. Okay? Then the message is supposed to be 2x to the power 4. So this coming over here will make it 4 times 2. Then reducing this by 1 will give you 3. 4 times 2 is 8. So, if you want to differentiate expression that is longer than just one, you do it one by one. Divide the x of this will be 6 times 4, 24, 
x to the power I reduce 6 by 1, 5. 3 times 12, 36, x to the power 2. 2 times 10, 20x. Then this, this will give you 1 minus 1, which is 0. x to the power 0 is 1. 1 times 5, 5. Differentiation of a constant gives you 0, so you don't need to write this. Now, these are the very uh, important differentiation uh, values that you should know. Whenever you're differentiating sine x, it will give you cos x. Whenever you're differentiating cos x, it will give you sine, minus sine x. Whenever you're differentiating tan x, it will give you 1 over cos squared x. Whenever you're differentiating e to the power x, it will also give you e to the power x. And whenever you're differentiating ln x, it will give you 1 over x. Very, very important. Take note of this, as we are going to be using it in subsequent classes to look at differentiation. Very, very important. Differentiation of a, x, n gives you this coming over n, a, x, n minus 1. The y over the x. So in subsequent classes, we are going to be looking more on this. Please click on the subscribe button to subscribe to our channel. Like and share this video. Thank you. Subsequent classes will go further from here. Welcome. Today we are going to be learning statistics. Today we are going to be learning statistics in mathematics. What is statistics? Statistics is very, very simple. Statistics simply means working on data or data, manipulating data to make it meaningful so that people can understand. Is that clear? That is the meaning of statistics. It's nothing difficult. It simply means when you have a collection of data, work on it, manipulate it so that people can understand the information you're trying to pass. Is that clear? Let's say now we have data of or data of scores of students. You understand? You come to your class now. We have Ulu scored how many? 12. Ada scored 15. Uh, Shola scored 20. Obi scored 12. Uh, Adamu scored 15. You understand? If you have this collection of data and you're looking at it, are you understanding it? It's difficult for you to understand it. You understand? But when you take this collection of data, you prefer it in a table. Then from this table, you're able to calculate the mean of the scores. If you tell me that the mean of the scores of the students is 70, 70, I will say, yes, these students are doing good. But if you tell me that the mean of the students is 20, I will say, hey, people are not passing this geography again. No. We need to teach it very well. Is that clear? So when you now get the mean and you tell people about the mean, people will be able to understand what the information you're trying to get across. Is that clear? But if they are looking at this data the way it is, it doesn't make more sense. But when you convert this data from this way it is into a table, then from this table you can easily calculate things like mean, mode, median, standard deviation, variance, then you're passing meaningful uh, information to the people. Is that clear? So statistics simply means what? Manipulating what? Data into forms. I'm using it to calculate statistical parameters like the mean, mode, median, that will make sense to the end user. Is that clear? Is that clear? So we say that in statistics, we we'll study what we saw called data collection and what analysis. When you collect your data, can you see this data? It has been collected. This is the scores of people in the class. And that will be, uh, what is Joshua's score? 20. What is Mohammed's score? 20. What is Adamu's score? 15. So when you do data collection, which is picking out this data, is that clear? Then you analyze it by putting it in tables like this, you understand? Then from this table, you can calculate the mean, mode, median. Then you are doing what you call what? You are doing what you call what? Statistics. You understand? Statistics means what? Collecting data, arranging that data, manipulating it, and using it, putting it in form of table, in tabular form and using it to get information like mean, mode, standard deviation, variance, you understand? Those parameters, those statistical parameters, they make meaning to the person that gets to get the information. Is that clear? That's a statistic. So we say that data is any numerical fact. Data is any word. What data are we using here? Scores. What data are we using here? Is, is scores the only data that you can use? No, you can also use what? Heights. I can decide to measure the height of all the students. I'll go to Ada, I'll measure the height of Ada. If the height of Ada is 1.7, I'll come here and write what? 1.7. I'll measure that of Obi. If it's 7.2, I write. Is that clear? 
So data is any numerical fact or information that which can be what measured. Is that clear? Example of data is what? Height, weight, age, man. You understand? So once you can measure it or you can give it a numerical qualification, you call it what? Data. Examples of data are what? Height, weight, age, mark, mass is volume. The data we are using here is the what? Marks or scores. Is that clear? In statistics, these data are analyzed to get what? What do you analyze the data to get? Statistical variables like the what? Mean, mode, standard deviation, etc. You understand? In tabular graphical forms to give better meaning to the end word user. You understand? So when you work on the data to give better meaning to the end user, you've done what we call what? You've done what we call what? Do you understand what statistic is now? Working on data. And this is data. This is what? This is what data. This is what data. Once you work on it to convert it into this tabular form, and finally, in terms of mean, mode, median, and variance, we call it what? Statistics. This statistical Parameters can be classified into what? Into a uh, measure of uh, measure of uh, measure of central tendency or measure of location. You understand? You're trying to uh, you're trying to calculate average. We call it what? Averages. And you're going to find out that this statistics you can use it not only in mathematics. You use it in data science in computing. You understand? When I'll be taking you on uh, when I take uh, lectures on Python. We know that we have what to call data science. You understand? Data analysis and visualization. You understand? So statistics is just another way of saying data science. Collection of data, working on it, manipulating it in such a way that people can easily make sense of the data. You understand? So in data analysis, what you're doing is actually statistics. What you're doing is actually what? Yeah. Only that you're not using computer program to work on it. You understand? You use programs like Python, you use uh, R language. Is that clear? So, there are two types of data in statistics. There are two types of what? Data in statistics. We have what to call repetitive data. We have what to call what? Yes. Repetitive data is like, if you look at this data, you see that there is 12 here. Can you see 12? Can you see another 12? So, 12 is repeating. You understand? So, whenever you have data that has repeating, you can see 30 here. You can also see 30 here. Whenever you have data that are repeating, you can easily put it in tabular form, and it find the word frequencies. You understand? Frequency is simply telling us the number of times that something has occurred. Is that clear? 12. How many times did 12 occur in this data? 16. How many times did 15 occur in this data? 13. So if you count number of 12, 1, 2, 3, 4, you count all the 12, you get 16. Count all the 15, you get what? 13. This tally is not required so much. You understand? We only use this tally for you to to make it easier for you to get the frequency. Is that clear? Yes. So this tally is not very important. You are only using the tally, like if you want to count 12, let's say you didn't have this, and you want to count the number of 12. If you see the first 12, you write what? One tally, is it not? Second 12, you write another word, one tally. Third 12, I mean, fourth one. Fifth one, you cross it like this. So you know that there are how many 12s here? Five. Five. You understand? You start again. You understand? So this is the essence of the word tally. Is that clear? Yes. Can you understand the essence of the tally? Yes. It's not as if it's very important. You understand? But it makes the calculation of the frequencies to the word simple. Is that clear? Yes. This is for repetitive data. For non-repetitive data like age, you understand? If you have one, do you have another one here? Mm -hmm. If you have nine, do you have another nine here? Mm -hmm. So this is a non-repetitive data. But this one is repetitive data. But you're going to see that in actual real world uh, situation, you will always see repetitive word data. Because if I'm picking the data of the scores in a class or your height, you'll find out that one person, two people may have the same score, like say 55. Don't you have two people having the same score in a subject in your class? You have it back. So in real life, you have repetitive data. For you to calculate mean, mode, median, standard deviation, and variance, for repetitive data, you need to first of all put it in tabular form. Is that clear? Yes. But if you want to calculate it for non-repetitive data, it's simpler. Now, let's calculate the mean data for this non-repetitive data. Ages in a class, we have you having the age of 1, the other person having the age of 9, the other person having 9. Can we calculate this uh, mean? How do we calculate? 
The mean of this simply means addition of all of them, is it not? 1 plus 9 plus 8 plus 10 plus 2 plus what? 3. All over how many times they have? Huh? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Huh? Yes. This will give us the mean, is it not? Yes. Now, the mode, what will give us the mode? The, the mode is the highest score. Huh? Yes. And the highest score is what? 10. But here now, what is the mode? For a repetitive data, the mode is not the highest score. You cannot say that the mode here is 30. Yes. For a non-repetitive data, the mode is normally the highest what? score, which is 10. But for a repetitive data, the mode is the score with the highest frequency. The score with the highest what? Okay. The most occurring score. And the mode here is what? For this repetitive data, the mode is what? 12. Is that clear? Yeah. So can you see the difference between a non-repetitive data and repetitive data? Can you see the difference? Yeah. You understand? So this collection of data, you have to put it in tabular form. Calculate the frequency before you can be able to tell us the mode. But for this one that is not repeating, you can simply say it from there. Then median, how can we calculate the median? Median is, this, is the what? The middle number. So you have to arrange this first. So the smallest is what? 1, followed by 2, followed by 3, followed by 8, followed by 9, followed by what? 10. So what is the middle number? You have this first to go, this first to go, you have 3 and 8. You understand? So the median should be in between 3 and 8, is it not? So it should be 3 plus 8 all over what? 2. Can you see that we've been able to calculate the mode, median, and mean for this non-repetitive data? Is it? But that of this one is not easy to easily calculate. You understand? First of all, you have to convert it to table. And in subsequent classes, I'll be teaching you how to use this table to calculate all these measures. Measure of central tendency, measure of dispersion, measure of location. You understand? These measures are what we call statistical parameters. You understand? When you give somebody information, depending on this, then you've done the statistics. Is that clear? When you can be able to tell me the mean of the scores, because the mean of the scores tells me something, is it not? The mean of the scores tells me whether people are passing. If you tell me that the mean score for these people is 70, I'll say, yeah, they are doing well. I'll go and greet my teachers. I'll be like, oh, my teachers, you guys are trying. If you tell me that the mean is 32, will I be happy with my teachers? I'll say they are not doing well. You understand? So with this form, once we work on the statistics and get the statistical parameters or the measures of central tendency or location, somebody can easily make sense of your data. Is that clear? Mm -hmm. Now, if you tell me that the mode, the mode is uh, is 12, will I be happy with mode of 12? When you tell me that mode is 12, you're telling me that most people got 12. Is it not? Because 12 is the most occurring. I will say hey, the score is not good. I mean, but if you tell me that the mode is 30, I will say plenty of people scored 30. Can you see that? So you can see the mean is making sense. The mode is also making sense. Is that clear? So that's what we call them averages. And that is what you do statistics for. You want to be able to use the data to calculate these averages. So that with these averages, somebody can make sense of what you're saying. Is that clear? Please, if you like this video, click on the subscribe button. Like and share it so that people can get it. In subsequent classes, we are going to be doing a whole lot of things on the statistics. I hope you enjoyed the class. If you have any question, drop it on the comment section of this video. Thank you very much. Yes, welcome. Today we are going to be looking at measure of central tendencies. We are going to be calculating things like mean, mode, and median. We are going to be calculating things like what? Mean mode and what median these are statistical parameters you understand they are statistical uh, measurements that tell us how our data is arranged is that clear and they are known as measure of central tendency they are known as what measure of central or tendencies example is what mean another example is what mode another example is what median you understand i'll be doing this calculation for not repeating data repeating data and in subsequent classes, group data. Is that clear? And I told us to calculate the mean. We are starting with mean. To calculate the mean for this non-repeating data. Let's say these are the heights of one, two, three, four, five people. How do we calculate the mean? We simply say that the mean is equal to what? Summation of these heights. X, Abby, all over number of N. Is it not? Yes. So what is the summation of the that is, what are the summation? We have what? 1.23 plus 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 1
plus what? 3.42 plus what? 8.21 plus what? 4.22 plus what? 3.1. All over. How many are they? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. All over 5, is it? What's the answer? 20 what? Point one eight. That is the mean. Is that clear? Yes. Summation of all the scores, all over number, how many they are. Is that clear? Yes. So we've done the mean. Have we done the mean? Have we done the mean? So let's do the what? Let's find the mode. What is the mode? The mode for a now repeating data is simply the what? The highest number, is it? Yes. So what is the mode here? The highest data is what? 8.21. Have we done the mode? Yes. Have we done the mode? Now we do the median. The median for a non repeating data is simply the what? Middle number. So we are going to arrange this in descending or ascending, ascending order. The smallest number is what? 1.23. Followed by what? 3.1. Followed by what? 3.42. Followed by what? 4.22. Followed by what? 8.21. 8.21. Is that? So what is the middle number? If we count out 1, 2, I will count out 1, 2. What's the middle number? So we can say that the median is what? Equal to what? 3.142. Have we done the median? Have we done the median? So I cannot clean it up. Is it? So what are the values that we found for this? We found that mean is equal to what? 4.0. 4.0036. Found that mode is what? 8.21. We found out that the median is what? 3.42. 8. 3.42. Is that clear? Yes. So for this data, we can easily say that the mean is this. That's the average. Is that? Yes. The mode, the highest occurring number is this. And the middle number is this. Is that clear? So this is for not repeating. For this one that is repeating, how do we solve it? We we'll have to construct the frequency table first, is it not? So we are going to say what? Ages in bracket what? X, is it not? Then we are going to say what? Frequency, is that? And we are now going to say what? Fx. That's frequency this times what? X. Is that? Good. Now, what are the ages that we have? We have what? Two. Is it not? Yes. How many times is two occurring? One, two, three. Is that? Yes. So f of x will be what? Two times three, which will be what? Six. Is that clear? Yes. The second number is what? Three. How many times is three occurring? One, two. Is it two? Three. But fx will be what? Three times three, which is what? Nine. What other number? Two will take in four. How many times is 4 occurring? Mm. Fx will be what? 8. 8. How many times is 8 occurring? 1. Fx will be what? 8. How many times is 9 occurring? 1. Fx is what? 9. Can you see that? Yeah. So that now, what is the summation of the frequency? 3, 3 plus 3. 6, 6 plus 2. 8. 8. 9, 10. So it's 10. What is the summation of f of x? 6 plus 9 plus 8 plus 8 plus 9. What's the answer? 40. Is that clear? Now, if you want to calculate the mean for a data that is put in a frequency table, the formula is this second one. The formula is what? This second one, which is what? Summation of f of x all over summation of what f. So summation of f of s is what? 40. All over summation of f is what? 10. Giving us what? 4. So that is the mean. Is that clear? What is the mode for a for a data that is repeating that we are ready in this form? The mode is simply the one with the highest frequency. What is the one with the highest frequency? 2 and 3. So we have two modes, is it? So we have modes of what? 2 and what? 3. Is that clear? Now, what is the median? The median, we have to arrange it. Is that clear? Yes. Then you get the what? N plus 1 over 2 member. The N plus 1 over 2 member is the what? Median. Is that clear? Yes. In subsequent classes, I'll be teaching you this. So, for this course, how do you find the mean of this and the median and the mode of this? What formula will you use? You will still use this same formula, is it not? Yes. 
So first of all, you have to prepare this just the way we prepare this in the frequency table, is it not? Yeah. We get the summation f and summation f of x to find the mean, is it not? Yeah. Then you get the mode. What will be the mode? The one that is highest occurring. What will be it? Who can tell me the mode? Ten and thirty. Ten and thirty. You understand? So I want you to solve this as an assignment using this formula, and with that we end today's class. Is that clear? If you love this class, click on the subscribe button, like and share this video. Is that clear? Thank you. Hello, welcome. Today we are going to be looking at root data or root data. Is that clear? In the previous class we looked at uh, repetitive data, you understand? But when you have large entries of data, like in real world situation, you are going to be having large entries. You are going to be having what? Large entry of different occurrences. Like now we are having this large data. Can you see this large data? This is a data of heights of boxes in CM. Is that clear? We brought boxes. Then we are measuring their heights. You understand? We measure the first one, we wrote the height as what? 18. We measure the second box, we wrote the height as what? 34. The third one, 20. All the boxes, you understand? Now you see that 18 is different from 34. 34 is different from what? 20. 20 is different from 39. When you have different entries like this, you understand? And the entries are large. You need to use what we call what? Group data. You need to use what we call what? Group data. So that frequency table we constructed yesterday, instead of writing 18, they will count the number of 18. I'll write 20 and I'll count the number of 20. If we keep writing it like that, this, this column will be very long. Is that clear? This column will be very long. To avoid that, we need to do what? Group our data. We need to do what? We group our data. So instead of saying for 18 alone, we say from 18 to 20, how many of them are occurring? Is that clear? From 21 to 23, how many of them are occurring? Is that clear? From 24 to 26, how many of them are what? Occurring. So if we want to take from 18 to 20, how many are occurring? What we will do? We will count. 18, this is 1. This is 2 back. 19, it's still within the limit. This is 3, isn't it? So we will pick it until we arrive at this level. Exactly. So that's how we will grow. But how do you know that you are supposed to put from 18 to 20? Instead of saying from 18 to maybe 22, how do you know that? How do you determine your class interval? How do you determine your class interval? That is what we are going to learn now. Is that clear? For you to determine your class interval, first of all, you must ascertain the number of groups. You must ascertain the number of what? Groups. How many groups do we have here? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Is that clear? So you assume how many groups you want to have. You can assume 10, you understand? But for this, we've assumed how many? 8. So that's why we say what? Supposing we classify the data into what? 8 equal intervals. So these are 8 equal intervals. Is that clear? So having known that we are now assuming 8 equal intervals, yeah? you understand? We look at this our data and we determine the smallest data. What is the smallest data here? 18, is it? The least height is what? 18. Then we'll check again what is the highest data or the biggest data. The greatest height is what? 40. So we determine the range by saying what? 40 minus what? 18, which is what? 22. So anything we get as the range, for us to know the width of our interval, we simply say the range divided by the number of groups we want to have, which is 18, is that? So that we get the number called what? 2.75. If we have 2.75, it is approximately what? 3. But and if we have 2.1, what will we approximate it to? 2. Is that clear? So this is how we got 3. Now, having 3 now, we can now put our class interval. Is that clear? We now start with the smallest. The smallest is what? 18. We count 3, add it to it. If we have 18, we are going to have what? 19. And we are going to have what? 20. Is that not? So that's what we say is from 18 to what? 20. After this interval, we are going to have the next one. After 20 is 21. Is it not? So we count 21, 22, 23. Is that? We write 23. After 23, we are supposed to have 24, is it not? Then we count again, 24, 25, 26, we write. Is that clear? Until we get to the last number. The last number is 40, so we 
will stop at 41. Is that clear? So now, having identified our class intervals, now we'll start counting. From 18 to 20, how many data do we have there? How many? So 18, this is 18, is it not? One, this is two, is it not? This is what? Three, is it? This is four, you understand? This is five, you count. As you're counting, you're marking your tally until you reach five, you understand? So if you count the number that is inside 18 to 20, we'll find out that it's how many? 11. We we'll count the ones that are inside uh, 21 to 23, we'll find out that it's what? Four. Once we count down, is that clear? Is that clear? So this is how you find your frequency table for a group word data, for a group word data. So number one thing you do is that you determine the number of groups you want to share them to. Is it? You identify the least data, the highest data. You do the highest by on the list to give you the range. Then to calculate the width of the intervals, you simply say the range all over the number of people intervals that you want. Any number you will have, if you have a floating or a decimal number, you have to approximate it to an integer. Is that clear? So you now build, you write your intervals, count it, and write the frequency. Is that clear? Now, secondly, once you have your class interval, you can have things like your class limit, your boundary, class mark, and cumulative word frequency. Is that clear? Where is my marker? Is it there? Let me get to marker. No stop it. So we're going to look at the frequencies. We're going to look at the what? We're going to look at the what? These are the frequencies. Now we're going to extend it by adding up another one known as what? Cumulative what? Frequency. What is cumulative frequency? To so make this cumulative frequency column, write the first frequency, which is what? 11. The second one is going to be 11 plus 4, which is what? 15. Is it? The third one is going to be 15 plus 8, which is what? 23 is it? 23 plus 7, which is what? 30. Is that? That's how you build the cumulative frequency side. Is that clear? Another thing of importance is what we call class limit. Is what we call what? If I ask you what is the class limit for this first line, you're going to tell me that the class limit is you have you have two types of class limit. The lower what? Lower limit and the what? Upper limits. So what is the lower limit here? 18. What is the upper limit here? 20. Is that? For the second value, what is the lower limit here? 21. What is the upper limit? 23. Is that clear? For the third value, what is the lower limit? 24. And what is the upper limit? 26. Can you understand what the limits are? Now we are going to look at the second one, known as what? Class word boundary. The lower boundary and the what? Upper upper word boundary. So for this first one, what is the lower boundary? The lower boundary, since this is 18, the lower boundary is going to be what 17.5. And the upper boundary is going to be what? 20.5. Is that? For this one, for this one, the lower boundary is going to be what? 20.5. And the upper boundary is going to be what? 23.5. Can you see the, can you identify the upper limits and the lower limits and the boundaries? Can you do that? So now, finally we need to find the word class mark. We need to find the word very, very importantly, you are going to be using this when you are solving some things. So if I call this cumulative frequency table, if I call it CF, CF represents what cumulative word frequency, so that I can use here as the word class word mark, class word mark. Class mark is simply when you add these limits together, 18 plus what, 20 all over what, 2, that's the first for this one. Huh? Class mark for this will be what? 21 plus 23 all over what? 2. Can you see that? You're just adding these two limits and dividing by 2. 
Class mark for this one is going to be what? 24 plus what? 26 all over what? 2. So if you do this, you're going to be getting 19, is it not? If you do this one, what will you get? I think 22, back. If you do this one, what will you get? You get around 25. So these values of class marks, you're going to be using it to calculate the mean and other things. Is that clear? So I'm going to be giving us an example that will give us a data like this. Is that clear? Then with that data, you prepare this table, give me the frequency, give me the cumulative frequency as well as the class marks. Is that clear? So that in subsequent classes, I will be using it to solve for the mean and other things. Is that clear? Are we together on this? Please, if you like this video, click on the subscribe button, like and share these videos. Thank you very much. Hello, welcome. We are going to be continuing from what we just uh, finished on. We are going to learn how to calculate the mean for a grouped data. We are going to learn how to do what? Calculate the mean for a grouped what? Data. So, from the data we had before, we are able to note the class intervals, is it not? Then from the class intervals, we got the frequency by noting the, the number of times, of number of occurrence of each one, is it not? Then from there we are able to, from the frequencies we are able to calculate the cumulative frequency, is it not? By just writing the first frequency, then to get the second, we just say this plus this, 11 plus 1, 15, 15 plus 8, 23, 23 plus 7, 30, 30 plus 5, 35, and 7 plus 4, 39, 39 plus 4, 43, bar. But 3 plus this, 50, is it not? So here is 50. You know that if here is 50, so it also means that the summation of the frequency is also 50, is it not? Now we calculated the intervals. And the way we got the interval is by saying what? The lower limit plus the upper limit divided by 2, is it not? So 18 plus 20 over 2, 21 over 23 over 2, like that, is it? Now if you want to calculate the mean for that same thing, we need to prepare another table. We need to do what? Prepare another table, or you can still use this table, but for you to understand this point, it's always good you put it on another table. Is that clear? You write the class intervals. Is that clear? Then you write this class mark that we got here. You rewrite it here. Is that clear? Then you write the frequencies and find the summation of the frequencies. Summation of frequencies is equal to what? 50. Now you now do class mark. Our f of x for this is simply class mark times frequency, or you say frequency times class mark. Is that clear? Is that the frequency times class mark will give us frequency times class mark? Can you see it? 11 times 19, 209 back. 14 times 22, 88. So you multiply this out to get give you this. Then you find the summation. Is that clear? Yes. Now, the arithmetic, the arithmetic mean for a group data like this is simply equal to summation of the f of x all over summation of the frequency. Is that clear? So summation of f of x here is 14, 20, 12. 14, 12 is in us, 1,412. Summation of frequency is what? 50. If you divide that, you get 28.124. That is the arithmetic mean. Is that clear? Is that clear? Good. So, that's where we are going to be stopping. And I'm going to give us an assignment to find the formula we can use for the median and the what mode. But we can know that the mode is always the highest of all. Is it not? And you can find the highest of all by looking at the frequency. Is it not? So in subsequent classes, we are going to be looking at pie charts, bar charts, and other data visualization techniques. Is that clear? Yeah. If you like this video, please click on the subscribe button, like and share these videos. Thank you. See you in the next class. Hello, welcome. Today we are going to be looking at uh, graphical representation of data. In programming like Python and Java, they call it data visualization. They call it what? Data visualization. You understand? Converting data to something that you can see and appreciate. Is that clear? Converting data from tabular form to bar chart, pie chart, histogram. You understand? Charts are diagrams that somebody can look at and say, yeah, this is making sense. Is that clear? So when you convert a data in tabular form to diagrams like bar charts, pie charts, 
or histogram, we call it graphical representation, we call it what? And in programming, we call it what? Data visualization. Exactly. So whenever you hear data visualization, don't think that, hey, what are they talking about? Data visualization. You are trying to visualize data. Is that your data that is in uh, collect you collected and you put it in a platform or to put it in graphs so that you can visualize it and appreciate it more? Is that clear? So whenever we talk about graphical representation or data visualization, simply mean converting our data towards towards talk it loud, I want to hear by chart what? Instagram or what? By chart. And today we are going to be starting with each one. Bar chart. What is a bar chart? What is a bar chart? Bar charts are what? Rectangular bars of equal width. They are of equal what? The distance between here and here, they are equal. Can you see that? Rectangular bars. Are they not rectangle? They are rectangle. Rectangular bars of equal, equal what? Width. Whose height or length? Whose what? Height or length are proportional to the quantities or size of the item they represent. You understand? The height of this one, is it bigger than this? Is it bigger than this? Yes. This one is having height of 5,000, whereas this one is having height of what? 2,5. Is that clear? So their height is in proportion to what they are representing. Is that clear? Since 1994 is representing 5,000, it is higher than 1993 that is representing 2,5. Can you see? 5,000 is it not bigger than 2,5? So the length is proportional to what they are measuring. Is that clear? But their widths are constant. Their widths are what? Is that clear? So this is a pattern. This is a what? Good. We are going to take an example. Example. The table below shows the number of items produced by two vendors over a period of what? Five years. So this is the table. Year. 1990, 1991, 92, 93, 94. Items produced. 4,015, 3,000, 5,000. Is that clear? Now, what is the assignment they are telling you? Prepare a what? Bar chart for this distribution. So, how do you prepare a bar chart for this distribution? To prepare any bar chart, you must draw this, your axis. You must draw your what? So, what are the axes that you have? You look at what the items you have here. That's what you draw your axis from. Is that clear? We have year. Is that clear? So, the year comes down here. Then we have the measurements. Items produced. It becomes our what? Uh, verticalizes. Is that clear? Yeah. So after drawing your axis, use equal representation of weight to represent the width of this. Is that clear? Pick your scale depending on the measurement that you have. What is the highest number here? 5,000. Is it not? The lowest number is what? 1,5. So it's likely that you will start from 1,000 and get to 5,000. Is that clear? So and uh, give equal proportions for them according to maybe on your on your graph sheet or the book you're writing with is that clear? If the first line is one thousand, if the first line is zero, the second one will be what one thousand, the third one what two thousand, three thousand, four thousand, five thousand. Is that clear? Now start drawing the bars according to the weight, according to the what? According to the what the size. At nineteen ninety what is the size? 4,000, is it not? So you trace 4,000. Is that clear? At 1991, what is the size? 1,5. 1,5 is between 1,000 and 2,000, is it not? At 1992, it is what? 3,000, is it not? 3,000 is here, you trace it, then you come and draw. Is that clear? At 1993, what is the size? 2,5. 2,5 is between 3,000 and 2,000, so you trace it like this. Is that? At 1994, the size is what? The quantity is what? 5,000. You trace 5,000. Is that clear? Make sure you space the bar equally. The space between here and here should be equal to this space. Is that clear? And the width of the bar should be equal. Is that clear? Make sure you also indicate the axis. This is the A axis, is it? And this is the item produced or number of item produced axis. Is that clear? So this is a bar chart. Like I said, bar charts are what rectangular bars of equal words width, whose length and height are proportional to the quantity or sizes of the item they are representing. Is that clear? So we ended up converting this table to this word bar chart. Is that clear? 
the subsequent classes, we will learn how to convert tables to histogram. Learn how to convert tables to what? My chart. Is that clear? That is data visualization. You want to visualize your data in graphical form. Is that clear? You collect your data, then you convert it to graph. Data visualization. Data visualization. Graphical representation of what? Data. Is that clear? Please uh, click on the subscribe button to subscribe to this our channel so that you can be getting videos like this. Like and share this video. series in graphical representation of data. In the previous class, we talked about bar charts, is it? We talked about bar charts. Today, we are going to be looking at pie charts. You understand? Bar charts is when we use rectangular bars of equal weights. Is that clear? With varying length, depending on the size of what they are representing. Today, we are going to be using a pie chart. Pie chart is simply a circle that is divided into sectors. Is that clear? With the angles being proportional to the sizes that they are representing. Is that clear? So now you have you are giving this data of expenditure done by Mr. Josiah on beans, on rice, on meat, on this. You understand? With these are the values of the expenditure. You want to convert this to a pie chart. First of all, you need to convert the amount of these expenditures to a sectoral to sectoral angles. Is that clear? Before you can draw it in a pie chart. So how do you go about representing a data like this into a pie chart? Number one, you need to construct another table. We need to do what? Construct another table that will include the sectoral angles. Is that clear? So expenditure, uh, the item that the expenditures we are done on, you write them here. Is that clear? The amounts, you write them. Then you start calculating the sectoral angles. How do you calculate the sector angle? Number one, you need to find the summation of the amount. Is that clear? Summation of all of these is 1,800. Is that clear? So if so all is 1,800, what angle will 600 subtend? Because 1,800 is subtending an angle of what? 360, which is the total angle in a circle. So only 600 will subtend what angle? 600 over 1,800 that times 360 is that clear which will give us 120. Now 250 what angle will it subtend in a circle? You say 250 over the total times 360 is that clear? You do say for all of them. If you check your angle when you do the summation if it is not equal to 360 then you've not done the correct thing is that clear? Make sure that when you check it is equal to 360. Now having found it equal to 360 now you start drawing. So how do you draw? To draw, you need to draw a circle first. You need to draw a circle first, but using your what compass is it? After drawing, from the middle of the circle that you've drawn, you understand? Take out a straight line to a point. Is that clear? Once you have a straight line to a point, place your protractor. Let this place reach zero. Is that clear? Count the first sector. If you want to count this first, there is no problem. You understand? Put your protector and count to what? 120 is that? So once you count to 120, you name it what? Beans. You name it what? Beans. Now you check another one. If you want to count for that of rice, you understand? If rice is 50 degrees, you put your protector. Here or now will be now zero, is it? Then you count to 50 degrees. You mark it out and you name it what? Rice. Is that clear? If you want to count for, let's say, meat, and meat is 24 degrees, Put your protect again at point zero. Count to what? 24. Is that clear? Until you've counted all of them. Once you count all of them, you see that it will match with this initial place. Is that clear? So that's how you prepare your pie chart. That's how you prepare your pie chart. That's how you prepare your what? Pie chart. Number one thing is that you must construct another table that will have sectoral angles. Is that clear? And how do you find the sectoral angles? Just get the summation of the amounts. Now, pick each of the amounts over the summation times 360, which is the general uh, angle of a set. You understand? Do set for all of them to get this. You understand? Use your protector, protractor, draw a circle. Is that clear? After drawing the circle, take 
a distance from the middle to the end of the circle. Place your contractor, press your watch, contractor, and pick out the angles. Pick out the first one, 120, pick out the second one, 50, pick all of them out. As you're picking out your name in the, the charts, is that clear? So when we are doing uh, Python programming for data visualization, I will teach you how to use computer program to easily look at this and draw this pie chart. Is that clear? But this is how you do it manually. You understand? And pie chart is simply converting what you have in your tabular form to a divided circle. So that somebody will easily look at this and say, oh, this is the biggest. Is that not? Once you're looking at this, you can say that this is the biggest. Why? Because the angle that is subtracted by the uh, sector in base is the bigger, biggest one in the whole cycle, is it not? So you can also indicate this angle by saying that this is what? 120 degrees. You can also indicate the actual amount, which is what? 600. Transport, what is transport here? 52 degrees. You can also indicate the actual amount by saying that it is what? 260. Is that clear? So you can give as much information as possible in your chart. Is that clear? So this is my chart. Click on the subscribe button to subscribe to our channel so that you get similar videos whenever they drop. Like and share these our videos. Thank you. In subsequent classes, we'll be talking about histogram. Today we are going to be looking at another chart. We looked at pie chart and bar chart, is it? Today we are going to be looking at histogram. Histogram is very, very important in uh, graphical uh, visualization of data, you understand? Because it is actually the kind of graph or diagram that you use in representing frequency distributions. Is that clear? In our previous class, when we looked at on group data and group data, you understand? We normally use on either on group or group data. We normally put it in a table with frequencies. It that will calculate frequency and cumulative frequencies. It for you to represent such data in graph, it's always good you use histogram. It's always good you use histogram. Is that clear? Bar chart and pie chart they are also good. But whenever you are looking at frequency, whenever you are looking at frequency, if frequency is supposed to be what you like, number of students is a representation of frequency, is that clear? The frequency is what you are looking at, how many times something is occurring. It's always good to use a histogram, it's always good to use a, a, a what? Histogram is a graphical representation of a frequency distribution. Can you see that? Frequency what? Distribution. With rectangular bars placed side by side. The rectangular bars must be placed what? There should be no gap. Place side by side. The vertical axis represents the frequency. Can you see the vertical axis? This is the frequency. Why the horizontal axis represents the variable that is being measured? What variable are we measuring? The cost subject, is it? It can be used for group data. It can be used for what? I said that before, that huh? Here the class boundary is written as the horizontal axis. When you are using, uh, when you are plotting a group data, you use the class boundaries here. Is that clear for group data? Let's say you have 18 to 19. What will be the class boundary? You have 17.5, is it? Then uh, the other one will be 20.5, is it? Then the other one, 22.5. You understand? So you put the class boundaries here. Or you can also use the class mark. But if you are using the class mark, the middle, that's where you write back. And you are supposed to write what? 19. Then here you write what? 20, you understand? So you either use the class mark and when you're writing on the middle or you're using the boundary as the class boundary. Is that clear? That's for a group data, for a what? But the data we are looking at now is the group data. No. So, but you can use this histogram to plus for group data. Is that clear? So the previous group data we have learned, you can use the histogram. So how do you do this? Note that for group data, uh, note that there should be no gap between the bars. There should be no gap between the what? Bars. So let's look at this example. The following uh, number of students for various subjects. You understand? How many students registered for physics? Nine. How many students registered for chemistry? How many students registered for Igbo? You understand? It's showing the frequency, number of occurrence of students in 
it out to some degree, you understand? So this number of students is also known as what? It's showing us the what? The frequency. Exactly. So now, construct a histogram for the above data. What do you do first? You draw the axis. You do what? You draw the axis. Then, looking at your the values of your frequency, what do you have here? You have 16. You have 6. So you are looking at numbers from 16 to 20. So that's why you 20 is the highest here. So you just pick points 5, 10, 15, 20. Exactly. So that it can be equally shared. Now you come to the horizontal axis, give a space, you understand? Then create bars of equivalent. Then create bars of what? Equivalent. Now, for physics, which is the first one, you trace it 9. 9 is before 10, is it not? You draw. Pick the next one, chemistry, 12. 12 is just above 10. You draw, is it not? Ibo is far below, just below 5. You draw, is that? But you represent the whole of it. So once you've done that, you've done your histogram. Once you've done that, you've done what? Now look at what I said here. You can use the class boundaries, which is what I've explained. You understand? Or what class mark? Is that clear? If you're using class boundaries, it has to be at the bound boundary. That means you are going to have points. When you're using boundary, you have what points. But when you're using the class mark, there is no point. So you use the middle. Is that clear? So you can use the class boundaries or class mark as the horizontal for a group word data. As the horizontal word axis for a group word data. Data, is that clear? Frequency polygon. What is frequency polygon? Frequency polygon is when you pick out the middle of the bars with a line. Is that clear? It is a line graph for frequency. So how can you pick out the who can tell me how you can pick out the frequency polygon for this? Who can tell me how we can pick out the frequency polygon for this? So pick out the frequency polygon, you simply draw from here. Can you see here? You pick out the middle of the bars. Where is the middle of this bar? Is it here? Is it? You pick out the middle of this other bar. Can you see that? You pick out the middle of this other bar. Can you see that? You pick out the middle of this other bar. Can you see that? You pick out the middle of this other bar. Can you see that? You pick out the middle of this other bar. Can you see that? This is a frequency polygon. This is a frequency word. This is a frequency word. Then from here, you now take it down. This is a what? So if somebody tells you to draw a frequency polygon, what do you do? You have to first of all draw the histogram, is it not? Then from down, you start picking out the middles. Is that clear? You start picking out the what? Middles. Is that clear? So be able to cover the histogram and what? And what? Frequency what? Polygon. Is that clear? Please like and subscribe to our channel. Share these videos if you like it. Thank you very much. Yes, welcome. Today we're going to be looking at measurement of or measure of dispersion. We're going to be looking at measure of what dispersion. In the previous classes, we looked at measure of central tendency. Is it? And when we talk about measure of central tendency, we are looking at averages. Averages. How the various data are tending to the center. They are tending to the what? Center. That is averages. You understand? we are looking at mean, mode, and what median. But today we are going to be looking at how the various data are spread across the distribution. How the various data are what spread. The difference between the, the highest data and the lowest or the middle. You understand? We call it measure of dispersion. How the data are what dispersed. Is that clear? So under measures of dispersion, we are going to be looking at range, mean deviation. Variance and or standard deviation, those are the things we look at. So now, measurement, measure of dispersion is simply the measure of variation that occurs in a given word data. The measure of what variation, the measure of difference between the various data. Is that clear? It is concerned with the degree of spread of numerical values in a distribution. And it can be what? Range, 
mean deviation, variance or what? Standard deviation. Those are the measure of dispersion. Is that clear? Measure of central tendency are things like mean more than what? Median. Whereas measure of dispersion are things like what? Range, mean deviation, variance and standard what? Deviation. So we are going to start be starting today with range. What is range? Range is simply the difference between the maximum and the minimum what value in a data. It is the simplest measure of this person. An example is when we give a data like this and say find the range. Can you see the data? 7, 2, 16, 4, 8, 10, 45. What is the highest value here? 45. What is the minimum value? 2. What is the range? Highest minus minimum. 43. Is that clear? The same method we use in finding the range for an ungrouped data is the same we use for group data. Can you see the group data? The max are grouped in fives, is it not? 5 to 10, 10 to 15, 16 to 20, 21 to 25, 26 to what? 30. And these are their frequencies. So what is the highest mark here? 30. So the maximum is 30. What is the lowest mark here? 5. So what is the range? 30 minus 5 to 30. Is that clear? So that is a measure of dispersion. That is what? Measure of dispersion. So that is range. In subsequent classes, we'll be looking at mean deviation, variance, and what? Standard deviation. Uh, subscribe to this our channel. Like and share this our video. If you really like it. Thank you. Welcome. Today we are going to be looking at another measure of dispersion known as mean deviation. Known as what? Mean deviation. Mean deviation is simply telling us to what extent does each of the values given deviate from the mean? Is that clear? To what extent does each of the values in the data given deviate from the word mean? That means if you are giving values, you must first of all find the mean. Because if you don't know the mean, will you know to what extent the value is deviated from it? You must find the mean. You understand? Mean deviation. Mean deviation is simply telling us what, to what extent does the, that data giving us each of the entry deviate from the mean, which is the average. Is that clear? So now we say the arithmetic mean of all absolute. Mean deviation is simply the arithmetic mean of all absolute deviations. All absolute what? Deviation from the mean. Given a set of ungrouped data, x1, x2, x3 to xn, and the mean given as what? x bar. What is the mean deviation? The mean deviation is simply, you pick the first number, subtract the mean from it, is it? Because you pick the second number, subtract the mean from it. You pick the third number, subtract the mean from it, till the last number. All over what? n, which is the number of data given. Is that clear? So we are going to understand it better with this example. Example, find the mean deviation of the following weights of boxes in the store. We went to a store, we measured all the weights, and these are the values, 9, 2, 5, 6, 7, 7. What is the mean deviation? First of all, you must find the mean. Before you can now calculate how the various data deviate from the mean, is that clear? So first of all, the mean is simply what summation all over the number, is it not? 36 over 6, giving us 6. So what is now the mean deviation? You pick the first number, subtract the mean from it. Can you see that? Pick the second number minus the mean. Pick the third number minus the mean. The fourth number minus the mean. It must be absolute value to the last number. Is that clear? Absolute value, this, this absolute value simply means that even if you get minus, you should leave it as plus. Is that clear? All the numbers must be positive. Because 2 minus 6 is minus 4, but we left it as 1. Because we say that it is the arithmetic mean of all the words, absolute deviation. It has to be absolute. So when you add it up, you have 10 all over 6, giving us 1.7. So it's telling us that 1.7 is the average deviation of each of these numbers from the mean. Is that clear? Average deviation of each of these numbers from the mean. Now, if you're expected to find the Mean deviation for a group data, this is the formula that you use, summation of frequency x minus 
x bar. x bar is the mean. And you know how to find the mean of a group that already is in on You know n already, which is the number of data given, is it? So this x is the only thing you don't know. And this x, you assume it as the word class mark. You use class mark. For every group data, you always have a class mark, is it? So x is class mark. So this is the formula of the mean deviation for a group data. Frequency, you already know. So subtract the mean that you calculated using the formula for mean of a group data from the, each of the class marks. Then do frequency times what you get. Then the summation all over n gives you the mean deviation of a group data. Is that clear? Is that clear? Good. So subscribe to our channel so that you can get our videos. I like and share this video. Thank you. looking at another measure of dispersion. We are going to be looking at another measure of what? Dispersion. Variance and standard deviation. Variance and what? Standard deviation is simply the square root of variance. Is that clear? Standard deviation is simply the square root of what? Variance. So once you know the variance, you can easily know the standard deviation by simply doing the word the square root of that very variance. Is that clear? Now, variance is the arithmetic mean of the squares of the deviations of the observation from the true mean. Is that clear? The squares, can you see the squares of the deviation? Can you see the deviation? Each of the entry minus the true mean is this, this deviation. Is that clear? So when you get the squares of the deviations from the true mean, sum them up, sum them all up, all over a number of occurrences. Is that clear? So now, like, if you are giving numbers, what were the numbers we gave the last time? Nine, what? Two, five, six, seven, seven. These are the data we are giving. And you are told to find the variance. How do you find the variance? You must first of all find the true mean, find the word mean. So what is the mean? Mean is simply 9 plus 2 plus 5 plus 6 plus 7 plus another word 7 all over 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. What will it give us? What will the mean give us? Mean will be equal to what? 36 over 6 which is equal to what? 6. That is the mean. So how do we get this now? We do what? Each of the numbers, example is what? 9 minus the mean. Mean is what? 6. All square. Can you see that? All square. That's for the first one. You're getting the sum. So plus the second number, 2 minus what? 6. All what? Square. Plus the third number, 5 minus what? 6. All square. Plus the other number, 6 minus 6. All square. Plus what? 7 minus e is all square. 7 minus e is all square. Is that clear? All over what? 6. That is the variance. Is that clear? So what do you get? 9 minus 6 is what? 3 squared plus what? 4 squared plus what? 1 squared plus what? 0 squared plus what? 7 minus 6. 1 squared plus what? 7 minus 6. 1 squared. All over 6. Is that? So what will be our 3 squared, 9 plus 4 squared, 8 plus 1 plus 0 plus 1 plus 1. 9 plus 8, 17. Is it? 17 plus 1, 18 plus 1, 19 plus 1, 20. We have 20 over what? 6. So 20 over what? 6 is what? Standard deviation is the root of. Can you see the standard deviation? Yes. 
Can you see that it is just the root of this? For a group that are the, the formula is still the same, is that only that you must introduce frequency because it's now group that I did all over. Summation of frequency. The X here is what? X here is what? Class mine. Is that? So you can do this for both groups and group data. So this is for group on group data, whereas this is for what? Group data. For you to do this for group data, you must first of all do the frequency tab. You must first of all do the what? Frequency tab. So if you are minus and subtracting, you have to subtract the mean from the what? From the class max. From the what? How do you get the mean? I've already given you the formula for getting the mean of group data before, is it? So you get it first, then use this formula and find your variance and standard deviation. Is that clear? So what is variance? Variance is simply the arithmetic mean of the squares of the deviation of the observation from the true mean. So you must first of all get the true mean, then know how to deviate. You understand? It tells you the measure of dispersion, how the various uh, how the various uh, how the various uh, entries are far from the mean. You can see here now that the standard deviation here is 1.8. What is the mean deviation that we got from the last class? Around 1.71. See that this one is closer to 2. And you can see that the variance is 3. Can you see that? So if you are checking the difference between any of these from the mean, what's the difference between 9 from the mean? Is it not 3? So it's closer. The difference between these two from the mean, 6 minus 1 is 4. Very close to this. The difference between this from the mean is just one. It's one squared is one. You understand? So this is an average of average telling you what is the variation of this very entry from the average which is the mean. Is that clear? So that's what measure of this person is telling us. So first of all, very importantly, you can see that this is almost the same as the mean deviation, except that you are squaring, except that you are squaring. For mean dimension, you just collect the absolute value, is it? This one, you have squared. Is that? And the difference between this variance and standard deviation is just that you do what? You find the square root. Is that clear? So that is measure of the uh, dispersion from you for you. We looked at range for us, is it not? After range, we looked at mean deviation. After mean deviation, we looked at standard deviation. I would say that mean deviation will take the absolute value of the deviation. Whereas for standard deviation, you take the square of the deviation. Whereas standard deviation is just the square root of the variance. Is that clear? So please, if you like this video, click on the subscribe button to subscribe. Share it, like it, and if you have any questions, put it on the comment section. Thank you. Did any of you try the last one? Hello, welcome. Today we are going to be looking at probability. Today we are going to be looking at what? Probability. And what is probability? Probability simply means the likelihood of an event occurring. It simply means what? The likelihood of an event occurring. How sure are you that some this thing will happen? If you are coming to this class, on Monday you came, there's, there was a teacher teaching you. Hmm? On Tuesday you came, there was a teacher. On Wednesday you came, there was a teacher. On Thursday you came, there was a teacher. On Friday you came, there was a teacher. Is that clear? If they now ask you, what is the likelihood that when you go to school today, what is the probability of your meeting a teacher in the class when you go to school on Monday? What will you say? You say that the probability is high or the probability is one because you're certainly sure that a teacher will come because a teacher have always come, is it? If they ask you what is the probability of a teacher not coming to the class, you say it's not likely that a teacher will not come, that you're expecting a teacher to come. Is that? So probability is actually the measure of the expected outcome, all over the total outcome. Is that clear? That's what it is. And probability can be measured from 1 to 0. Can be measured from what? If it is certain that an event will occur, the probability of that event happening is 1. That's the numerical value, is that clear? 
And if it is not certain, if, it, if that event will not happen at all, the probability is zero. Is that clear? And numerically, for you to calculate probability, you simply say the required outcome. If you're checking for what is the likelihood of a teacher coming to school, you count the number of times in a week that the teacher has come, all over the total number of times that it's possible for the teacher to either come or not come. Is that clear? So if the teacher came in every uh, five of the five days, it's going to be five over five, is it not? Which is one, and which is that certainly the teacher is going to come. But if the teacher missed one day, what is the probability of him coming on the Monday of the other week? It will be four over one, is it not? And the probability of him not coming will be one over four, one over five. Understand? Probability of him coming will be four over five, whereas probability of him not coming will be one over what? Five. Is that clear? So we look at this. Probability is the measure of the likelihood that an event will do what? Occur. It is a measure of the results or outcomes of expectations in numerical what? Form. You understand? We put probability in numerical form of zero to what? One. The number to be assigned stands between zero to what? One. When the probability is zero, it means that the event will not do what happen. While when the probability is one, it means that the event will certainly what happen. So now we look at the first style of probability, known as experimental what probability. Probability that you count from what you already see, what you can count, what you can measure. Is that clear? From the number of experiments you can try. And this probability is given as number of required outcomes, all over number of possible what outcomes. So, you look at the question they ask you, what is the one that is required? You put it on top, is that clear? Then possible outcome, which is possible outcome, which is the total, you put it below, you understand? When you divide, you get your probability, is that clear? So, look at this question. Out of 500 mangoes, what is the total mangoes? 500. So, you can say that all the possible outcome is what? 500, that will be down, is that clear? Out of 500 mangoes, it is found that from experience that 25 will be bad. That how many will be bad? So if somebody asks you what is the probability of bad, what will it tell the person? It will be just 25 over what? 500, which will give us what? 0 0.05. That's the probability that a mango that you pick will be bad. Is that clear? But now they say, out of the 500 mango bought in the market, it is found that from experience that 25 will be bad. What is the probability of the mango being what? Good. The one being, being good, what will be the answer now? It's going to be instead of 25, what will be the remaining? Since five, 25 is bad, how many will be good? 500 minus 25, is it not? So that's what we have here. We say, since the total based on experience is 500, out of these 25, we are expected to be what? Bad. Therefore, the expected number of good mangoes will be what? 500 minus what? 25. Is that clear? So that you cannot say that probability of good mango will not be. Total of good mango is what? 475. All over total of possible mangoes that we have. 500. It will give us what? 0 0.95. Can you see that? So this is the probability of good mango, whereas this is the probability of what? Bad mango. And we say that probability must be the total probability of good and bad. If you add it, it must equal to what? 1. Is that clear? Your probability ranges from 0 to what? 1. So which of this is likely to happen? Is it likely that the mango you pick will be good or bad? Which one? It will be what? Good. Because in a total of 500 mango, you have 475 good and you have only what? 25 bad. So if you pick at random, it's likely that you have more to be good. Is it not? And that's why the probability of good is what? 0.95. Can you see that? So it's likely that any mango you pick will be what good because this is approximately one. This is 0 0.95. Is that clear? But if you add the probability of the two opposite events happening, it must equate to one. Is that clear? So understand this that whenever you are expected to calculate probability, you must say the required outcome. Is that clear? All over the one that you are doing what? All over the total possible outcome. So let me ask you this. Let's do this.
I entered a class. Is that clear? Are you listening to me? I entered a class. And there are 50 people in the class. There are how many people in the class? How many people? 50 people. Out of the 50 people, how many uh out of the 50 people, 30 people are girls. Or let's say uh, out of the 50 people, 40 are girls, and the boys are what? 10. Can you see that? Now tell me what is the probability of the, me seeing a what is the probability of me seeing a girl once I enter the class? Who can tell me what's the probability of me seeing a girl once I enter the class? 40 over what? 50, is it? Why is it 40 over 50? Because the required icon, the one I require to see is what girls, is it not? Yes. And girls is how many? 40. And what is the possible, no, all of them, possible outcome? 50. Is it not? Yes. Which is the people. So if I multiply, if I divide through our word, 5 over what? 4. Is it? Yes. This is the probability of me seeing a word here. Yes. So what is the probability of me seeing a boy? 10 over what? 50. Is that? So if I divide our half what? 1 over what? 5. And you can see that this is, uh, no, this is 4 over what? 5. Is it not? So you can see that if you add up the two probability, you have 4 over 5 plus what? 1 over 5, which is what? 1. Because it will be 5 over 5. You see that? So this is how you do it. The one that you are expecting all over the total possible outcome. Is that clear? Is that clear? So which one is more probable that I see whenever I enter the class? Which one? Is it girls or boys? Is it a boy or a girl? That is likely that I see when I enter this class. A girl. Why, why is it a girl? Friends, it's 4 over 5 will give us what? 0 point 0.8. 1 over 5 will give us what? 0 point what? 2. So this one has higher probability, is it not? Because it's closer to 1. So it's likely that I see a girl whenever I enter this class. You understand? And it's less likely that I see a word for Is that clear? So that is what probability is. You understand? Required outcome. Number of what? Required outcome. All over number of what? Possible outcome. Is that clear? So take note of this. Please click on the subscribe button to subscribe to our channel, like and share this our video. Thank you. See you in subsequent classes where I will be treating more problems on this. Thank you. Hello, welcome. Today we're going to be looking at an example of probability, experimental probability. Example of what? Okay. Experimental probability in tabular form. Is that clear? Yes. And we have example two. This table below, this very table, shows the marks scored by a number of students in a physics test. In a, in a what? Physics, physics test. And the, it's telling us that 11 students scored how many percent? 30 percent. 8 students scored how many? 40 percent. 4 students scored how many? 50%, 5 students scored how many? 60%, and 12, 2 students scored how many? 80%. So from this, how many students in total part, took, played, took part in the physics test? You can see that it is what? 11 plus 8 plus what? 4 plus 5 plus 2. Is that clear? And the number one question says, how many students are there? Is that clear? So you say total number of students is simply 11 plus 8 plus 4 plus 5 plus 2, which is what? 30. So the number of students is equal to what? 30. Is that clear? Yes, sir. The second question says, what is the probability that the people, that a people chosen at random from the class will score 40%? We already know that the total is what? 30. So the denominator for all this will be what? 30 for the probabilities, is it? So we say now, probability of a student scoring what? 40% will be. You go here and check. How many students scored 40%? 8. So the probability will be what? 8 over what? 30. Number of students that scored 40 over total number of students. 
and 8 over 30 gives you what, 0 0.26 or 4.15. Number 2 says, what is the probability of a people choosing at random from the class will score above 50? This is 50, is it? Are you saying 50? Yeah. So above 50 is 60 and 8, is it not? Yeah. So what are the number of students that scored 60 and 8, which is above 50? Five. 5 plus what? 2. So we now say what? The probability will be what? 5 plus 2 over 50, which is 7 over what? 30. 5 plus 2 over 30, giving us this. Is that? Now we say, what is the probability that a people choosing at random from the class will score below 60? This is 60, is it? So below 60 is from here, is it not? Yeah. So how many students scored below 60? 11 plus 4 plus, 11 plus 8 plus 4, is it? Yeah. 11 plus 8 plus 4, giving us 23 over what? 30 or 0 0.76, is that? Yeah. Now we'll come to another type of question that says, what is the probability that a student chosen at random from, will pass the test if the pass mark or pass score is 50? It means that once you get from 50 and above, that you pass for this condition, is it? For this one will be once you get from 40 and above. And for this one, once you get from 70 and above. So let's check this one that is pass mark is 50. Once you get from 50 and what? Above. above is it? And that will be 4 plus 5 plus 2, is it? Yes. So we have 4 plus 5 plus 2 over 10, which will give us 11 over 10, which is 0 0.3, is it? Yes. Now, for pass mark of 40 will be people that score from 40 and above, which is 8 plus 4 plus 5 plus 2. 8 plus 4 plus 5 plus 2, giving us 19 over 30, which is what? 0 0.6. Now, what of for people that scored 70? It will be how many? 2 over what? 30. So give us what? 0.6. You understand? But you have to check. Make sure that. At any point you ask that it falls uh, within what is already given. Exactly. Yeah. So that's where we're going to start. Number one thing is that you must find out the number of total outcomes, is it? Yeah. Which in this case is the number of total students. Mm -hmm. Then, depending on these conditions, you'll be picking out the numbers of required outcome. That you'll be doing required outcome over what possible outcome. Number of students that scored something all over total number of what students. Yeah. The same formula uses the calculating for all of them. Exactly. Yes. Please click on the subscribe button to subscribe and I'll turn the like and share this video. Thank you. Yes, welcome. Today we are going to be looking at theoretical probability. We are going to be looking at what? Theoretical probability. In the last time, our probability was all about experimental trial is it not we went into the class we counted the number of people that had over 60 percent in a math test is it not or we opened a bar we counted the number of balls that are good and the ones that are bad isn't it in theoretical probability we have objects that we know the physical state we know the what physical state like a coin every coin has a head or a what cell every coin has what Head or a tail. The head is where you see the face of uh, Tafawa Belewa or Amubaka or anybody. The tail is where you have the coat of Nigeria coat of arm. Um, isn't it? Head or tail. Now, every dice, do you know the one they call dice? That you use in playing Ludo, is it not? Every dice has how many sides? Six. You have the side that has one, the one that has two, the one that has three to six, isn't it? So your probability calculation is based on the state, it's based on the physical state of the object. It's based on the what? Good. So for such, we are going to give an example. Three coins are thrown together to find, three coins are thrown what? Together. Find the probability of two heads and one tail. Two heads and what? Three heads and two tails and one head. Is, is that clear? So, for a coin, we already know that every coin has head and what? Tail. Head and what? So, the maximum outcome that you have for a throwing of only one coin will be what? Head and tail, which is two. For throwing two coins, you will have another head and tail and another head and tail, isn't it? Making the outcomes to be what? Four. But for now, we are having how many?
coins three. So we are going to still have another head and tail, head and tail, head and tail, head and tail, following from the ones that you've drawn before, making the maximum outcome to be what eight. Is that clear? So how do you do it? Depending on the number of coins that you are told, you will now start. The first coin is going to have head and tail, isn't it? From this first coin, because you have another coin, it's going to have another head and tail, isn't it? And this one is going to have head and tail too. But if you have another coin, making it three, you still draw again, head and tail, head and tail, head and tail, for each of them that you've drawn before, is that clear? Then when you finish, you pick it out. You're picking for this man now, you're picking for which man? This very one. So you trace it back, you're having what? Head, head, tail. Head, 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 isn't it? Head, head, head. For this person, you trace it back, you're having head, head, tail, isn't it? For this person, you trace it, you have head, tail, head, isn't it? Head, tail, head. For this person, you trace it, head, tail, tail, isn't it? For this person, you trace it, head, tail, head, head, isn't it? Down like that. Is that clear? So if you're asked now, what is the total possible out outcome? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Can you see it? From this, there are eight words possible outcome. Is it? Yes. So what is the probability of finding two heads? You come and take the ones that have two heads. This is two head one, this is two head two, and this is two head three. So it's going to be what three over what eight. Probability of finding three heads. What are the ones that have three heads? Only this one, isn't it? So the probability will be what? One over what? Eight. Probability of having two tails and one head. Then we have two tails. This is two tails and one head. One, two tails and one head. Two, two tails and one head. Three. So it's going to be what? Three over eight. Is that clear? So it's as simple as that. And now we're going to take out another example. And the example says a bag contains two black balls, three red balls, and six what? White balls. A ball is picked from at random from the bag. What is the probability of it being black, being red, being white, not red, not black? What is the total possible outcomes for this? It's going to be what? Two plus three plus six balls. Giving us what? Eleven balls. So if you are told to calculate the probability of getting a black, it will come and check how many black do we have? Two. It's going to be two over what? Eleven. The probability of getting a red is going to be 3 over what? 11. The probability of getting a white is going to be what? 6 over what? 11. Probability of getting not red will be the one that are not red are what? Black and white, which is what? 2 plus 6 all over 11, 8 over 11. And the probability of getting not black will be, we'll take the ones that are not black, 3 and 6 all over 11. The back left. Note that the probability of not red is also the same thing as saying 1 minus the probability of red. Is that clear? And the probability of not black is also 1 minus the probability of black. Are we together on that? So we can simply solve the number 2 question. We can simply do what? Solve the number 2 word question. So how are we going to solve it? How are we going to solve it? We are going to simply say that the probability of getting what? Black, is it? Is equal to what? The total number of black, which is what? Two, all over the total possible black, of which is what? Eleven. Probability of getting red is the total number of red, which is what? Three, all over the possible black. Probability of getting white is the total number of white, which is what? Six, all over the possible black. Probability of getting not red will be equal to what? One minus probability of getting red. And probability of getting not black is also equal to what? 1 minus probability of getting what? Black. You solve down. Is that? Or you can say it's equal to the other probabilities. Probability of not red. Not red is what? 6 and 2. You have 6 plus 2 over 11. Is it? Or you can also say that this one is also not black. The ones that are not black is 3 and 6. But 3 plus 6 over 11. So that you can simply give us 8 over what? 11 and what? 9 over what? 11. This will also give us, when we do 1 minus 3 over 11, it will still give us 8 over 11. And when we do 1 minus 2 over 11, it will still give us 9 over 11. Is that clear? Please, if you like this lecture, click on the subscribe button, share these our videos. Thank you.
Hello, welcome. Today we are going to be taking another example on theoretical probability. Another example of what theoretical probability. We always say that the objects we are considering only already have a physical nature, isn't it? So, what object are we considering in this example? A dice. A what? Dice. And we know that dice has how many sides? Six sides. Dice has how many sides? Six sides. Each of the sides has different numbers on them, isn't it? Different numbers of dots on it. One has one, the other one has two, the other one has three, the other one four, the other one five, and the other one what? Six. Exactly. So it has a specific physical nature. You understand? And now we say that two fair dies, two, not one. If it is one that is true, the possible outcome can only be six, isn't it? But this time around is how many? Two. So that means you have to say one to six here and say another one to six here. Is that clear? Two fair dies are thrown. What is the probability of getting the word sum of nine? What is the probability of getting two odd numbers? What is the probability of getting two prime numbers? And what is the probability of getting two factors of what? Twelve. Once you hear two fair die, you have to put it in a table. You have to put it in a what? Then on the table, leave one box black like this. Are you saying this? Then you start writing one to six, one to what? Six. One to another what? Six. Is that clear? Then cross the lines. Then do what? Cross the lines. Is that clear? Now, to get the, what is inside each of the boxes, it's always good that you draw the first die with big letters. Is that clear? And draw the second die with what? Small letters. That's why I say, since there are two dice, each of them with numbers 1 to 6, make a table with smaller and bigger numbers to differentiate the two word dice. Is that clear? So that's how I got this. Is that? This is for the first die and this is for the word second die. So to get the possibility of any of this coming out, you have to take this, the row first before the column, the row before the word. These are the rows and these are the word columns. Is that clear? So row one is small one and column one is big one. Can you see that? For this one, you have also small one, big two. Is that small one, big three, small one, big four, small one, big five, small one, big six. Is that for this one too? Small two, big one, small two, big two, small two, big three, small two, big four. You understand? Just the same way here too. Small six, big one, small six, big two, small six, big three. Is that clear? Until you draw all of them. So once you are done drawing, you have to use a what? You have to use a tick line to show that this is the one you use to draw it. You understand? And these are the outcomes that you get. Got. Is that clear? So you count the number of possible outcomes. What is the number of possible outcomes? From this tick line, which was the tie that you actually drew, you got this outcome. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, 32, 33, 34, 35, 36. 36. How many? 36. Another way of finding it is to simply say 6 squared. Or say 6 times 6, 36. They understand. Now, once you've done this, you can now start doing this. Once you know that the total possible outcome is what 36, you can now start solving the probability. Number one says, what is the probability of you getting the sum of 9? Is that clear? You come and check this number. What is the, what is the 2 of 2 that when you add it, it will give you 9? 1 plus 1, can it be 9? 1 plus 2, can it be 9? 1 plus 3, can it be 9? 1 plus 4, 1 plus 5, 1 plus 6, all these ones cannot be 9. But when you're checking, when you get here, 2 plus 6, can it be 9? No. You start continuing. But 3 plus 6, can it be 9? Yes. So you count 1. You check again. 4 plus 5, can it be 9? You count 2. 5 plus 4, can it be 9? You count 3. 6 plus 3, can it be 9? You count 4. So the probability is what? Over what? Let's see. Exactly. Two odd numbers. Two odd numbers. Odd numbers are numbers 
that are not divisible by two, isn't it? So you start two, are these still two odd numbers? Yes. So you have one. Are these still two odd numbers? No. Are these still two odd numbers? Yes. One, two, three, four. No, no, here, ma. We have three here, ma. Four. Is it? This one, five, ma. Is it? Six. Is it? Is it? Not here. Seven. Is it? Eight. Is it? Which one again? Five and one. Okay, here. Nine. Is it? So we have 9 over 1, text 6. Is that clear? Always know that in a line like where you have an odd number, you have a even number row, there's no like you, like here there will never be two odd number, here there will never be two odd number, here there will never be two odd number. Is that? Now, two prime numbers. What are prime numbers? Prime numbers are numbers that can only be divided by 1 and itself. You understand? Numbers that can only be divided by 1. One and itself. So, which one has two prime numbers? This can be divided by one and itself. Huh? One, two, is it? Three. Is it? So, we continue counting. How many are you going to get? One, two, three. Which one again? Two prime numbers. That can be divided by only one and itself. This one has four, is it? Five, is it? Six, is it? One here, ma. Seven, is it? Eight, is it? Nine. So you're giving us nine over what? Yes, six, is it? Now, two factors of twelve, is it? So factors of twelve are what? They are numbers that 12 will be divided by with no remainder, excluding one and what? 12. That, so when you count it, you will find out that you have. Uh, who are those numbers? Two factors of 12. This one factors of 12. You say excluding one part. So yes, we have this. Okay, it's here, ma. So what are we going to, what are we supposed to have? Count it. Let me see how you got this. Which one is one? Uh, two and two. Uh, Where is it? two and two? Mm -hmm. Two and four. Two and three. Two and six. Where is it? Three and two. Three and three.
can hear you. We're going to be looking at what? Mutually exclusive probabilities. I'll call it addition probability. We'll call it what? We're going to be looking at probability of mutually exclusive events or addition probability. Exactly. Now, what do you understand by mutually exclusive events? Mutually exclusive events are those events that cannot happen at the same time. Those events that cannot do what? They are called mutually exclusive events. Is that clear? When you throw up a coin, can you see the head and the tail at the same time? It's either you're seeing the head and you have to throw the coin again and maybe you see the tail. Is it not? You cannot see the two at the same time. So the probability of seeing the head and the tail at the same time, you cannot be seeing the two of them at the same time. Is that clear? So if you want to calculate the probability of seeing the head or the tail, you cannot either see or not together. Be. So the probability of seeing the head or the tail is the probability of seeing the head plus the probability of seeing the tail. Is that clear? That's why it is called addition probability. You have to add the two probabilities. Since two of them cannot happen the same time. Is that clear? Who can give me an example of mutually exclusive event that you do in your life? Do you know what it means to whiz with the mouth? Can you be whizzing with the mouth and at the same time be blowing your nose? Can you do both things together? You cannot. And because you can always with your mouth and blow it with your nose at the same time, you say that those two events are mutually what? Exclusive. They are mutually exclusive events. So what is the probability of wheezing with your mouth and at the same time blowing your nose? Or wheezing with your mouth or blowing your nose? It has to be the probability of wheezing plus the probability of blowing your nose. Is that clear? You have to add the two. Whenever the two of them cannot happen at the same time. You understand? So you say it can either be this or this. You have to use that word or not and. Is that clear? Wheezing with your mouth or blowing your nose. So their probabilities is probability of wheezing plus the probability of blowing with your nose. Is that clear? So that's what we're going to be having here. So when we say mutually exclusive events or additional probabilities, this is the probability of events that cannot happen at the same time, e.g., you cannot wish with your mouth and at the same time blow your nose. Therefore, you add the two probabilities. That is why it is called additional probability. Is that clear? Very clear. Example, when you throw a fair die, can you see any sides together? You can only see one side. If you are seeing a one, you cannot be seeing two, three, another one. If you are seeing a two, you cannot see one, three, another one. Is that clear? So, it's an example of mutually exclusive event because you cannot be seeing a 3 and at the same time a 6. Is that clear? So, now, if a guy is toast once, what is the probability of scoring a 3 or 6? Are you seeing it? Probability of scoring 3 or 6 has to be the probability of scoring 3 plus the probability of scoring 6, isn't it? What is the total possible answer for whenever a die is, is thrown? Six. So probability of getting three, because we can only see one face with three, is one, one over six, isn't it? And that of getting a six is also one over six. So the total probability will give us two over six, which is one over three. Is that clear? The same thing, what is the probability of getting a four or a five? It's going to be the probability of getting a four plus the probability of getting a five, isn't it? Which is one over six plus one over six, which will also give us two over six, which is one over three. Now, what is the probability of getting neither 6 nor 1? You understand? It's telling you not 6 nor 1. That means you pick the rest. Apart from 6 and 1, what do you have? Probability of 2, 3, 4, and 5, isn't it? So, add up the probabilities. It's going to give us 1 over 6 plus 1 over 6 plus 1 over 6 plus 1 over 6. Giving us 4 over 6, which is equal to 2 over 3, isn't it? Another way of getting the probability of neither 6 nor 1 is by saying the probability 1 minus the probability of 6 or 1. And you know probability of 6 or 1, you know it's uh, one, 1 over 6 plus 1 over 6. So 1 minus 8 will give us 4 over 6. This is 2 over 3. Now the number 2 example says a bag contains 6 red balls, 6 yellow balls, and 4 white balls. 
a ball is picked from the bag at random, find the probability that the ball is red or white. What's going to be the total outcome? Total outcome is the number of the balls involved, isn't it? Which is 5 plus 6 plus 4, which is what? 15 balls. So what is the probability of red or white? It's going to be probability when you pick a ball. A ball cannot have two colors at the same time, isn't it? So you have all. So you're going to have red or white is going to be probability of red plus probability of white. Probability of red is what? 5 over 15, isn't it? And probability of white is what? 4 white over 15, giving us 3 over what? 5. So who can tell me the probability of red or yellow? Probability of red or yellow is going to be what? Yellow is how many? 6. 6 over 15, isn't it? Plus probability of red, red, uh, and it's going to be probability of red is what? 5. 5 over 15. So we're going to have 6 over 15 plus 5 over 15, giving us what? 11 over 15. What of the other one, yellow or red, is going to be yellow is what? 6 over 15. And red is what? 5 over 15. 6 over 15 plus 5 over 15 will give us what? The same 11 over 15, is it? Now, what is the probability of not red? Probability of not red is simply the probability of red minus 1 minus the probability of red. And what is the probability of red? 5 over 15, isn't it? So 1 minus 5 over 15 will give us the probability of red. Very simple. Or we say the probability of yellow or white, which is 6 over 15 plus 4 over 15, isn't it? Isn't it? Yeah. So let's do it. Are we going to do it? Can you show me how we got the other ones? Let's do B. B is what? B is probability of what? Yellow or red. So what is it going to be? What is the probability of yellow? Yellow is 6 over 15, is it? What is the probability of red? This red 5 over total, giving us what? 11 over what? 15. Then C is what? Probability of what? Not red. So which ones are not red here? You have yellow. Is it? 6 over 15. Which other one is not red? White. 4 over 15. This will give us what? 10 over what? 15. Which is? 5 can go over 2 over 3. Now, D is what? Neither red nor yellow. D is what? Neither red nor yellow. So which ones are not red nor yellow? It's only what? White. So it's going to be 4 over what? 15. And that's the end of the class, isn't it? So that's how you solve it. Mutually exclusive events are events that cannot both happen at the same time. And we call it addition or probability because if you are checking the two of them, you have to add up the two probabilities. Is that clear? Please click on the subscribe button to subscribe, like, and share our videos. Thank you so much. Yes, welcome. Today we are going to be looking at uh, independent events. In the, last, in the previous class, we talked about mutually exclusive events. Events that cannot happen at the same time. That two events that cannot happen at the same time, we call it mutually exclusive events. But events that can happen at the same time, we call it independent events. Exactly. So the probability of having two events that can happen at the same time is just by getting by multiplying the individual probabilities together. See? Unlike that for mutually exclusive, where you have to add the individual probabilities together. Exactly. So this prob this is the probability of two events that can happen at the same time. Example: clapping your hands and singing. Can you be clapping your hands and be singing? That's what is done in the church, is it not? You go to the church, you'll be clapping and you'll be singing, isn't it? So clapping and singing are two independent events. They are independent of each other. You can 
okay, do, doing this one cannot stop you from doing this one. Is that clear? So it meant that doing one will not stop you from doing the other. They are known as independent events. You understand? When you are above the age of 18 or 21, they say you're, you cannot be even dependent on your parents. You understand? If your parents are doing their thing, you are able to be your own independent. You understand? Things two of them can go on at the same time. So, independent. Okay? Now, the probability of such events are multiplied. They are done what? Multiply, and that is why it is called pro pro multiplication word probability. Let's take an example of two things that can happen together. Example, two dice are thrown once. What is the probability of getting two six? If you turn two dice, you notice know what dice is. They have six parts, isn't it? Six parts. Is it possible for you to see a two on this one and at the same time see a two on this one? Yes, it's possible. You understand? So, what is the probability of getting two six? You, for you to see a six on this die and also see a six on this die. It's going to be probability of seeing a six on this die, which is one over six, isn't it? Times probability of seeing a six on this one, which is one over six as well, is it? So that's why we have one over six times one over six, which is what? One over 36. Is that clear? Is that clear? Now, what is the probability of getting two prime numbers? What is the probability of getting two prime numbers? What is the probability of getting prime number in one? You know, how many prime numbers are in, 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 in the dice? Between one and six is three. Is it not? So the probability of getting prime number in one is three over six. Is it not? So what is the probability of getting prime number in the other one? Still three over six because there are three prime numbers in one dice. Is it not? So it's three over six. So we're going to have three over six times three over six. Three over six times three over six. Give it us nine over six. Now, what is the probability of getting one or one evil? One or one evil, is it? What is the probability of getting one or and one evil in one? What is the probability of getting one or and one evil in one? One or is going to be three over six, is it not? And one evil is also going to be what? Three over six. So it's going to be what? 3 over 6 times 3 over 6. You understand? Then on the other one, the probability of getting one odd and one even is also going to be 3 over 6 times 3 over 6. Is that clear? And you know that you can be having 3 over 6 in 1. I mean, 1 or 1 even in 1. Look at how I made the statement. Either odd on the first die even on the second die. Is that clear? Or you have even on the first die, or on the second die. Can you see that? Can you see that? So it's either you have either odd on the first die and even on the second die. Odd on the first die is 3 over 6, isn't it? Even on the first die is 3 over 6, so you multiply the 2. Or you add. Or you do what? Add. This is add. This is AND. Whenever you have AND, it's going to be what? Multiplication, right? Good. Or you have even in the first die, or odd in, and odd in the second die. You have this. So it's either you have in this situation or this situation. So you have to add up when you finish multiplying. So you have 9 over 36 plus 9 over 36. Give it us 18 over 36, which is 1 over 2. You understand? So this is the... This is what they say. What is the probability of having one odd, one even? The possible things you can have is that in the first die you can have that either odd on the first die, even on the second die. That's what you can have. I on odd, odd on the first die, even on the second die. Their probability is this. Or you can have even on the first die, odd on the second die. This is their probability, 3 over 6 times 3 over 6. So if you have 3 over 6 times 3 over 6, it's going to give you 9 over 6. 3 over 6 times 3 over 6 is going to give you another 9 over 6. 9 over 6 plus 9 over 6 is going to be 18 over 6, which is the same thing as 1 over 2. Is that clear? Please, if you like this video, click on the subscribe button, like and share our videos. Thank you for your from the next class.
Hello, welcome. Today we are going to be looking at number system. Number system is how we do our counting. How we do our what? Counting. Normally in the world, we count in base 10. We count in base what? Base 10. Or we call it decimal or denary. Is that clear? Yes, sir. And this counting involves numbers from 0 to 9. Zero to what? Nine. You find out that every number you're writing in this word is always from zero to nine. Is it not? Yes, sir. Why? Because we are always counting in base what? Ten. If you want to write five hundred and sixty-eight naira, five sixty-eight. Is it not? Yes. This four, can you find it in base ten number? Yes. yes. sir. This six, can you find it? Yes, sir. This eight, can you find it? Yes, sir. Because we are counting in base what? Ten. 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 Is that clear? Yes, sir. If you are doing computing and other areas of life, you can be counting in base 2. You understand? Yes. Like the basic computer based machine language sees numbers in base 2. And base 2 numbers are only 0 and what? 1. one. Only 0 and what? 1. Base 2. Binary. Only 0 and what? 1. Is that clear? Yes, sir. So your essence of learning base number is to be able to either work in base 10, which is the normal way of working. Or work in any of these other bases, base 9, 8, 7, 6, 4, or any base. Is that clear? Yes. And like I told you, in computing, they normally use base words, in programming, base words, 2. Because they are seeing functions of mainly zeros and what? 1. Wow. So if you have such number as this, 1, 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1. This number is in base what? 2. Base what? 2. two. two. Because it's, compo it's comp comprising of only what? Zeros and what? One. Is that clear? If we have two here, what base will this be? Three. It will now be from base what? Three. Three upwards. Is that clear? Yes. This number can be in base three upwards because when you look at base three, base three is having zero, one, and two. You understand? And it can also be found in base four. So it can occur in any of these bases. But if this one can never be base two, you can never call this one base two. Is it not? Yes, Why? Why can't you call it base 2? Because of the presence of so, 2. Sure. You understand? Yes. For it to be a base 2 number, it has to be only zeros and what? 1. one. Is that clear? Yes, sir. So you should be able to appreciate numbers in every base. What uh, base can this number contain be in? Base 8. Base 8, huh? Yes. Why can it be in base 8? Yes, because base 8, you can see base 8 has numbers 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. So all these things are contained. So it can be in base 8. It can also be in base what? 9. 9. And it can also be in base what? 10. 10. Or can it be in base 4? No. no. Because in base 4 is only comprising of 0, 1, 2, and what? 3. 3. But this one is having 4 and above. Is that clear? Yes, sir. So any number in base 10. Can only can have such numbers as this. Is that clear? Yes. Number in base nine will not have nine. Is that clear? Yes. It will only have up to what eight. eight. Number in base ten will only have up to what nine. Yes. From zero. Is that clear? Yes. Number in base seven can only have from zero to what six eight. without seven. Is that clear? Yes. So every number of any base, the highest number will be the base minus one. Is that clear? For 10, the highest number is what? 9, which is 10 minus 1. For 9, the highest number is what? 8, eight which is nine, 9 minus 1. For 8, the highest number is what? 7, seven which is what? 8 minus 1. Like that. Okay. Which base did I miss here? 5. 5. So if I put now base 5, I want you to tell me the components of things that can be contained with, right? Give me the number 1 is what? 0, zero. 1, zero. 2, three. 3. Four. Oh, that's all. That's all, huh? yes, There's sir. no five. Because the highest number has to be five minus one, which is what? Four. four. Is that clear? Yes, sir. So this number, two, three, four, can be a number in base what? Five. Five. Five, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. Isn't it? It can be a number in base five. It can also be a number in base what? Six. Six. And also what? Seven. And also what? Eight. Eight. And also what? Nine. Nine. And also what? Ten. Is that clear? Yes, sir. So, that is what we call base number. That is what we call what? That is what we call what? Number. Base number. Now, base number is a system of counting in which certain units make up a what? Bundle. 
the bundle forms the next place value. Generally, counting is done in base what? 10, yeah. known as decimal or what? Denary. Yeah. The highest digit of any number base is 1 less than the base. The highest digit in this number base is what? 9, because it is actually 10 minus what? 1, which is what? 1 less than the base. Is that clear? And the various base numbers has these numbers in them. Is that clear? Yes, sir. Now, you are going to be learning how to convert from one base to the other. From one what? Base to the other. Very, very important. You need to know how to convert from one base to, to the, the other. other. And we are going to be starting with converting conversion from one base to another and we're going to be starting with converting or conversion from base 10 to another base is that clear yes. that is what we are going to be starting with converting from base 10 to another base converting from base 10 to what and we are going to be demonstrating it using an what? Example. Using an example. We are going to be using an example to demonstrate this. Write that on the board. So let's convert 1, 2, 4, base 10 to a number in base 8. Convert 1, 2, 4, base 10 to a number in what? Base 8. That is what we are going to be using to illustrate this. And how do we do that? We do this by doing what we call continuous division. Doing what we call what? Continuous division. We write the number we want to convert from base 10. You understand? The number in base 10 that we want to convert then we'll write the base that we are going to be converting to. Is that clear? Yes. So we we'll keep dividing and finding the remainders. We we'll keep dividing and finding the word remainders. Then the remainder that we'll find, we'll take them off from behind, and that will be the answer. So let's say 1, 2, 4 divided by 8 is what? Press your calculator or anything. 1, 2, 4 divided by 8 will give us what? 13 remainder. It will give us 15 remainder. Four. four. Is that clear? Mm -hmm. One, two, four divided by eight will give us what? Fifteen mm -hmm. remainder mm -hmm. four. Now, fifteen divided by eight will give us what? One remainder seven. One, one remainder what? Seven. Seven. That's what it will give us. One, one remainder seven. Mm -hmm. Now, one divided by eight will give us what? Zero remainder one. Zero, zero remainder what? One. one. And the answer becomes the remainder is taken up, so it will be, uh, so we can now say that one two four base ten is equal to. Can you see the remainders? One, seven, Take them off from behind. One seven four base what? Ten. Eight. Base eight. Sorry. Is that clear? Yes. That is how you do it. Is that clear? Yes, sir. That is how you do it. We are going to take another example. Four three seven base ten to base five. We are going to convert what? Convert 437 four, base 10 to a number in base 5. five. Is that clear? Yes. So what do I write? I draw this for my continuous division, is it not? Yes. And I write 437. Four, what do five. I divide with? Five. 5. 5, which is the base you want it to be in. So what is 437 divided by 5? 85 remainder 87 2. 87 remainder 2. 87 remainder what? 2. What is 5 divided by 87? 17 remainder 4. 17 remainder 4. No? 17 remainder 2. What is 17 divided by 5? 3 remainder 2. 3 remainder what? 2. Three remainder two. What is five? Uh, three divided by five. Zero remainder three. Zero remainder what? Three. Three. Once you have zero remainder something, you know that you are ending, is it not? Yeah. So you pick it up from behind. You are going to have what? Three two two three, two. Three two two 
two base what? Five. Five. So that's how you convert. You convert by what we call continuous division. Then you pick the remainder. Is that clear? Yes. Sir. Is that clear? Yes. Sir. Let's look at this again. Appreciate it. In subsequent classes, we'll be looking at converting from other bases to base what? Yeah. Ten. Is that clear? Yes, sir. If you like this our video, please click on the subscribe button, like, share so that your friends can see it. Thanks for your support. Yes, welcome back. Today we are going to be learning how to convert from other bases to base 10. Convert from other bases to base 10. Base number system, that's the class we are having. Conversion from other bases to base 10. When you want to convert from other bases to base 10. Example. Convert. 1101. Zero one base two to a base ten number compact one one zero one zero one base two to a base ten number. So how do we do this? First of all, we write one one zero one zero one in base two. What to convert it to a base 10 number? How do you do it? You do it using a simple procedure known as power expansion. Using a procedure known as power expansion. How do we do it? We take the first number, which is 1, multiply by the base, which is 2, all to the power of the remaining number, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, all to the power 5. Plus, we take the second number, which is 1, times the base, which is 2, all to the power of the remaining number, 4. 1, 2, 3, 4. We take the third number, which is 0, times base 2, all to power 3, plus the next number, 1, times 2, all to power 2, plus the next number, 0, times 2, all to power 1, and finally plus the last number, 1, times 2, all to power 0. So you see, I took out the numbers, the first number, 1, times the base, all to power 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. The second plus the second number 1 times the base 2, all to power 1, 2, 3, 4. Plus the third number 0 times the base 2 to power 1, 2, 3. Plus the fourth number 1 times 2 to power 1, 2. Plus the fifth number 0 times the base 2 to power 1. Plus the sixth number 1 times 2 to power 0. So when I simplify, 1 times 2 to power 5 is what? 2 to power 5 is 32 plus 1 times 2 to power 4 is what? 16 plus 0 times 2 to power 3 is what? 8 plus 1 times 2 to power 2 4 plus 0 times 2 to power 1 2 plus 1 times 2 to power 0 1 anything to power 0 1 so bring this down, 1 times 32 is 32 plus, 1 times 16 is 16 plus, 0 times 8 is 0 plus, 1 times 4 4 plus, 0 times 2 0 plus, 1 times 1 1. That's what we have. So if we add this together, 32 plus 16 plus 4 plus 1, we will get 53 base 10. So that's what we have. So whenever you want to convert from base 10 to another base, you just take the numbers one after the other times the base. The base is always the, the base number you're converting from to 10. To power, you count the number that you have in front of the first number. If it is 5, the next one should be 4, the next one 3, the next one 2. Provided you're picking the numbers one by one, here we used 1. In the next one, we use the other number 1. Next one, we use 0. Next one, we use 1. Next one, we use 0. And next one, we use 1. So that is how to do it in order to find the right answer. I'm going to quickly take another example.
Proverbs 1, 3, 4, base 5, 2, base 10. Convert, convert 1, 3, 4, base 5 to base 10. 1, 3, 4, base 5 to base 10. How do you do it? It's very simple. 1, 3, 4, base 5. Is the same thing as you beat the first number 1 times the base 5 to power 1, 2. Plus the second number 3 times the base 5 to power 1. Plus the last number 4 times the base 5 to power 0. So the power here is 2, 1, 0. It reduces. So here you beat the first number which is 1. And this one beat the second number which is 3. This one beat the third number which is 4. Now 1 times, to simplify the 5 to power 2 is 25 plus 3 times 5 to power 1 is 5 plus 4 times 5 to power 0 is 1. Anything to power 0 is 1. Now bring this down. 1 times 25 is 25 plus 3 times 5 is 15 plus 4 times 1 is 4. So we have 25 plus 5 plus 4. 25 plus 15 plus 4. Which gives us what? 44 base 10. So 1, 3, 5, 4 base 5 is the same thing as 44 base 10. Thank you. Yes, welcome. Today we are going to be learning approximation and estimation in mathematics. Approximation and what? Estimation. First, we are going to learn about fractions. About what? Fractions. We are going to learn about fractions. What are fractions? Or what is a fraction? A fraction is a part of a whole expressed as a figure placed on top of another figure. Is that clear? A fraction is a part of a whole expressed as a figure placed on top of another figure. A figure placed on top of another word, figure. This is a fraction, 5 over 7. A figure placed on top of another word, figure. A fraction is a part of a whole expressed as a figure placed on top of another figure, 5 over 7. A figure at the top is known as the numerator. The figure at the top is known as the what? Numerator. And the figure below is known as what? Denominator. The figure on top is known as what? Numerator. And the figure on below is known as what? Denominator. Examples of fractions are 2 over 3, 4 over 5, 5 over 9. Is that clear? Yes, sir. Is that clear? Yes, sir. That is what fractions are. Now, we have three types of fractions. We have what? Three types of fractions. Number one is what we call the proper fraction. Number one is what we call what? Proper, proper fraction. Proper fraction. Whenever the numerator is less than the denominator, we have what we call proper fraction. Is that clear? Yes. 2 over 3. 2 is less than 3, isn't it? Yes. Give me example, another example of proper fraction. 1 over 2. 1 over 2. This is a proper fraction. Another example. 5, five over 6. 5 over 6. That's a proper fraction. Another example. 7 over 2. 7 over 2. No, 7 over 2 is not a proper fraction. 2 over 7. 2 over 7. These are proper fractions. Number two is what we call improper fraction. Improper what? Fraction. Improper what? Fraction. Improper fraction is when the denominator is less than the numerator. That is when the numerator is greater than the denominator. Example is 10 over 2. Give me another example of an improper fraction. 9 over 4. 9 over 4. That is an improper fraction because the numerator is bigger than the denominator. Another example. 8 over 6. 8 over 6. Another example, 7 over, 2. 7 over 2, good. These are improper fractions. Another type of fraction is what we call mixed fraction. What we call what? Mixed fraction. Mixed fraction. A mixed fraction is when we have a whole number. 
You understand? Yeah. Attached to a fraction. Example is one whole number, one over two. This is a mixed fraction. Because we have a whole number, then we have a fraction. Give me another example of a mixed fraction. Two whole number, two over three. Two whole number, two over three. Give me another example of a mixed fraction. Six whole number, two whole number, three. Six whole number, two number. <laughs> yes. So this is a mixed fraction. Is that clear? Yes, this is a mixed fraction. So these are the types of fractions we have. We said that fraction is simply a part of a whole that is expressed as a figure placed on top of what? And the figure on top is known as what? Numerator. Whereas the one down is known as what? Denominator. Whenever the down, the up one is less than the down, we call it proper. But when the reverse is the case, we call it what? Improper. But when you have a whole number attached, we call it what? Mixed fraction. Is that clear? Yes. Now we're going to learn how to solve fractions. And how to do simplification. We will learn how to do what? Solve fractions and do simplification. Solve fractions and do what? Simply what? Simplification. In this simplification, we are going to learn about a mathematics uh, procedure known as board mass. A mathematics procedure, procedure known as what? Board mass. Board what? Mass. Board mass. Very important. And in board mass, the B stands for what? Bracket. In board mass, the B stands for? Bracket. The O stands for what? Of. The D stands for what? Division. The M stands for what? Huh? Multiplication. The A stands for what? And the N stands for what? Subtraction. The S stands for what? Subtraction. Subtraction. So this is the mathematics procedure that you use in solving simplification. So we are going to take an example. Example number one. Simplify. Simplify. Example number what? One. Simplify. Five four number two over three. This five four number two over three is an example of what kind of fraction? Mixed fraction. Mixed fraction. Divided by. 23 whole number 2 over 5. This 23 whole number 2 over 5 is an example of what fraction? Mixed fraction. Times 3 whole number 1 over 4. This 3 whole number 1 over 4 is the example of which kind of fraction? Mixed fraction. Minus 22. Example, simplify 5 whole number 2 over 3. Divided by 23 whole number 2 over 5 times 3 whole number 1 over 4 minus 22. Simplify this. When you simplify, it means that you should put it in a simple fraction. Is that clear? Yes. And examples of a simple fraction are the proper fraction that we did, the proper fraction of the word means fraction. So simplify it and put it in one of those forms. Now, using board mass, board mass. It's a mathematics procedure that says whenever you see something like this, that you should first of all solve the one that is in what? Bracket. Solve the one that is in what? Bracket. Which is this one. Then when you go into the one that is in bracket, that one that has off. You understand? Yeah. If you don't find off, solve the one that is in what? Division. If you don't find it, solve the one that is in what? Multiplication. Then addition and then what? So subtraction. Right. Is that clear? Yes. Is that clear? Yes. Now, first of all, we'll solve the one that is inside the bracket, isn't it? Yes. So we'll write this one down exactly the way it is, so that we can go to the bracket. We'll first of all solve everything here down before we will start with, uh, mixing it up with this one. So now here we have no of no division. So we'll talk about the we'll, we'll simplify the mixed fractions first. You understand? Yes. So these are the mixed fractions. How do you simplify the mixed fraction? You say 5 times 23 plus 2. Is that clear? 5 times 23 plus what? 
times two. two. What is five times two in the day with your calculator? Eight thousand. 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 Eight thous
or the following fraction. So we have 17 over 3 times 20 over 10 to 81 instead of 10 is 1 over 20 because we are changing to multiplication sign. Now 17 times 20 is 340. 3 times 10 is 1 is 3243. So this is the simplified fraction. This, that is the simplified fraction. Now we're going to take another example. We're going to take another example. Example two. Evaluate one whole number one over four. Plus one whole number, one over two, all over five whole number, one over eight, minus three whole number, three over four. Evaluate this one whole number, one over four, plus one whole number, one over two. All over 5 whole number 1 over 8 minus 3 whole number 3 over 4. First thing is that we change all the mixed fractions to a proper fraction. So for this, we are going to have 4 times 1 plus 4, which is 5 all over 4, plus 2 times 1, 2 plus 1, 3, 3 all over 2, over 5 times 8 times 5, 40 plus 1, 41 all over 8. Plus 3 times 4, 12 plus 3. 3 times 4, 12 plus 3, 15 over 4. So this is the simplified form of this mixed fraction. So what we do next, we get the LCM of these two. What's the LCM of 4 and 2 is 4. Now, 4 divided by 4, 1. 1 times 5, 5. Plus 4 divided by 2, 2. 2 times 3, 6. We'll do the same to this one. The LCM is 8. The LCM of 8 and 4 is 8. 8 divided by 8, 1. 8 times, 1 times 41, 41. 8 divided by 4, 2. 2 times 15, 30. So that's what we have now. So we actually have 5 plus 6 over 4, all over 41 plus 30 over 8. So this is what we have from what we have here. So 5 plus 6 is what? 11 all over 4 divided by 41. This is minus and not plus. 41 minus 30 is minus. This is minus. 41 minus 30 is what? 11 all over 8. So that's what we have. We have 11 over 4 divided by 11 over 8. Now, for us to change this uh, division sign to multiplication sign, we now have 11 over 4 times 8 over 11. We transpose this. So we have 11, cancel 11, and 8 divided by 4 is 12, 2. So our final answer is 2. Our final answer is 2. This is the Example that I was given. First of all, we convert all the mixed fractions to normal fraction. <coughs> Sorry. And that is what we did here. One whole number one over five, four is the same thing as five over four. One whole number one over two is the same thing as three over two. Five whole number one over eight is the same thing as what? one over eight. Three whole number three over four is the same thing as fifteen over four. 
Now to simplify the up one, we find the LCM of 4 and 2, which is 4. 4 divided by 4, 1, 1 times 5, 5. 4 divided by 2, 2, 2 times 3, 6. We do the same thing here, the LCM is 8. 8, 8 divided by 8 is 4, 1 times 41, 41. 8 divided by 4 is 2, 2 times 15, 30. So we have this, which is what we we'll draw down here. And we we'll simplify it. 5 plus 6, 11, all over 4. 41 minus 30, 11, all over 8. Now we have 11 over 4 divided by 11 over 8. Now to change the division sign to multiplication sign, we simply have 11 over 4 times. We we'll transpose this 8 over 11. 11 cancel 11. 8 divided by 4, 2. And that is the final answer. Hello, welcome. Today we are going to be learning index notation and functions, laws of indices, laws of what? Indices, laws of indices. That's what we are going to be learning today. Indices is a very important aspect of mathematics. Is that clear? To use it in solving mathematics. Very, very important aspect of mathematics. And that's what we're going to be learning today. Index notation is a method of shortening the product of numbers of equal factors. Or numbers that are the same. It's a method of what? Shortening. It's a notation using shortening. Instead of writing very long, you shorten. Is that clear? That's what index notation is all about. It's a method of shortening product of numbers that would have been written to be long, you shorten it. You understand? Yes. Example is when you have, instead of writing 2 times 2 times 2 times 2 times 2, how many 2 are here? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Instead of writing it this way, you see that they are the same number, is it not? They are equal what? factors. They are what? The same. 2, 2, 2 into five places. Instead of writing it like this, you write it as what? Two to the power of what? Five. Is that clear? Yes, sir. Two to the power of five simply means two times two times two times two times two in five places. Two to the power of what? Five. Is that clear? Yes, sir. So you can see that this is a shortened form of this, is it not? Yes, and that's why we say index notation is a method of shortening the product of numbers of equal factors. It must be equal. If you have 2 times 3 times 4 times 2 times 2, can you write it in this form? No. Can you write it in this form? Because 2 and 3 are not the same. But when you have 2 times 2 times 2 times 2, equal what? Factors. Is that clear? Yes, sir. So this is an index form of this. Is that clear? Yes. Now we have 7 times 7 times 7 times 7 times 7. How many 7s are here? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. So there shouldn't be this, isn't it? Yes. So that we have 7 to the power of what? 6. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Is that clear? Yes. This is an index notation of this number. Is that clear? Yes. Now if we have, generally, if we have A times A times A times A, how many A's? Four. And we have A to the power of what? Four. 4. So whenever you have an expression like this, this one, the bigger one, we'll call it the word base. The word up, we call it the word index. Is that clear? Yes, sir. Index and base. So if we have 2 to the power of 5, what is the base here? 5. Pay attention. What is the base here? 2. two. What is the index? 5. If we have... What is the base here? Yes. Yes. What is the index? The Q is the word index, and S is the word base. Is that clear? Yes, so we're going to be seeing plenty of expressions like this. So anytime we see them, we refer them to as what? The base and the word index. This is an index notation. This is the word index notation. Is that clear? Yes, Have you written that down? Yes, sir. Now, 
we are going to look at the laws of indices. We are going to look at the what? Laws. laws of indices. What is the law? What are the laws governing indices? Laws of indices. Number one is what we call the multiplication law. Number one is what we call the what? Multiplication law. And this law simply states that if we have a to the power x times b a to the power y is simply equal to a to the power x plus y. Exactly. That's the first law. Whenever we have the same base, multiply it. That's why you call it multiplication law. Whenever we have the same base, multiply it. You understand? With their index in, in the indices, you just simply add up the indices. Is that clear? Yes. Example. When the base are equal, you simply add the index. So this law says that when the base are equal, simply do what? Add the index. Or simply add the indices. So example, if we have 2 to the power 5 times 3 to the power 2 times 2 to the power 3 times 3 to the power 4. How can you simplify this work? Plus the base. The basis yes. is multiplication law that you use back. Yes. Which basis are similar? 2 to the power 5 and what? 2 to the power, two to the power 3. 2 of them are similar back. Yes. Times which other ones are similar? Three. 3 to the power 2, two. and what? 3, three to the power, power 4. Is it not? Yes. Now, since the base are equal for these two, what do we do? Since the base are 2, 2, add the index, is it not? So we say 2 to the power 5 plus 3, is it not? Times, what do we have here? 3 to the power what? 2 plus 4, 4. This is equal to 2 to the power 5 plus 3, 8, is it not? Times 3 to the power 2 plus 4, 6, is it not? 2 to the power 8 is what? What's the, what's the 2 to the power 8? So this is the simplified form, is that clear? Yes. So you can still bring it down by multiplying or by doing 2 to the power 8 and 3 to the power 6. Is that clear? Yes. Is that clear? Yes. So this is the first word, law. Write it down so that I can clean it and write the same problem. Yes, welcome. We are continuing the laws of indices. We are continuing the what? Laws of indices. We've looked at the multiplication law, isn't it? Now we're going to look at the division law. Division law. Division law simply states that if we have a to the power x divided by a to the power y, can you see that the bases are equal? Yes. Their bases are what? A. A to the power x, a to the power y. A index, x and a index was y. If it is division mark that is separating them, it's similar to saying A, the base, the first index minus what, the second index. Is that clear? So if you have 2 to the power 9 divided by 2 to the power 6, what would be the answer? 2 to the power, two to the power what? 3. Three. Because it's the same thing as saying 2 to the power 9 minus what? 6, which is 3. Is that clear? Yes, sir. And why is it so? Because 2 to the power 9 is, it simply means 2 into 9, is it not? Yes. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. 2 to the power 6 is 2 into what? 6. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, is it not? Yes. So if you say 2 cancel 2, 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 2, cancel two. how many 2 will be remaining? Three. And this 
three two is the same thing as saying two to power one three. I see that. So that's why we come about the rule that a to power x divided by a to power y is the same thing as saying a to power x minus what y. Then power rule or power law simply states that if we have a to power x in bracket y, is the same thing as saying a to bracket a to power x times y. Is that clear? So if you have 2 to power 3 in bracket 2, is that clear? It's the same thing as saying, can you see that this is 2 to power 3 into two places, but yeah. 2 to power 3 times 2 to power 3. So if we spread it across, you see 2 to power 3, 1, 2, 3, 2 to power 3, 1, 2, 3. Is that not clear? Yes. Which is the same thing as saying 2 to power 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 2 to power 6. Is it not? Yes. So that's why when you say this, it's the same thing as saying 2 to the power 3 times for 2. 3 times 2 is what? 6. 2 to the power 6. Is that clear? Yes, sir. So let's look at another law. Let's look at another law known as the product power law. Known as the what? Product power law. That's number what? 4. Number 4. The product power law. The product power law. What does this mean? A B X is, is the same thing as saying. You can simply say that when you have A B all to power X is the same thing as saying A to power X B to power X. So example, if we have three P Q. 3 P Q to the power 2 is the same thing as saying 3 to the power 2 times P to the power 2 times what? Q to the power 2. Exactly. Which will give us 9 P 2 Q 2. Exactly. Yes. Write it down. Then number five is what we call the zero law. The zero law. Which states that anything to power zero is the same thing as one. A to power zero is the same thing as what? One. Is that clear? Yeah. X to power zero is the same thing as what? One. One thousand to power zero is the same thing as what? One. One. Any number to power zero is equal to one. One. Is that clear? Any number to power zero. Why? Because if we say two to power three divided by two to power three, you know it's the same thing as saying two to power three minus three. But yes. which is the same thing as saying two to power what? Zero. But yes. zero. Yes. So why is it one? Two to power three is the same thing as saying. 2 times 2 times 2, is it not? Yes. So divided by another 2 to power 3, which is 2 times 2 times 2, is it not? Yes. 2 divided by 2, 2 divided by 2, 2 divided by 2, it will give us a quarter to 1, a 1. So write it down. Product power law and zero law. Have you written it down? Yes, sir. Can I go on? Yes, sir. Can I clean the board? Yes, sir. Now we are going to look at the negative index rule. Negative index rule. That's the next rule. That's rule number what? Six mark. Yes. The negative index law. It simply says that a to power minus x is simply the same thing as saying one over a to power what x. Can you see that? A to power minus x is the same thing as one over a x. Is that clear? So example is what we have five to power minus four. Is simply the same thing as 1 all over 5 to the power 4. Is that clear? Yes. Is that clear? 
So, instead of if you want to remove this negative sign, then a to the power minus x, you simply say 1 over a to the power what? x. Now, we'll look at rule number 6. These rules, you are going to be using them when you start solving indices proper. Is that clear? Roots power. Rule number 7 is known as what? Roots power law. Roots power law. How does it work? A to power 1 over 2 is the same thing as A to power 1 over 2 is the same thing as root of what? A. Instead of saying 1 over 2, you can say root of A. It's the same thing. Is that clear? And A to power, A to power 3, A to power 1 over 3 is the same thing as the cube root of A. Cube root of what A? That's the same thing. Is that clear? A to power 1 over 2 is the same thing as saying root of what A. It's just like saying 4 to power 1 over 2 is the same thing as what? Is the same thing as what? Root of 4, which is what? 2. What? Then if you say 4 to power 1 over 3 is the same thing as what? The cube root of what? 4. Is that clear? Yes. Now we look at another rule. Rule number eight. Rule number what? Eight. Eight. We call it the what? Fraction. Fractional index. The fraction what? Index. index. How does this one work? nth root of a, nth root of a to power m, nth root of a to power m, nth root of a to power m is the same thing as saying a to power a to power what m over n is it similar to the one is the reverse of what we've just done before is it not yes, sir. so in essence when you say that a to the power m over n is the same thing as saying nth root of what e. a to the power what m e. similar is that clear yes, sir. So with that, we can solve so many, with these rules, we can solve so many problems in indices. We can do what? Solve so many problems in indices. With these laws, have you written down all the laws? Yes. So let's try some problems in indices, some indices expression. Evaluate a to power one over three. Evaluate eight to the power one over three. Evaluate eight to the power one over three. You can tell me the simplest form of that. Evaluate eight to the power one over three. Eight to the power one over three from the rules. What's the rule that we have to use? Root power rules. Cube root of what? Eight. Is it not? Yes. And what is the cube root of eight? What factors are when you bring them together into three, it will give you eight? Two. Two back? Yes. That's the answer. Because two times two times two is the same thing as what? Eight. Is it not? Yes, ma'am. Now, if we have 16 over 81 divided by. Evaluate B. 16 over 81 all to power 3 over 4. How do we solve this? 16 over 81 all to power 3 over 4. You know that this expression from the last law that we gave is the same thing as what? The fourth root, right? Yes. Because 4 is here. 
of our system all over what? 81. All to power what? 3. Is it not? 4 to root of what? 16. All over what? 81. All to power 3. It's similar to this expression. 16 over 81 to power 3 over 4 is the same thing as 4 to root of 16 all over 81 to power 3. Is it not? Then 16 is the same thing as saying 2 times 2 times 2 times 2. 2 times 2, 4, 4 times 2, 8, 8 times 2 was 16. Then 81 is the same thing as saying what? 3 times 3 times 3 times 3. Is it not? 3 times 3. 9. 9 times 3. 27. 27 times 3. 81. Is that clear? So what do we do to this now? What is the fourth root of 16? What root of 16 is 2? What root of 3 is what? 3. Is it not? All to power, they are normal 3. Is it not? Now, 2 to power 3 is what? 8. 3 to power 3 is what? 27. That is the answer. So write it down. Yeah, let's continue. We have another one. Another example. Evaluate 2a to power 2 times 4a to power 3. Evaluate. How can you solve that? This is similar to saying 2 times 4 over yeah. times a to the power 2 times a to the power what? 3. Is it not? This is the 2, this is the 4. 2 times 4 times a to the power 2 times a to the power 3. We want to collect like times. That's why we separated it. Is it not? 2 times 2 is what? 2 times 4. 8 times a to the power 2 times a to the power 3 is the same thing as 1. A to the power what? 5. 5, which is 2 plus what? 3. Mm -hmm. So you can say 8 to the power, 8a to the power what? 5. That's the final answer. So write it down. Now we're going to look at decimal powers and bases. We're going to look at what? Decimal power. Decimal powers and basis decimal powers and basis convert the decimal to fraction then solve the indices then convert back that's the procedure we use in in solving this first of all you convert the decimal to fraction. Convert the decimal to fraction. Then solve the indices. Whenever you have a decimal indices, that's how you do it. Convert the decimal first to fraction, then solve the indices, then convert back. Then convert towards back. So we are going to see some examples on this. Evaluate 0 0.08. Evaluate 0 0.008. All to power 1 over 3. All to power 1 over 3. How do you solve that? 0 0.008. All to power. 1 over 3. How can you solve that? We say that first of all, you convert to fraction back. 0 0.008 is similar to what fraction? 0 0.008 is similar to what fraction? What fraction is this similar to? Similar to 8 over 1,000. 
eight all over what? One thousand. You know why? This is what? One, two, three. You see one, two, three. You understand? Yeah. Anytime you want to convert a decimal to a fraction, just check the zeros. One, two, three. One, two, three. The same thing saying it over one thousand. Is that clear? Yes. Now what is the similar what is similar to it over one thousand to four three? You know that this is equal to what? What is this equal to? This is the same thing I say cube root of eight over what? One thousand. Is it not? This is the same thing. This is one of the rules of indices. So third root of uh, cube root of eight is what? Two. And keep root of 1000 is what? 10. This is the same thing as saying 1 over what? 5. Is it not? Yes. And 1 over 5, when you convert it to this mic, it will give us what? 0 0.2. Is it not? Yes. So write it down. Another one is when we have 0 0.25 to power. Evaluate 0 0.25 to power minus 2. How do we solve this? 0 0.25 to power minus 2. 0 0.25 to power minus 2 is the same thing as saying 25 over what? 100 all to power minus 2. Do you know that? And this is the same thing as saying 1 over. 25 over 100 to power 2. When you remove the minus sign, and this is the center I say 1 over 25 into into 2 is what 625, and 100 into 2 is what 10,000, isn't it? Now, because of this one, you can still make it, you will not transpose this to be 10,000 all over what? 625. Which is the same thing as saying what? 16. 10,000 over 625 is 16. Is that clear? Yes. You finish writing the upper. So write the other one out. Write the one I just wrote now while I do the final assignment for today, which is 32 to power 0 0.2. 32 to power 0 0.2. Evaluate 32 to power 0 0.2. Evaluate 32 to power 0 0.2. What will be the answer? We have 32 to power. It's the same thing as saying 32 to power. 0 0.2 is the same thing as what? 2 over what? 10. Let's cut this up. One zero. Two over ten. So this is similar to saying thirty-two to power what? One over what? Five. Two here, one, two here, five. So this is similar to saying the fifth root of what? Thirty-two. Is it not? Yeah. What into five will give you thirty-two? Two. That's the final. Yes, welcome. Today we are going to be learning operations in sword. We are going to be learning how to solve sword operations. How to solve what? Sword operations. Now, in mathematics, we have two kinds of numbers. Numbers can be rational or irrational. Numbers can be what? Rational or irrational. Now, if some numbers can be expressed as a ratio of two integers, once you can express a number as a ratio of two integers, let's say 10. 10 can be expressed as 20 over 2. Is it not? 10 and 20 over 2, are they the same thing? Hmm? Do they have the same value? 10 and 20 over 2? 
10 and 20 over 2. This number 10, is it the same thing as 20 over 2? It's the same thing now, they have the same value. You understand? So you can express 10 as what? One integer over the other. Hmm? So now, if some numbers can be expressed as a ratio of two integers, a over b, just like you can do with 10, where a and b belong to a set of integers, and b is not equal to zero. Such numbers are called what? Rational number. Is that clear? So it's still a rational number. It's still a rational number. Yes, because you can express this as 20 over 2. You can also express 10 as what? Can express this as uh, 100 over what? 10, is it not? So that's a rational number. Examples are 3, 2 over 5, 3 over 2, 2.7. All of these are rational numbers. But others cannot be expressed as ratio. And they are called what? The ones that cannot be expressed in that form are known as irrational number. Example of an irrational number is pi. Pi. What is the value of pi? Who can tell me the value of pi? Hmm? Pi, you use pi a lot in mathematics. What's the value of pi? Every math student should know the value of hmm? pi. What's the value of pi? Pi is abbreviated to 3.142. You understand? Well, the actual value of pi is 22 over what? 7. Which is not 3.142. 3.142 plus something, something. Isn't it? So press 22 over 7. Let's see the value. 22 divided by 7. You see, it's a long number. So such long numbers are called what? Irrational numbers. Such long numbers, long numbers are called what? Irrational. You're supposed to know this. This is basic of math, basics of mathematics. You have two types of numbers. Rational, you understand? The ones that you can have like 3 over 2, 3, 5, 2.7, 2.75. They are rational numbers. But this one that their value is, the value is very long, like 3.142, blah, blah, blah. Such is known as what? Irrational. Now, we'll talk about one very famous irrational number known as Sorts. Is that clear? Sorts are what? Irrational numbers. They are the roots of rational numbers whose values can be expressed, cannot be expressed as what? Exact fraction. Is that clear? Yes. Press root 2. What will root 2 give you? See the value is very long, isn't it? 1.4 blah blah blah. So it's an irrational number. Blueprint. In mathematics, we call this under sort, we call this sub 2, is that clear? We call this sub 7, we call this sub 12. Press sub 7, let's see the value. Can you see it's very long? But press sub uh, 12. You see back. So all those are known as irrational numbers. Is that clear? So whenever you have this sort sign, you know we are talking about what sorts. Sorts are irrational numbers. Is that clear? Sorts are irrational numbers. Sorts are irrational numbers. Now we look at the laws of sort. The what? Laws. In in the when we are looking at uh, what's it called indices, we looked at laws of indices. Right? So uh, at the same way, we have laws of so we have rules of salt. Right along rules of salt. What rules applies whenever you want to? What rules apply whenever you want to solve salt? Rule number one. Rule number one says. Whenever we have sort of P Q, whenever we have sort of P Q, now you can also express it as sort P times sort Q. That's the rule number one. 
Rule number two says that whenever we have salt B over Q, rule number two says that whenever we have salt B over Q, that we can also express it as salt B all over salt Q. And rule number three says that whenever we have salt P plus Q, rule three says if we have salt P plus Q, that it is never equal to salt P plus salt Q. And the final rule number four says when we have salt P minus Q, Oh, we have sword B minus Q. It is never equal to sword B minus sword Q. So those are the rules of sword. So these are all correct, provided B and Q are positive integer. Are positive. Are positive. So, are you done? So, in explaining this, these are the rules. Is the, are the rules clear? Yes, Wherever we have salt PQ, it's the same thing as separating the salt P times salt Q. Hmm? When we have salt P over Q, it's the same thing as separating the salt P all over salt Q. Whatever we, but when we have P plus Q, is it the same thing as saying P plus Q? No. This sign means that it is not equal to. When we have P minus Q, it's not the same thing as saying P minus Q. It's not equal to. Hmm? So, as a way of explaining these rules, now, if we have sort 12, example, if we have sort 12, exactly, sort 12 is the same thing as saying, you know that 12 is the same thing as 4 times 3, is it not? So this is the same thing as saying sort 4 times sort what? 3, exactly. And you know that sort 4 is what? 2, sort what? As a simplified form. Is that clear? Is that clear? So, also, that's example one. Example two, if we have sod, if we have sod 12 over 4, hmm? we can separate it to say sod 4 times sod 3, all over sod what 4, is it not? Is it not? First of all, you can separate this as saying sod 12 over sod 4, is it not? Which is the same thing as saying sod 4 times sod 3, all over sod what 4. Sod 4 kills sod 4 will give us only sod what 3. So write the two examples down. So that I can give you a side So after writing that, please break down the following thoughts for me. Assignment. Simplify sort 20. Simplify the following. Bring them to the last sort. You see this one was simplified to this, but this was simplified to this. So 20. Sort 40. Sort. 12 over 3 sod 
18 over 5 salt 18 salt 20 minus 4 salt 30 plus 5 salt 10 so simplify the following salts inside your salts I will check them now
Um, today we're going to be looking at examples in Venn diagram. In the other classes, we, we learned that Venn diagram. In previous classes, we learned that Venn diagram is that diagrammatical uh, Good. You understand? When you represent set diagram. Where the rectangular shape is the universal set and the cycles is for the different sets, isn't it? Isn't it? We we'll call it Venn diagram. Now we can solve arithmetic problems using this Venn diagram. So let's take this one. In a class containing 32 students, what does this mean? 32 students. The universal set is what? The number is what? 32. A student can either do government or what? History. It's either you're doing government or what? History. Or both, or you can do both. That's the intersection between the yeah. two, isn't it? If 16 students do government, 16 students do government, 18 students do history, 18 students do what? History. Three do not do any of them. Three. None of the subjects. Find how many students do both. So what are we looking for? X. X. Exactly. So to represent this in a Venn diagram, what we do is that, first of all, we draw the words Universal set. So we draw this and say universal set equal to what? Now, a student can do either government or history. You understand? What does that mean? The intersection of government and what? History is X because they didn't tell us the number of students. Now, 16 students do government. That means that six, the people doing only government will be 16 minus people that do both government and history. Can you say that? Now, 18 people do history, means that 18 minus x only history. And three people do none of the subjects. Find x. So that is what you are supposed to find. Exactly. You are supposed to find x. So simply we say that the number doing government is 16, number doing history is 18, number not doing any of them is what? 3. G in on pet prime. Exactly. So now we equate everything, we add up everything and equate them towards universal set. Everything inside here must be equal to universal set. So how do we equate people that are doing only government, 16 minus x, plus people that are doing only history, 18 minus x, plus people that are doing both history and government, x, plus people that are doing none of the subjects, 3, equal to what? 32. So we make x the subject of the formula. X will be equal to what? 5. So that means that people doing only people doing both history and government is what? 5. What are people doing only government? It will be what? 16 minus 5, five which is 11. what? 11. People doing only history will be what? 18 minus 5. That is what? 13. Is that clear? So now you can find out the people doing both, people doing only h which is next, and people doing only G, which is what? 11, is that clear? So that is how you do the calculation. Separate all of them in Venn diagram form. Then pick them one by one and add them up and equate them towards the universal set. Make sure the subject, find out. So you cannot take the answers. If they ask you to find the number of students doing both, you can answer. If they ask you the number of students doing only two grams, you also solve out. After finding X, do not be subtracting. You understand? So get the individual stuff. So if you like this video, please click on the subscribe button, like and share our video. Thank you very much. Hello, welcome. Today we're going to be looking at geometric progression. GP, geometric progression. In arithmetic progression, we say that the difference between successive numbers can be gotten by addition or subtraction, isn't it? I'll call it common difference. Now, in geometric progression, the difference between successive numbers are gotten from multiples. Multiples, is that clear? Or factors, is that clear? And it is known as what? Common ratio. It is known as what? Now, Geometric progression is a sequence in which any two consecutive terms differs by a constant multiple or what? Factor. The constant multiple or factor is called the common ratio, while the first time is denoted by the letter was A. Can you see this geometric progression? 
What is the common ratio? 3. Why is 3 the common ratio? Because 6 times 3 is 18. 18 times 3 54. 54 times 3 162. You understand? The difference is by is gotten by multiplication or division. You understand? Unlike the other one that is gotten by addition or subtraction. Now, this is another sequence, geometric uh, progression. What is the common ratio? 1 over 2. 1 over, one over, number 1 over 2, which is the same as 3 over 2. 16 times 3 over 2, 24. 24 times 3 over 2, 36. 36 times 3 over 2, 54. 54 times 3 over 2, 81. So this first sequence, the first time A is what? 6. And the common ratio is what? 3. The second sequence, the first time is what? A is 16, and the common ratio is what? 1 over 1 over 2, or you call it 3 over 2. Now, very, very important, you need to know the n term of a dp. You need to know the formula for the what? n term of a dp. And it's simply given by Tn is equal to the fourth term A times R, which is the common ratio, to power what? n minus 1. Is that clear? And the sum of the terms, let's say some of the first three terms will be S3, isn't it? So if you have Sn and some of the terms, it's going to be a into bracket r to power n minus 1 all over r minus 1. Is that clear? You can also write this formula in this form. A into power 1 minus r to power n all over 1 minus r. You use this value when the common ratio is greater than 1. When the common ratio r greater than 1, use this formula. But when 1 is greater than the common ratio, you use this formula. Then one last formula that you need is what? The sum to infinity. When n is tending to infinity, what will be the sum? It is a all over 1 minus what? r. So with that, we can take this example. The eighth term of a GP is 640. If the first term is 5, find the common ratio and the tenth term. Who can help? Here is my clipboard cleaner. Good. Who can help me solve this? I'm going to erase from here. Isn't it? So once I erase from here, I'm going to solve for this. So what are the given? 8 term. So I'm going to have 8 term. How do you represent the 8 term? Is what? T8, isn't it? It's equal to A to power A times R to power M minus 1. Equal to what? It's already given as what? 640. Is that? So what is A? 5, because the first term is 5. What is R? We don't know. What is N? 8 minus 1, equal to what? 640. This is going to be 5, R to power what? 7, equal to what? 640. And this is going to be, this is going to be R to power 7 is equal to 640 over 5. Multiply, what will you get? 128. And this is going to be R equal to 7th root of 128. What would I give you? 2. So the common ratio is what? 2. The common ratio is what? 2. But we are told to find also the 10th term. So if the common ratio is 2, we know that 10th term is simply T10. And it's equal to A to the power Rn minus 1, isn't it? So it's going to be A is what? 5. R is what? 2. N is what? 10 minus 1. And it's going to be 5, 2, bracket, 10 minus 1, 9. It's going to be 5 times 2 to the power 9. 512. So 512. So 5 times 512 is what? 2560. And that becomes your what? That becomes your what? Answer the tenth term. Did you see this procedure that I went through? Did you see the procedure? Huh? First of all, is that is it correct? Huh? Press the calculator as very well. If you like this video, click on the subscribe button, like and share videos. See you in the next class. Thank you. Bless you. Hello, welcome. Today we're going to be looking at the rules, the basic rules of differentiation. 
We are going to be looking at what? The basic rules of investing. Basic rules. And we uh, have what we call the sum rule, the product rule, the quotient rule, and the function of function rule. Is that clear? Yes. We are going to be looking at those rules. And the sum rule simply says that if you have two functions of x, if you have two functions of what? Yes. You know, in the previous class, we are looking at dy over what? dx. Where y is the function of x? Say uh, something like uh, 2 to the power x squared plus 1. Now, what if we have the u? The, uh, if you have something like, instead of having only 2 to the power x1, you have something like 2x squared plus 1. In brackets, you have another 3x squared minus 1. Where this one represents u and this one represents v. You see that these two are all functions of x. Functions of x are any expression that has s in it. So let's say u is this and v is this. That's what we mean when we say given u and v that are functions of x. So if you have them arranged in such a way that they are added, the differential is simply the differential of the first one, the first function, say 2x squared plus 1, plus the differential of the second function, 3x squared minus 1. So when you add them up, if you differentiate them individually and add them up, that is the differentiation of this, and that is called sum rule. Now, differentiation of a constant, even if c is a constant and you have a function of x, the differentiation is simply bringing out the constant to the other side and differentiating the function of s. So this function of s u could be this, 2x squared plus 1. So you do the normal differentiation. Now the product rule says that if you have two functions of x that are multiplied together, their, differential is, their differentiation is actually the first function differentiate the second function plus the second function differentiate the function, first function, add them together. Now we look at the quotient rule. The quotient rule is saying that if we have the differential of the uh, second, function, uh, of first, second function over the first function, is simply equal to keep the first function, differentiate the second function, minus keep the second function, differentiate the first function all over the second function squared. Very, very important. You need to know this. You need to know this. The rules are very, very important. The rules are what? Very, very important. Very, very important. The rules are very, very what? Important. Important. Please, this is a uh, u over v. So the quotient rule simply says that differentiation of, of first function over the second function is simply the first function differentiate the second function minus the second function differentiate the first function all over the second function squared. Now we have what to call function of functions. We have what to call what? Function of functions. Or you call it chain rule. It simply means that if you have V that is a function of U already, that their differential is actually differentiation of the function of function times differentiation of the second function all over uh, that dv dx. We are V is a function of U, general, very, very important. I'm going to be explaining this as I press my cleaner. I'm going to be explaining this with some examples. With what? Some examples. Some examples. I'm going to be explaining this with some what? Examples. Examples. Now, I told us that even Y to be equal to ax n that the differentiation of y with respect to x is simply equal to n a x n minus 1. Is that what is in your note? Yes. That's the first statement. So if you're given an expression y to be a function of x in this way, to differentiate it, simply carry the n. Can you see the n? Yes. Bring it to the back. Then subtract 1 from the n. Now, given that y is equal to 2x squared plus 3x, who can tell me the dy over the x of this? It will simply be, can you see the 2? Yes. You have to carry it over. So 2 times 2. 4. x. You have to subtract 1 from the x. 2 minus 1. 
plus the same thing here. What is here? You know that one is here, even when you are not seeing it. Yeah. Goes over it to what? X. Then you have X, 1 minus 1, yeah. 0. So now you have what? 4X plus anything to power 0 is 1, 3. Can you see that? Yeah. If you are told to differentiate Y equal to X3 plus 1, what would be the answer? dy over dx will be equal to what? This 3 will come over, is it not? Yes. So I have 3x what? Square. Square. Because you reduce 1 from there. Differentiation of a constant is what? 1. Nothing. You understand? So this is the answer that you have. Is that clear? So you constant is anything that does not have x attached to it. Differentiation of it is mm -hmm. 0. Is that clear? Yes. Now, if you are told to differentiate y equal to 4x3 plus 2x, what will be the answer? The y over the x will be equal to what? 12x. 4 times, 3 times 2 is what? 12x what? Square. Square. Plus. Plus. 2x. Hmm? 2x. 2x1. X, suppose to be 1 minus 1. Zero. Which is 0. Eh? And x to power 0 is what? 1. Yeah. So this is supposed to be the answer. Is that clear? Yeah, yeah. And differentiation of cos theta is equal to what? Differentiation of sine theta is equal to what? Take it in your note. You see a place where I drew something like this. And I wrote here the differential. So that note is not alright though. Okay, we'll update it. What is the differential of cos, cos theta and sine theta? Check, 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 check. Check the differentiation of sine theta and cos theta. What does it give? Then, cos after checking, you do this assignment. What does it give? Cos x. Huh? Cos theta, when you differentiate it, what does it give? Mm. That'll be cos x. Huh? Cos x. Which one? Cos x is minus sine. Oh, you say cos x. Cos x gives you what? Minus what? Sine x. Sine x. Sine x. Why differentiation of minus of sine x gives what? Cos x. Cos x. Cos x. So now do this assignment. Given that y is equal to x to the power 4 plus 2x to the power 3 plus 3x to the power 2 plus 1x to the power uh, plus cos x plus sine x plus 100. Who can get me the dy dx of this assignment? Right, let's go. What's the dy dx of this? 4x. 4 x cube cube isn't it yes. plus what 6x 6x squared square. okay plus hello welcome today we're going to be looking at product rule mm -hmm. and we say that given y as a function of given y as a function of so, UV. UV. Two, two functions of x. Can you see? Yes, Can you sir. see x in this expression? Yes, sir. Can you see x in this expression? Yes, sir. So u here is 2x plus 1. Yes. B here is what? Yes. X. To differentiate this, simply do what? Keep u. This is u, ma. Yes, sir. Keep it. Differentiate v. Yes. What is the differentiation of x? 1. One. Plus Keep V. What is V? X. X. Differentiate U. What is U? This is U. What is the differentiation of this expression? Two. Two. Then you solve down. One multiply everything here will still give you the same thing. Two times X, two X. Yes. Collect like term. Two X plus two X. Four, four X, X plus one. one. You understand? Yes, sir. The same thing here. This is Y equal to this and this. This is what? U. This is what? V. v. So to differentiate it, keep u. This is u, you keep it. 
Yes. Differentiate V. This is V. What is the differentiation of this? Two. Two. You write it. Yes. Plus. Keep. Keep V. This is your V. Yes. Differentiate yes. U. This is your U. Six. Differentiation of this will give you what? Six. 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 Now solve down. 2x times 3x squared, 6x squared, 2x times 1, 2, two. plus 6x six six times 2x, 12x squared, 6x squared. Six six times 1, 6x, six six collect like times, 12x plus 6x squared, 18x eight 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 squared, two. plus 6x plus 2. two. Can you see that? Yes, sir. Can you see that? Yes, sir. Uh, this is what we call product rule. This is what we call what? Product rule. Now we're going to look at quotient rule. We're going to look at what? Quotient rule. Quotient rule. So who can give me the statement of the quotient rule from your notes? Quotient rule says if we have a, we are differentiating the u over v. v, is it not? Yeah. What will be the statement? That will be v d u, v different of u, v, no, the other, the other. or u, no, the other side. Check the formula, they u different of u, v. Check the formula the way I stated it. V different of U. Oh, yes. Quotient rule. V du over what? Dx. dx. Isn't it? Yes. Minus U D V dv over what? Dx. dx. All over what? V squared. V squared. Is that? Yes, sir. So, give me the first problem in quotient rule. So, that's the formula. 3x. Is it y? Is equal to what? 3x to the power 4. 3x to the power 4. Plus 2. Plus 2. Plus 2. two. All over x plus 1. All over x plus 1. X plus 1. That is the equation, isn't it? Yes, sir. So, what is u here? U is 3x cube m. 3x to the power 4 plus 2. What is V? X plus 1. X plus 1. You understand? Yes, sir. So putting it in this quotient formula is going to be keep V. What is V? That's X plus 1. X plus 1. Differentiate U. That's 6x. What will, be, what will be the differentiation of this U? 12x. 12x to the power what? 3. 3. Is okay. it not? 3x. Yes, sir. Minus. Keep you, what is you? 3x4 plus 2. Differentiate V. What will be different? 1. one. Is it not? Yes, sir. All over what? Now, v squared. What is V? X, X plus 1 or square. Is that? Yes, sir. So we can break this down by this. This multiply this will give me what? 12x to the power 4. Plus 12x to the power 3. Minus 3x to the power 4. Plus two. two all over so this plus one two. Will, this plus. Oh plus two, yes. This one will give us what? How be this one will give us 20. x plus one bracket x, x plus one. Isn't it? Yes. yes. So breaking down again, twelve x minus this will give me what? Nine x nine x to the power four. No, nine x. Nine, nine x to the power of four. No. Plus twelve yes. x. 3 plus 2. So you have to always write the coefficient, you understand? Yes. The, 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 the function. Oh. The, this, the, this time this. x squared. x squared plus this two. time this. x plus this time this. x plus this time this. 1. So I will now have 9x squared plus 12x3 plus 2. All over. Do you know how I got this? x times this. x, x times x is x, x squared. squared. 1 times x is x. x. x times 1 is x. x. One, times one times 1 is 1. one. Okay. So if you collect like times, you have x squared plus 2x plus 1. Can you see that? Yes, sir. So this is what you'll be having. You can leave your answer as this. Is that clear? Yes, sir. Now, give me another example in quotient rule number 2. Uh, 
can give us another example in Pushen Road. Okay, only one. X4. Okay. Plus 2. X to power. 4. 4 plus 2. Equals 2. All over. All over. 3 plus X. 3 plus X. Is that? Yes. This is Y. So what is our U here? Our U is X4 plus. X to power 4 plus, plus 2. 2. And what is our V? 3 plus X. X. So now what is our dy over dx is going to be keep b which is what three plus x differentiates you which is what cube four x cube is it not yeah. minus keep you what is you x x four plus two differentiates a what one. is b one one isn't it yes. all over b squared what is b squared three, three plus x, x all square, isn't it? Yes, sir. So if you open the bracket, it's going to be 12x3 plus 4x4 minus x4 plus 2 all over 3 plus x and 3 plus x, isn't it? Yes. This is going to give us uh, 12x3 4x squared minus this is going to give us 3x4 uh, plus 3x4 plus 2. 2 all over. You can break this one down. 3 times 3, 9. 9 plus 3x. 3x plus 3x plus 3x plus 3x plus 3x plus 3x plus 3x Is that? Yes, sir. So this should give us uh, 12x3 plus 3x4 plus 2 all over. Can make this one, one to be the first one x squared plus, plus this plus this 6x six six x plus, plus 9, nine. as the final answer. If you like this, click on the subscribe button, like and share our videos. Thank you. Hello, welcome. Today we are going to be looking at geometry. Today we are going to be looking at what? Geometry. Geometry. Geometry is that aspect of mathematics that has to do with shapes. That deals with what? Shapes. shapes. And you know the shapes that we have. We have the rectangle, isn't it? We have the square. We have the cycle. We have the cube. We have the cuboid. We have the cylinder. We have the cone. We have several types of shapes, isn't it? Several types of shapes. These shapes can be classified into plane shapes and solid shapes. Is that clear? The plane shapes are the ones that have just two planes, like the X and Y axis. Is that clear? Whereas the solid shapes are the ones that are three-dimensional, that has both X, Y, and what? Z. They have depth. They have what? Depth. The two-dimensional ones are known as the plane shapes. Is that clear? Now, Anu, give me examples of plane shapes. Rectangle, Rectangle okay. Square. Square. Trapezium. Good. Um, Abby, give me examples of solid shapes. Square. Solid shapes. Square. Sphere. Hmm? Sphere. Sphere, okay. Pyramid. Pyramid, okay. Cone, okay. Cylinder. Cylinder. Cube. Cube. Good. All those solid shapes, they have depth. They have what? Yeah. Depth. They are three dimensional. Is that clear? So you can easily say that the three dimensional of square is what? Three dimensional of square is what? Cube. Is it not? Because this one has depth. It has both length, width, and what? Breadth. Whereas all these ones have only length and what? Breadth. Is that clear? What is the three-dimensional form of rectangle? Cuboid. Isn't it? So these are the shapes that we have. And we say that geometry is an aspect of mathematics which deals with the study of what? Different shapes. These shapes could be what? Plain or what? Solid. The plain ones are the two-dimensional ones. And examples are what? Triangle, rectangle, square, cycle, trapezium, kite, parallelogram. Is that clear? Whereas the solid shapes are the ones that are three-dimensional. 
they have depth in them. The example is the cube, cuboid, cylinder, cone, square, pyramid, and what? Cylinder objects. Is that clear? Now, I'm going to require you to tell me the difference between rectangle and square. What's the difference? This one has all the sides to be what? Equal. Is that clear? Whereas this one has opposite sides to be what? Equal. Is that clear? Parallelogram, also the same thing. It has these two sides equal, but, but bent at an angle, isn't it? These two sides are also equal, unlike trapezium. Is that clear? Trapezium has just two sides that are parallel. Is that clear? Then this is a kite. This is a what? Kite. This is a what? Kite. What's kite? Kite has these two sides to be equal. And these two other sides to also be equal. Can you see? The two upsides are equal and the two downsides are equal. Are we together on that? Mm -hmm. What other things can you tell me about all this? Is there any other thing? Nothing more, isn't it? These are the plane shapes and these are the what? Solid shapes. Is that clear? In subsequent classes, we are going to be learning about types of angles and how to relate all these to their areas. Is that clear? Thank you. If you like this our video, do us. Click on the subscribe button, like and share our videos. Thank you so much. Hello, welcome. Today we're going to be looking at construction and locus. Today we're going to be looking at what? Construction. construction and locus. What is construction? Construction simply means drawing shapes, lines, angles accurately. Is that clear? Yes. Whenever you have the ability to draw shapes, like a circle is a shape, isn't it? A straight line is also a shape. Your ability to draw it accurately is known as what? Construction. It's known as what? So that's what we say. Construction means to draw shapes, angles, and lines accurately. Is that clear? Mm -hmm. When you want to do this construction, there are some basic tools that you need. There are some what? Mm -hmm. Basic tools. Those things you use in doing the construction. Example is what we call a ruler. Example is what we call what? Mm -hmm. This is a ruler. Mm -hmm. Another good example is what we call pencil. What we call what? Mm -hmm. This is a pencil, isn't it? Another thing you need is what we call compass. Isn't it? This is a compass. Use it to mark arcs and circles. Isn't it? Another thing you need is what we call a protractor. A protractor. This is a protractor. Is it? This is it to mark out angles. Exactly. You also need an eraser so that when you make mistake, you can easily erase. You also need T square and C squares. Isn't it? So those are the basic tools that you need for what? construction. Basic tools for construction. A ruler. This is a sketch of a ruler. A pencil. A protractor a compass and what we call eraser, isn't it? And other things, is that clear? There are basic things that the requirement that you are supposed to have or you're supposed to incorporate in your techniques used in construction, is that clear? Those are number one, that you have to use a very sharp pencil. You have to use a very sharp word yes. before you use your pencil. Make sure you sharpen it very well, is that clear? You have to also use a clean eraser. Your eraser has to be very clean so that you can make erasure very accurately. Exactly. You have to also use a very straight ruler. This is my ruler. It has to be straight. Once your ruler starts having problems, it will not give you accurate construction. Exactly. So you have to have a very straight ruler. And you have to have a very good pair of compass. This pair of compass, if it is not strong, as you're making, marking out your axe, it will be giving you different uh, measurements. So you have to make sure that it's firmly fixed. Exactly. So once you have these tools, and many more of them, and you are able to obey all these basic rules, you're going to have a good construction. You're going to have a what? In subsequent classes, we are going to be starting our construction, and we'll be starting with a straight line, marking out a line of specific length. Is that clear? This is the Hello, welcome. Today we're going to be constructing a line of a given length. We're going to be doing what? Let's say you're told to construct a line of 7 cm. How do you go about constructing it using your basic construction tools that we've looked at already? Is that clear? If you're told to construct a line of what? 7 cm. How do you go about it? Number one, draw a line XY longer than 7 cm. The first thing you do is to draw a line that is longer than the 
length that is given to you. Is that clear? Let's say you're given line to construct a line of 10 cm. You have to first of all draw a line of 20 cm or 15 cm. Is that clear? In this case, you are given to draw a line of how many cm? 7 cm. So who can tell me a line that is greater than 7 cm? Let's say 13 cm, isn't it? So instead of constructing this 7, we first of all draw a line of what? 13 cm. Can you see this line? XY, 13 cm. XY, longer than 7 cm. Is that clear? So this is the extended version of it, but this is the accurate distance of the here. Yeah. But I'm using this so that you understand it more. So first thing you do is to construct a line x, y that is longer than the actual line that you expected to construct. Is that clear? So first of all, you draw x, y of 13 cm. Is that clear? Mark off a point A. From this line that you've drawn, just mark up any point. It can be here. You write A or here, A. You understand? Or here, A. Any place. So I'm picking this point A, is that clear? Which is also what I did here, out of my 13 cm, is that clear? Now, with the center A and a distance 6 cm, not actually 6 cm, supposed to be what? And a distance what? 7 cm. Draw an arc to cut x, y at B. So for you to draw an arc, you need to use what? Compass, you need to use what? But they say with the center what A. That means placing this on the A that you've marked out. With a distance of what? 7 cm. How do you pick out a distance of 7 cm on a compass? You need to use your what? Ruler. Who has my ruler? You need to use your what? Ruler. Can you see your ruler? Your ruler is always calibrated in cm. And you have from 1 cm to how many? 30 cm. 1 cm to how many? 30 cm. So you need to pick out 7 cm from this. Is that clear? So if you place your compass at point 0, then you stretch it to 7. You stretch it towards. Make sure that the, where your pen is, is up to 7. Can you see that? So this is a distance of 7 cm on your ruler. Is that clear? So using A as your what? Center. Can you see A as my center? I place this on A. I now mark this. Is that clear? Is that clear? So if I mark it, I'm going to see that I will have this point. Is that clear? So that is the point of what? 7 cm. So if I mark it, if I place at my center and draw on this, I'm going to be able to mark out this point as my what? 7 cm. As my what? As my what? So I now have from A to B to be what? 7 cm. Is that clear? So if I marked it out here, it would have been here, my B would have been here, and it will be what? 7 cm. Is that clear? So that is how you do the construction with the exact instructions that I've given on the board. With the exact what? Instruction that I've given on the board. Number one, draw a line x, y longer than 7 cm. You place your ruler. Is that clear? That's the first thing you do. You place your ruler and draw a line. This is from point 1 to 7. So let's pick a, a line that is longer than 7. It's going to be, let's say, 23. So I draw this first line. Is that clear? So this is 23 cm. This is how many cm? 23 cm. I'm going to mark this at what? x, what? y. So what's the next thing I do? I just mark out any point a. Mark out any point what? a. Is that clear? Now I'm going to use my compass and measure out 7 cm. And this is 7 cm from 0 here to 7 here. 7 cm. Is that clear? So I'm going to use A as my center point and now draw. Is that clear? So any point that I draw here becomes my what? Becomes my what? So the distance from A to B becomes what? Is that clear? Is that clear? But the bigger distance is the first longer than X that I have and that was 20 what? 3 cm. Is that clear? So to draw a given line segment, Draw any line x, y that is longer than the particular given length. Is that clear? Call it x, y. Then mark off any length, just any point from x. Call it a, is it not? Then using your compass, measure out the length that you want from your ruler. Then place it on the point that you marked off. Draw. Is that clear? Then those two points become the given line segments, a, b, that you need. Is that clear? Then you need your ink or your pencil and make it thicker. Is that clear? 
cannot uh, clean up this place if you don't want it. So that's how you draw a constructed line segment. As a way of assignment, you're going to construct a line segment of 12 cm of what? 12 cm. Please, if you like this video, hit the subscribe button. If you have any further questions on what you've treated, please drop it on the comment section. Thank you. And God bless you. Hello, welcome. Today we're going to be looking at vectors in mathematics. Vectors. There are two major kinds of physical quantities in the world, or generally in engineering or mathematics. We have what we call the vectors and the scalars. Every quantity in the world can either be a scalar or a vector. Quantity are things like speed, distance, length, mass. So any, anything you use to measure the amount of something, density, any of them can be called a quantity. So these quantities can either be scalar or vector. Whenever a quantity has both magnitude and direction, it is called vector. But whenever it has only magnitude, it is called scalar. So scalar quantities are those quantities that have only magnitude. Whereas vector quantities are those quantities that have, that have both magnitude and direction. Examples of scalar quantities are length, mass, distance, speed. Whereas examples of vector quantities are displacement, weight, acceleration. Anything that has both magnitude and direction. So, uh, we say that there are two kinds of physical quantities. We have the scalars and the vectors. Scalars are those that have only magnitude. Example, speed, distance, length, volume, area, work, mass, etc. Vectors are those that have both magnitude and direction. Example, displacement, effect, velocity, acceleration, force, and... So, whenever you want to describe a vector, you must show the direction. It's not only the magnitude or the size. You have to show the size and also the direction. But whenever you want to uh, describe a scalar quantity, you just show the size alone. How heavy is this? But when you talk about weight, mass is just how heavy, the size. But weight is the size moving downwards due to gravity in a direction. That's why weight is a vector quantity, whereas mass is a scalar quantity. Now, uh, there are vectors that are called free vectors. There are some vectors that are called free vectors. Free vectors are vectors that do not have any particular position associated with them. So any vector that does not have a particular position associated with it, it is known as a free vector. But normal vectors, I want to uh, give us an example of a normal vector, how it can be identified. Now, if you're looking at the distance between A and B, this can be called displacement because of the direction. This is north, this is, you can see, and this is north, east. This is east, north, east. B is at a position, north, east. 50 kilometers north, east of A. Can you see B? This is your B. You can, this is point B, which you can use this uh, process to identify so that you can have the north, south, east, and west pole. So how can you identify B? B is at a position north east of A, 50 kilometers north east of A, and it can be represented by this AB. The, the, the place where the vector is starting, A, that's what you start with. Then the place where the vector is ending, B, then you put an, a straight line with an arrow showing the direction that is starting from A and going to B. So you can see this, this is the representation of a vector, two capital letters, showing from where it is starting, it is starting from A, and it's ending at B. And the arrow shows it, straight line with arrow head. So we call it directed line segment. Whenever you want to represent a vector, you represent it with directed line segment. So had it been just want to say A, B, without direction, it would have been just A, B. And it would have been distance or length, AB. But if you want to identify displacement, which is a vector quantity, you must put this uh, 
line segment with arrow showing you that it's a vector point. So, how can you differentiate? This is AB. This is just distance. It could be 50 kilometer. And this 50 kilometer is the magnitude. But when you say A, B, with this, this is also 50 kilometer, which is the magnitude. But this time around, it is having direction, starting from A and going to B, which is what is described here, saying that this is actually 50 kilometer from A in the direction, not 45 degrees east. So whenever you are explaining this direction, not, this is not east. 45 degrees. Whenever you are showing all this explanation for a given quantity, you call it vector. But when you just identify the magnitude, what's the magnitude, the size of distance between A and B? It's just 50. So this is a scalar. Whereas this is a vector because it is telling us that the magnitude of this distance is also 50. But at the same time, it is telling us the direction that it is actually moving from A to B, which in details says that it is not 45 degrees east of A. So this is not east of A. This is B and it's actually in the north east. Had it been your B is here, it would have been in the northwest. Had it been it is here, it would have been in the southwest. Had it been it is here, it would have been southeast. So you should know how to explain all this. So whenever you're talking about a quantity, you say 50 kilometers southeast when you say 50 kilometers southeast, this is a vector. But when you just say 50 kilometer, this is a this is a scalar. A scalar has only magnitude, no direction, but a vector has magnitude and direction. So you can actually write it like this. You can also write it like this. So this is the normal notation that we're going to be using in further studies that we're going to be doing in vectors. Please, if you like this video. Hit the subscribe button on this side. Uh, if you have any questions, drop it on the comment section. Like and share our videos. Thank you. God bless. Hello, welcome. Today we're going to be looking at, at a couple of um, concepts that you need to know about whenever you're learning vectors need to know how vectors are represented so that, so that whenever you see one you can easily identify that this is a vector not a scalar you need to know what a null vector is when you'll be doing calculations in vectors you need to know what a negative vector is you need to know what um, what a zero vector which is also a null vector what a unit vector is and also what the magnitude of a vector is and how to represent it. So how do you represent a vector? I'm going to use Cairo so that I can write. Good. How do you represent a vector? Uh, if it is a printed work, you are normally going to be seeing vectors represented as heavy print, heavy print. Like instead of having A, you're going to have A. This is A for uh, scalar. But if it is a vector, you're going to have it heavy print. It's going to be heavy. So this is a scalar, this is a vector. So this is what is represented here. You understand? But if you are writing, you know if you are writing, for you to be able to make a heavy print with your viral, it might be difficult for you. So to represent a vector when you are writing on your normal paper, you can just write A and put a bar underneath of it. So when you write if, it's a, if you want to represent the vector as B, you can simply say B, this, this is a vector. So, from the last class, I told us that if you want to represent a vector that starts from A to B, you do it like this. So, this is a representation of a vector. You can also represent it like this. Because if you had your point A here and point B here, and this is AB, this is this vector. So you can easily represent it by this A underscore. So you can either say that this vector is AB, or you can say that it is also A. So these are two ways you can use it representing this very vector, A, B, or A. So that is the general notation. Heavy print of the letter. It could be K. It's not only A that you can use. It could be K, it could be L. But working to be heavy, that is, uh, 
vector notation. The one that is not AB is scalar. It can also represent as A with bar under it. Now, magnitude of a vector. How do you represent the magnitude of a vector? Write the vector and then put this double uh, max. So this is magnitude of vector A, which we all, all know here is 50 kilometers. So magnitude of vector A is 50 kilometers. So this line represents magnitude of vector A. A with this. Then zero vector. What is a zero vector? Another word for magnitude of a vector is modulus of a vector. You can call it magnitude or modulus of a vector. Now, what is a zero vector? A zero vector is a vector with the magnitude of zero. So whenever the magnitude of a vector, say A, is equal to zero, we we'll call it a zero vector. And it can be represented by O. This is a zero vector. It is also called a null vector. You can call a zero vector a null vector. Now we look at unit vector. A unit vector is the direction, a unit vector in the direction of a vector A is the vector represented by A with this caret sign. So whenever you have vector like this B with caret sign, it is known as unit vector. And it is such that A is equal to modulus of A times unit vector A. So whenever you have the multiplication of modulus of A or magnitude of A with a unit vector of A, you get that normal vector. Very, very important. I need to know this notation. Then finally, we need to look at negative vector. What is a negative vector? The negative vector of a vector A is the vector which has the same magnitude as that of A, but a direction opposite to that of A. So you can see, it is written as minus the vector because of the direction is opposite, but the magnitude are the same. So this magnitude is going to be the same for both of them. For a vector and a negative vector. Only that the direction is opposite. So and it is represented by minus a. So like this vector now, the opposite of this will be B A. This is the negative vector of A B. So this is how you represent. So it's going to, instead of being like going like this, this vector going like this, it's going to come this other way because of this. So this is the same. This is A B. The, the opposite is, is either you say minus A or B A with this. So this is the negative vector of this or you can also represent it as this with underscore. So these are two ways of representing the negative of this very vector. So very, very importantly, you need to know all this notation. Note what, how to represent a vector, the magnitude of a vector, the zero vector, the unit vector, and the negative of a vector. Very, very important. So in the subsequent classes, we are going to continue from this. Please, if you like this video, hit the subscribe button. Uh, if you have any questions, drop it on the comment section. Any new video you want us to work on for you. Please, if you like this, share and like this video. Thank you. Bro. Hello, welcome. Today we're going to be looking at the addition and subtraction of vectors. But well, first of all, uh, we're going to look at the concept of equality of vectors. When is it that you can say that two vectors are equal? You can only say that two vectors are equal when the both of them have the same magnitude and direction. So that is the only reason or the only case where you can say that two vectors are equal whenever they have the same magnitude and direction. So you can simply say that two vectors A and B are said to be equal if they both have the same magnitude and direction. Very, very important. Now back to the main subject of the day, addition and subtraction of vectors. How can you add up two vectors? So let's say you have a vector A, B and B, C. These are two vectors. A, B, and B, C. You can see that if you want to get to C from A, there are two ways you can get to C from A. You can either go directly to C, or you can say A to B, then B to C. So these are two ways. So you can simply say that A to B plus B to C is the same thing as saying A to C directly. So that's why we say 
The journey from A to C can be accomplished in two ways. From A to B and then B to C. From A to B and then B to C. Or you go directly from A to C. So you can simply say that A to B plus B to C is equal to A to C. Because two of them leads you to the same point. So that's why we say the vector A to C, A to C is said to be the sum of the vectors A to B and B to C. So A to C is sum of A to B and B to C. Because this to this is equal to this plus this. So P plus Q, P plus Q is equal to this. So you can say that vector AC, AC is equal to AB plus BC. Because those are the two ways you can get to C from A. It's either you say AC, which is equal to AB plus BC. That's what we have here. AC is equal to AB plus BC. So if you are representing AB with P, AB, you are representing it with P, and BC, you are representing it with Q, you can simply say that AC is equal to P plus Q, P plus Q. But you know that in vector notation, you can say, uh, since I'm writing, I can have, I will have to put this uh, bar underneath. Now, this very law that states that AC is the same thing as AB plus BC is known as the triangle law of vector addition. So this is the triangle law of vector addition. Now, the vector P plus Q is the resultant vector of P and Q. So this is the resultant vector. This one is resultant of this plus this. So P plus Q is the resultant vector of P and Q. Now, how do we do subtraction of vector? When we've done this is addition, this is how you go about addition. It must be in this form of triangle for you to have this. But in subtraction, subtraction of a vector is the same as addition of the negative vector. So there's no, the, the major difference between addition and subtraction of a vector is that in subtraction you also do addition, but in, the, in this, this time around you do, you add the negative vector. We studied what the negative vector is in the last class. We say that the negative vector is the vector that has the same magnitude with the ordinary vector, the vector that is is the negative but now in the opposite direction. So let's say you see this vector QR. The negative of this vector QR is QS because QR is B and QS is minus B. So if you are using addition law here you can say that this is A plus B is equal to AB. So you can say that PQ plus QR is equal to PR. But now, if you if you are not considering this B and you are considering this negative, you cannot call it A minus B. So it's still the same thing, A minus B, because this is minus B because it is the opposite of B, normal B, minus B. So you can see that this triangular law, triangle law can also be used for subtraction. But you are not considering the opposite of the normal B, which is taking the other direction. So you can easily say that QS, QS, is the same thing as negative of QR. That's what I say. B minus B is the negative of B. So QX is the negative of QR. QS negative of QR. So you cannot say that PQ, PQ minus QR. PQ minus QR. Which is the, and this minus QR is the same thing as saying QX. So PQ minus QR is the same thing as saying PQ plus minus QR. Just addition of the negative vector. So you can now say that PQ is also equal to PQ plus RQ. You know that RQ, RQ is the same thing as saying negative of QR. RQ is the same thing. RQ is the same thing as saying negative of QR, so that you cannot say that PQ plus QS. RQ, this is RQ, this is QS, so it's the same thing. So you cannot say that PQ plus QS is the same thing as saying PS. 
which is this, which is the negative of the vector. So if this is the positive, the, if this is the addition, this is subtraction. So you need to study this and understand it. And that is the vector notation for addition and subtraction. Just note that the triangle law of vector addition is actually what is used in adding two vectors. And it simply shows the alternative way of getting to C from A. This is AC directly. So it's the same thing as saying AB plus AC. And subtraction of a vector is simply the same as the addition of the negative vector. So notice what is happening here. QS, QS is the same thing as negative QR. QS is the same as negative QR. Very, very important. So that is where we're going to be stopping today. Please, if you like this video, click on the subscribe button. If you have any questions, drop it on the uh, comment section. Like, share this video so that people can see and love it. Thank you so much. Hello, welcome. Today we're going to be looking at trigonometry. Trigonometry, whenever you want to do calculations in mathematics that has to do with cosine, sine, or tangent of angles, like when you say cos 30, sine 90, cos 35, how do you get those values? Only you use what you call trigonometry ratios, and that is what we're going to be learning today. So we we'll talk about trigonometry when we're talking about trigonometry group. Ratios like tangent, cosine, sine uh, of special angles like 30, 45, and any other angle. So, we're going to look at how we can derive this. Before we can be able to understand it, we need to understand that every circle can be divided into four quadrants. So, the first, the bit here is known as the first quadrant. This is the second, this is third, this is fourth. Always remember that it goes like this anti clockwise. That's the right way to go whenever you're dividing. A circle into four quadrants. If you use straight lines at meeting at 90 degrees to divide a circle into four quadrants, you're going to have the first quadrant, second, third, fourth in anti clockwise direction. And that is actually the way every angle is measured. If you want to measure angle, you have to start from X, go like this. So if this is 45, it's going to go like this. You cannot measure through this direction. If you measure through this direction, it becomes negative. So every positive angle has to be measured from here, like this. So this is 45 or 60, you have to go like this. Anti-clockwise, that's the positive way of measuring angles. Now you come to the basic trigonometric ratio, which we can easily find using what we call Sokatoa. Using what we call Sokatoa, that's how we find the, the trigonometric ratios. So here is for sign. So for sine, you use opposite over hypotenuse. For cos, you use adjacent over head. And for tan, you use opposite over adjacent. So this is what we call the adjacent. This is the opposite. The opposite is normally the line, the one, the side that is opposite to the angle you're looking at. This is it, opposite. That's why we call it opposite. Adjacent is below. Then you have the hypotenuse. This is the hedge. So this is hedge. O A O H A So this is Sokatoa Sokatoa, that's the easier way of remembering the signs So if you want to find the sign of an angle How do you find the sign of an angle? The sign, so Opposite over H O over P So what is the sign of this angle? Will be opposite O O So it's going to be this one P or you call it QR QR or P all over edge. What is the edge? This is the edge. PQ. PQ or you call it R. PQ or you call it R. So PQ or R. Now if you want to find the car, cosine, cosine, cos theta. How do you find the cosine, cos theta of this angle? How do you find the cosine of this angle? It's going to be A adjacent or you call it PR. PR adjacent which is the Q all over H. H is what? PQ. This is H, or you call it R. P, PQ. R, which is H. Now, how do you find the tangent? How do you find the tan theta? How do you find the tan of this angle? It's going to, it's going to be TWA, O, opposite, which is QR, 
QR, or you call it P, all over adjacent. This is adjacent, which is ER, PR, or Q. So note this notation, soccer to that's the simple way of getting the basic trigonometric, trigonometric ratio. Noting that this is the opposite, this is the adjacent, and this is edge. So using that, you can find the cosine of any angle. So if they told, tell you, if let's say this is 45, this angle is 45. So cos 45 is going to be what? It's going to be anything that you have adjacent. If it is 10, this is going to be what? 10 all over edge. Anything you have here, if it is 5, it's going to be 10 over 5. So cos 45 is going to be 10 over 5. If you had 10 here and you had 5. So that is how you do it. Very, very important. You need to memorize this so that you can to solve this. So this is the introductory part of trigonometry. In the subscribe classes, you're going to do more. Please, if you like this, hit the subscribe button. Uh, like and share this our video. Thank you for your subscription and support. God bless you. Hello, welcome. Today we're going to be looking at the reciprocal of basic ratios. The basic ratios that we saw the other day, we talked about the cos theta, sin theta, and tan theta. Now, they are reciprocals. Reciprocal simply means one over something. So, one over cos theta is called sec, sec theta, or second theta. So, you will just transpose what we had before. Instead of q over r, you have r over q. Now, one over sin theta is the same thing as saying, cosecant or cosec theta and you transpose so that you have r over p from what we had before sine sin theta will be p over r but cosec theta will be r over p so you just invert that's the reciprocal one over then one over tan theta is the same thing as saying cotan cotangent or cot theta so tan theta is p over q whereas cot theta is q over p and you should also know that cos theta is the same thing as saying cos theta over sin theta. Since tan theta is the same thing as saying sin theta over cos theta. So very, very important. I need to know this. So whenever you have one over, you change the name. Instead of cos, it becomes secant. If it is one over sin theta, it becomes cosec. If it is one over tan theta, it becomes cotangent or cos. So that's how you know this. Now, example. Given that sin theta is equal to 5 over 13, and theta is an acute angle. Find cos theta, tan theta, sec theta, cosec theta, and cot theta. How do you go about it? Once you are given this, you should always use the rule, the rule of so ka toa. So this is what you use. So first of all, you draw an angle. You draw the angle like this. So opposite over hypotenuse. This is sin theta. So it's so opposite of a hypothesis. So meaning that opposite is 5. You can see it. This is opposite. It's 5. Now over hypotenuse is 10. Hypotenuse is 13. R is equal to 13. This is hypotenuse. Now what is remaining is the adjacent. So how do you find the adjacent? How do you find it? You can find this using what we call the Pythagoras theory. And in Pythagoras theory, the resultant, which is pure Q, squared is simply this plus this this squared plus this squared so pr squared plus q r squared pr squared which is 12 squared plus q r squared which is 5 squared so you can always say that this this here 13 here which is pq squared is equal to q squared which you don't know plus P squared, which you know is 5. So you have 13 squared is equal to Q squared plus 5 squared. So make Q the subject of the formula. You have 13 squared minus 5 squared. So if you do 13 squared minus, you have 1, 4, 4. So to make only Q the subject, so you transfer the root to this other side. Root 1, 4, 4 will give you 12. So that's how we find out that this Q here is equal to 12. So now you have the both sides. You have 13, 5, and 2. So with that, you can find any of these. In a very simple way. Using this, if you are told to find the cos theta, you use adjacent over hypotenuse. What is the adjacent? 12. 
What is the hypotenuse? 13. So this is cos theta. So if you are told to find tan theta, how do you find tan theta? Tan theta is going to be tan theta is equal to 2 opposite. Opposite is what? 5. All over. Adjacent is what? 12. So 5 over 12, that's the answer. If you are told to find sec, sec theta, sec theta is going to be what? Second is 1 over cos theta. So you already know what cos theta, right? This is your cos theta. So 1 over cos theta, 1 over 12 over 13 is simply 13 over 12. So this becomes your what? This becomes your sec theta. Now if you are told to find cos theta, so cos theta is 1 over sin theta. So what is sin theta? This is sin theta. So 1 over sin theta is going to be 13 over 5. So this is your cos theta. And finally, cos theta. Cos theta is simply is simply cos theta is simply what cosine cos theta over sine theta. So what is our cos theta? Our cos theta is what twelve over thirteen divided by what is our sine theta? Sine theta is five over thirteen. So if you divide these two, you are going to have what? What will you have? You have uh, twelve over thirteen times. 13 over 5. So 13 clear 13, you have what? 12 over 5. So that is your cut theta. So that's how you solve this. So make sure you use Pythagoras theorem to find the size. Then use this Sokatoa and find the individual ratios. Please, if you like this, hit the subscribe button. I would like and share our videos. Thank you for your subscription and support. Thank you and God bless you. Hello, welcome. Today we are going to be looking at logarithm. Today we are going to be looking at what? Logarithm. There are two major types of logarithm that we have. We have the common or natural logarithm, which is log to base 10. Which is log to base what? 10. Whenever you have logarithm of a number like this, this logarithm of number 100 to base 10. This is what we call natural logarithm or common logarithm. Is that clear? But any logarithm that we have to other base is not natural. Can you see these ones? This is log written to base what? 2. This is log written to base what? 5. You understand? For these ones that are not to base 10, we use what we call theory of log written to solve them. Is that clear? And now, what is log written? The log written of a number n. Can you see the log written of a number n? Can you see it? Log n. The log written of a number n to base a. To base a. Can you see the base? The base is the one that is written small. And log n is the main number. Is that clear? Log rhythm of a number n to base a, written as log a, log n, base a. Can you see that? Is the power. Is the what? Power. Can you see it? Is the power to which a must be raised to obtain n. Can you see the power a is raised? a is raised to what? x. In order to obtain what? n. In order to obtain what? n. Is the number to which a must be raised in order to obtain what n? That is what we call log reading. Can you see this is log of a n to base a? X is log of n to base n. You understand? X is log, log of n to base a. And it's simply the word, the power to which a must be raised in order to get n. Is that clear? So this is the index notation of this very log reading notation. If you look at this log now, you have log 100 to base 10 gives you 2. It means that the power that this base 10 must be raised in order to... Yes, welcome back. So to solve this log, first of all, we must put this in the index notation. I told you that this is the log reading notation. This is the what? This is the index notation. So looking at this, to put this in index notation, we first of all, we write the base. The base is what? The base is what? This is similar to saying base 5 to power what? X is equal to what? 25. Is it not? Now, solving this now, we can write that 5 to power X is equal to what? 5 to power what will give you 25? 2. So we can simply say that X is equal to what? 2. So writing this in log notation will be log 5 
25 equal to what? 2. Is that? That's how you found 2, is it not? So this one again, let's repeat it now so that I will believe that everybody now understands it. If we have log 16 to, power, to base what? Base what did we have it? Is it 2? Yes. So how do you solve this example 1? We are solving it again. So we simply write this in what? Index notation. Huh? So writing it in index notation, we write the base first, is it not? To power x is equal to the what? The number, is it not? Now we now have what? 2 to power x is equal to. 2 to power what will give us 16? 4, is it not? So that we have x to be equal to what? 4. Is that clear? So that's how you solve it. That is how you do what? That is how you do what? This is example 1 and this is example 2. So let's do another example 3. Let's do example what? And that is what? Log to base 2, 4 sub 2. Log to base 2. Uh, log to base 2, 4 sub 2. 4 sub 2. So how do we do this one? First of all, we have to write the word. What do we write about the base? What is the base? 2. Two. To power what? X. Equal to what? 4 sub 2. That is the first thing we write. Is that not true? Now we also say that 2 to power X is the same thing as 4 sub 2 is the same thing as saying uh, You can say that 4 is the same thing as saying you root 16. You know that root 16 gives you 4. Have it? So times root 2. Because root 16 is the same thing as 4. We want to put all of them in soft form. So you can now have that 2 to the power x is equal to. This is the same thing as saying sort 16 times 2. Is it? Which is the same thing as saying sort what? 32. Is that? So we can now say that 2x is equal to. This is the same thing as saying 32 to the power 1 over 2. Is that? So 32 is the same thing as saying 32 to 1 over 2. So we can now say that 2 to the power x is equal to. 32 is the same thing as saying 2 to the power what? 2 to the power what? 5. Is it 5? Yes. 5. Because what? 2 times 2 times 2 times 2 times 2. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Is it equal to 32? Yes. Because 2 times 2, 4. 4 times 2, 8. 8 times 2, 16. 16 times 2, 32. So this is this times 1 over what? 2. This 1 over 2 is this 1 over 2. 32 is the same as 2 to the power 5. Now you can now say that x is equal to what? 5 times 1 over 2, which is the same thing as what? 5 over what? 2. So that is the value of your s. So write it down. Please, if you like this video, click on the subscribe button. Uh, if you have any questions, drop it in the comment section. Thank you. Let's start. Yes, let's look at the following logs. We are told to find this log 32 to base 4. Is that? So how do we go about solving it? We simply say that therefore uh, log 432 is equal to what? X. Is it not? So now, what do we write first? We write the base. Is it not? 4 to power what? X equal to what? 32. Now we know that 4 is what? 2 to power 2. Is it not? So we can write it like this, 2 to the power 2 instead of 4, equal to 32. And 32 is what? 2 to the power what? 5. Is it not? So we can now have that. This is 2, this is 2. So we have only 2x is equal to what? 5. So x is equal to what? 5 over what? 2. That is the answer. So that is this first one. So the second one says what? Log 10x equal to what? 4. So how do we rewrite this? We can say that the base, which is what? 10. Is it not? To power what? 4 is equal to what? X. Is it not? So we can simply say that X is equal to 10 to power what? 4. And X is equal to what? 10 to power 4 is what? Is it not? 10,000. So this is the final answer. Are we together on this? Then the last one says what? log x 
81 is equal to minus what? Half. So how do we write this? We write the word base, which is what? 81 to power what is here? Minus half is equal to what? X. Is that? Is equal to what? X. So what do we do now? We simply say that what do we do now? This is what? This is the same thing as saying 81. This is the same thing as saying 1 over 81 to the power half equal to what? X. Hmm? 81 to the power half is what? This is, this is the same thing as saying 1 over root 81 equal to what? X. Is that clear? Root 81 is what? 1 over what? 9 equal to what? X. So this is the answer. X is equal to 1 over 9. So you must always write it in form of index notation. This is the log rotation. This is the index. Anything in the base, let it raise, be raised to power what is here. Then you write this one. Then you break it down. So that is how you solve this. Is that clear? Is that clear? Yes. So write all of them. Please, if you like this, hit the subscribe button. Uh, if you have any questions, drop it on the comment section, like and share our videos. Thank you. Hello, welcome. Let's look at laws of log reading. Let's look at what laws of log reading. Addition law states that whenever you have two logs of the same base, you can see this is base A, this is base A, and you're adding together, just multiply the two numbers. You understand? Log to base, they take their common base and multiply the two numbers. That is, is similar. So, example, if you have this log 4 to base 10, log 25 to base 10, so simply say log 4 times 25 to base 10. Solve it out, that becomes your answer. For the subtraction log, if you have two, two logs of the same base, this log x and log y, all of them having the same base, just say log to that common base, x over y. So addition is the same as multiplication, multiplication is the same as division. So this is an example log 25, 28 to base 4, log 14 to base 4, the same base. So you simply say 28 over 14, then solve that. Power law states that whenever you have a base, you have a number, then you have the number raised to a, a, an index. Just take this index to the other side. So that's what we have. We take this n to this side. So if you have something like this, you take the 3 to this side, then you solve them. Now we have power of a base. If the base has a number, just take 1 over that number to the, to the other side. So this is 1 over 2. Then you write the log normally, log 8x, log 8s. So that's what we did here. The, the base has a, an index of 3. So we say 1 over 3. 1 over 3. Then you write this normally. The log reading of its own base. Whenever you have log A, base A is the same thing as 1. That simply means even if we have log 100, base 100, it's still the same thing as what? 1. Plus then we log 20, base 20. What's the value? 1. So that's why in solving this, where we have log 10, 10, this is something as 1. That's why 2 times 1 is equal to 2. Are we clear on that? Are we clear on that? So in solving this down, this is how you solve it. This is addition, so you just simply multiply, which is 100. And 100 is something as 10 to the power 2. So taking these two down here, because of, why did we take 2 down there? Because of the power law that says that if you have something to power this, you can take it over. That's why we brought these two at the back. And log of its own base says that log of anything to its own base is the same thing as 1. So this is 1, 2 times 1, 2. Is that clear? That's what we did, and that is how all this is solved. So there are other laws which I will note down now. There's what we call reciprocal law. There's what we call what? Reciprocal law. That simply says that log of a base x is the same thing as saying 1 over log of x base a. Can you see that? Can you see that? This is log of a to base. That's the other marker. That's right. So it's on the other side. This one is known as what? This is number 7. And it's known as what? This is known as what? Reciprocal law. Simply telling us that log of, this is log of a to base x. You can change it to log of x 
to be escaped, for them put one over. That's what the Lord is saying. Then lastly, we have change of base law. We have what we call what? Change of base law. And it states that log x to base a. This one states that log x to base a is the same thing as saying log x base n all over log a base n. Can you see this? This one is what? 8 and it's known as what? Change of base log. This one is known as what? Reciprocal log. So these are the last, these eight laws are the laws of log reading that you need to know. Is that clear? So whenever you have a log like this, you can simply write it in this one, 1 over log. Now the number becomes the base. The number here is A, but here is the base. But if you want to change to an entirely new base that you don't know, this one you are using base from what you have, but you are introducing a new base N. Just take this first one up, this one down, then put the new bases N, N for the put of them. This is called change of base log. So example of this one is when we have something like log 8 form. If you are putting it in the form, it can become log 4, 8, but this time around 1 over 5. Then if you have log 2, 3, it can be equal to log 4, 2, all over what? Log what? 4, 3. Have you? Yes. So that is what those things. So this is where we are going to be stopping. In subsequent classes, we are going to be solving problems with this. If you like this, please hit the subscribe button. Share our videos. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, welcome back. We are going to be using the laws of logarithm that we learned earlier to solve some problems. Is that clear? So given this problem, log 32 to base 4 and log 2 to base 4 addition so we are going to use addition law and the addition law says that once we have numbers to the same base and we are adding numbers to the same base what do we do what would this thing give us to be equivalent to log of the common base then take the uh, product of the two is that not true is that not true so that is what we have and this is equal to what 32 times 2 is what? 64. So this is what we have. And this is equivalent to saying log to base 4. 64 is the same thing as saying 4 to power 3. Is it not? Because if you have 4 times 4 times 4. 4 times 4, 16. 16 times 4, 64. And the law of the same, same base as the number states that whenever we have this, okay, law of, of this is what? We take this back, it will now be what? Log 4 base 4. We take this to this place. That's one of the laws we gave. And this is the same thing I'm saying three times. Log of the same base, log of base to, log of a number to the same base is what? 1, which is equal to what? 3. So that's the answer. Then number 2, how do we solve this number? We have log 16 over what? Log 32. 16 is the same thing I'm saying log. 2 to power what? 4. Is that not true? Then log 32 is the same thing as saying log 2 to power what? 5. Is that not true? Then this is, you can call it auto base 10 base what? 10. But whatever you are giving log and you did not put base, it simply means that it is base 10. Is that clear? Is that clear? So you take this one back, you have what? 4 log 2 base 10 all over 5 log what? 2 base 10. Is that? This is log 2 base 10, log 2 base 10, kill each other. Then you have what? 4 over what? 5. That is the answer. Then for the last one, number 3, we have log sub 7 all over log 7. And I told you, if you are not giving base, it simply means that it is base what? Base 10. So this is the same thing as saying log. So 7 is the same thing as saying 7 to power half. Is it not true? 
all over what? Log 7. And log 7 simply means log 7 to power 1. Is that? So this is the same thing as saying half log 7 all over what? 1 log 7. Log 7 goes with log 7. Now we have what? Half divided by 1, which is half. And that is the answer. So that is how to solve this. You look at it very well, very simply. This is uh, addition law. Since they are of the same base, just say 32 times 2, which is 64. 64 is the same thing as 4 to 4 and 3. You take this one over to this. I have 3, 4, 4. 4, the same base and number are the same thing. So it's equal to 1. 3 times 1, you get this. Log without a base is simply base 10. So it's 16 is the same thing as 2 to the power of 4, 32 is the same thing as 2 to the power of 5. Take this 4 over, take this 5 over. 2, log 2, divide by log 2. So you have 4 over 5. So that's how you solve that. Please, if you like this, hit the subscribe button. If you have any questions, drop it on the comment section. Thank you. Yes, welcome. Today we are going to be looking at quadratic equation. Today we are going to be looking at what? Quadratic. quadratic equation. What is quadratic equation? Quadratic equation is any equation that is of this form. Are you looking at the form? Any equation that is of the form ax squared or ax to power 2 plus bx plus c equal to 0 is a quadratic equation. Is that clear? So any equation of this form is a quadratic equation. Example is this. Are you seeing this? 2x squared plus 3x plus 4 equal to 0 is a quadratic equation. Now, in every quadratic equation, the highest power of x is 2. The highest power of s is what? And all these a, b, c are all numbers. All a, b, c are all what? Numbers. In this equation that you're giving as an example, what's the value of a? 2. What's the value of B? What's the value of C? Is that clear? Any equation that has the highest value of X, the power of X as 2, and has all these A, B, C, D represented as numbers, is known as what? Quadratic expression. It's known as what? So what you should be looking at is that word. Quadratic simply means 2. Is that clear? Is that clear? Now, how do we solve this equation? For you to solve a quadratic equation, what you are expected to do is to find the value of x. Is to find the value of what? Yes. Is to find the value of what? Yes. So whenever you are given a quadratic equation, which is any equation that has this form, example is this, and you are told to solve, what the first thing wants you to do is to find the value of what? x. Is to find the value of what? Yes. x. So here, in this equation, a, B, and C are numbers, and the highest power of X is what? 2. That is how you know a quadratic equation. Any equation that is of this form and have the highest value of X, the power of X as what? 2. Is that clear? So I want somebody to give me an example of quadratic equation. Where is my daughter? Somebody should give me a quick example of quadratic equation. Please, take my daughter. Yes, yeah, please, I give me an example of quadratic equation. Sharp, sharp. 7x seven squared good plus 8x minus 5. Five. Five. Equal to what? 0. This is a quadratic equation. Why? Because the highest power of x is what? 2. Is that clear? Another person should give me another example of quadratic expression. Yeah, brother, you. 6x squared plus 2x. Minus 5. Minus 5 equal to 0. Perfect. You give me an example of a quadratic equation. Sub, 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 sub. Don't delay our class. 8x eight, eight squared. 8x squared. Plus 3x. Three 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 minus 2 equal to 0. Make sure you put equal to 0. Is that clear? All these are examples of quadratic equations. So now that you've understood what a quadratic equation is, now, how do we solve a quadratic equation? I told us that to solve a quadratic equation, so let's find the value of x, is it not? So how do you solve? We have two major methods that we are going to be evaluating today. Number one is by factorization, and number two is by formula. Number one is by what? Factorization. And number two is by what? Formula. Number one is by what? Factorization. Number two is by what? Formula. Once I'm done with this, you should be able to solve every quadratic equation. Is that clear? 
Now, if you are giving a quadratic equation to solve in jam class, are we listening? Kosa, if you are giving a quadratic equation to solve in jam class, if you are using factorization method, you may not be able to get the solution. You understand? But if you use by formula, there is no quadratic equation that you cannot solve by formula. Is that clear? So instead of guessing the two, you just use strength using by formula. Is that clear? And I told you that you need to devise a way of answering your question faster when you're in jam board. Is that clear? This is one of the ways. Now, so let's evaluate these two methods. Where is my duster? Let's evaluate these two methods. So let's look at by factorization first. Then we look at by formula. I hope you are copying the note. Make sure you have the note. I will be checking your note. So let's give, given an example, x squared plus 7x plus 10 equal to 0. Now we want to solve this using by factorization. Using by what? Factorization. factorization. Now how do you solve using factorization? First thing, multiply the one with the highest, the coefficient of the highest power of x with the constant. Is that clear? This times this will give us what? 10x squared. Is that? Is that? Now, find, you can write the solution. Now, find two numbers that when you add them up, it will give you 7. Then when you multiply them, it will give you this multiple that you've gotten. What are those two numbers? 2 and 5. Why? Because if you say 2x plus 5x, what will you get? You will get 7x. If you also say 2x times 5x, you get 10x squared, is it not? Yes. So you found 2 and 5. Now, put those 2 and 5 inside this equation. So you simply have x squared plus this plus 10 equal to 0. You are replacing your 7x with 2x plus 5x because it's the same thing, is it not? Is it not? So this is the expression you are having now. Is that clear? This expression is the same thing as this. Only that you replace 7x with 2x and 5x. Is that clear? Are we together? Because yes, I that clear. Now, since you found this, now factorize. What is common between this and this? X. So you bring it out and you now have X plus 2. Is it not? Plus, what is common between this and this? 5. You bring out the 5. Now you have X plus 2. Because if you open this bracket, you get, you get 5 times X. 5X. Five, 5 times 2. 10. Equal to 0. So whenever you have what is here to be equal to what is here. You just bring out only one. So you have x plus 2. This and this are the same. Then you bring out this one. x plus 5 equal to 0. So that is your solution. So finally, if you take 2 over to this side, you have x equal to minus what? 2. If you take 5 over to this one, you have x equal to minus what? 5. So that is the solution. Write it down. Write it down. In subsequent classes, we are going to be looking at how to solve by formula method. I hope you understood what I said. So let me take it one by one. First of all, once you are given the equation, multiply what is having here, what you are having in the, as the first uh, factor here, with the constant. You have this. Now, get two multiples or two numbers or two expressions that when you add them up, you get what is in the middle. Or when you multiply them, you get what you got here. So use the, those two things and replace what you have in this middle. Factorize and then solve down. So that is the solution. Please, if you like this our video, hit the subscribe button. If you have any questions, drop it on the comment section. Like and share our video so that your friends can see them. Thank you and God bless. Are we together? So let's solve 6x squared minus 7x plus 2 equal to 0. Uh, somebody will help me. What do I need to do first? Multiply the first with this, isn't it? 6x squared times 2, what do I have? 12x squared. Now ask myself, what are the two numbers that when you add them up, you get minus 7x. But when you multiply them, you get 12x squared. So what are those numbers? Minus 3x and minus 4x. Because minus 3x minus 4x will give me what? Minus 7x. Minus 3x times minus 4x will give me this. 
Then I'll write this one down, 6x2. In place of this, I'm now having this. Then I have plus 2 equal to what? 0. Isn't it? Yes. Then I factorize. What is common between this and this? 3x. Isn't it? Yes. Open brackets. What will be remaining here? 3x. No? 2x. Isn't it? Yes. Because 3 times 2 will give us what? 6. Is that clear? Minus. What should I write here? 3. No, not 3. Uh, one. This is already here. 1. one. For this one, what do I write? Minus, what is common? 2. Isn't it? Yeah. In bracket, what should I write here? 2x. Yes. Abby? Yes. Then, what should I write here? Yes. Plus 1. Yes. Is it plus or minus? Yes. Minus 1. So that when you say minus times minus, it will become plus. Yes. Equal to what? 0. Yes. Isn't it? Now, I pick out this and this are the same thing. So, I just write it once. 2x minus 1. Then I pick out this one, 3x minus 2. Isn't it? Mm -hmm. Equal to 0. So what are the values of x? For this one, what? x is equal to what? This will go over 1 over what? 2. Whereas for this one, x will be equal to what? 2 over 3. So those, that is the solution. So get that down. It's very clear. That's how you solve anything by factorization. Yeah, thank you. Please hit the subscribe button. Uh, if you like this video, share it as much as you can. Thank you. Yes, let's look at solving using quadratic formula. Given this equation, this quadratic equation, 2x squared minus 4x minus 3 equal to 0. Now we use this formula. This is the formula that we are going to use. Is it not? Is it not? So this is the formula. Now in this formula, what is A? What is A? A is 2, isn't it? What is B? B is what? Minus 4, not 4. Is that? What is C? Minus 3. Now putting it in the equation, we now have what? X equal to. What is minus B? Minus, minus. minus 4. So minus cancel minus, we have what? 4. four. Plus or minus, minus root of b square. What is b square? Minus, minus 4 squared. Square. Minus 4 times a. What is a? 2 times c. What is c? Minus 3. Is it not? All over what? 2 times a. What is a? 2. Is it not? So now what we will have? 4 plus or minus root of 4 squared is what? 16. No need because minus squared is what? Plus, isn't it? Minus 4 times 2? 8. 8 times 3? 24. Huh? 24. So this minus 24 will cancel this one. So we have plus what? 24. Isn't it? All over what? 2 times 2? 4. So this will give us x equal to what? 4 plus or minus root of 16 plus 24. 16 plus 24 is what? 40. 40, right? Yes. All over what? All over 4. Please take this very well. Is it 40? Four times two times three. Press it in the calculator. What are we supposed to have? Four times two. Eight, back. Eight times three. Twenty-four, isn't it? Now sixteen plus twenty-four. Forty, isn't it? Yeah, it's supposed to be four. I think the one they have in the text was a mistake. So this is what we are supposed to have. Is that clear? So this is the value of our x. Now, how, how can we solve this down? Can we solve this down? 40, what is the, uh, how can we break down 40? Who can tell me how we can break down 40? In salt. Yes, change it, change salt to... Two what? 
two root 10. Why do we have two root 10? Because this is the same thing as saying four times 10, isn't it? And so four is what this. So this can be brought down to what? Four plus or minus two sort what? 10, all over four. Is that clear? This is x. Now, what are the two values of x having this now? Who can tell me the two values of x having this? Who can simply say that x is equal to what? 4 plus 2 sort 10 over 4. And what? x is equal to what? 4 minus 2 sort 10 over 4. Isn't it? Yes. Isn't it? Yes. So these are the two values. So in the first one, you just take, you know this is plus or minus, isn't it? In the first one, you pick plus. In the second one, you pick minus. So you can leave your answer at this, or you can also go further to break it down. Is that clear? So the one they have in textbook there is actually an error in their own. Are we together? Yes, sir.